I can always tell this stuff will pop up in my feed, you know, mm -hmm. on Instagram. And I know immediately that it's something you've done because just the way you How sketchy finish, it is. No, yeah. the way you finish your metal work, it's like, it's just so fucking beautiful, man. What path do you take to get for a talented young fabricator that's looking at those pictures that you post to be like, that's what I want to fucking do? I, I honestly yeah. would say... Welcome, everybody, back to Oil & Whiskey. We've got Adam Banks, Banks Built. The I mean, honestly, Troy hasn't been at the shop in, what, three, four, seven years? It's pretty seen. much it's pretty much you. I forgot what he looks like. Yeah, that's what I thought. I thought he was just the pretty <laughs> yeah. face, like the front man. You know, you always need a, a front man, right? Well, Troy. for years we've right. always talked about, like, man, how does he keep doing this shit? And then you realize that Adam's been there for the last six or seven years. So, like, oh, that's that's so that, that's <laughs> yeah. who's doing it. <laughs> if Troy's the pretty face, and oh, trouble. we got problems. <laughs> 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 Maybe one of his sons will be up there. Yeah. Uh, the the one, uh, it's Jack that looks just like him, right? No, Luke. Uh, Luke. So I met Luke for the first time at uh, Columbus. And man, everything he says, his mannerisms, everything, it's a mini Troy. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, you almost feel bad for Luke. Huh? I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great kids, though, man. Yeah, good yeah, kids. kids. Yeah. Yep. Well, uh, all, all, his, all his kids are great. Yeah, I, I don't have any problem um, beating them up, beating Troy up a little bit. I got to be careful, though, because... Um, he signs your check. You, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, well, his wife does. But, um, I, I got to be a little careful. Do you do you have do you have buddies that that you've you've known for a long time? You think you're pretty close, but they just beat on you all the time. No, yeah. no, yeah. no, I don't. That's, no, that's, right. call them we're, we're super yeah. up, they're super friends. uplifting. Right. They're friends. So I, I've yeah. known Troy for 20 years now. So you, you're pretty good friends. And so when you you're just busting each other's balls or whatever. Um, that's just how it is. That's yeah. how you know that you, you, you like each other, right? But oh, yeah. when I say those things in front of people <laughs> they don't outside the shop, they look at me like I just clubbed a baby, baby seal or yeah. something or yeah. kicked a puppy in front of them. Oh, I'm yeah. like, sorry. <laughs> it's, it can be it. very off-putting yeah. for like friendly, like good friends, humor in front of somebody else. Yeah. What, do you hate him or something? What's the problem? Like, no, I really yeah. love him. That's, yeah. why it's, that's yeah. why I'm talking to him that way. It's always after when that person's gone. That's like, hey, I thought I thought y'all were, like, were like close and got along. Yeah. Oh, yeah, fucking better than anybody. Sure. Well, I mean, like, <laughs> you said some horrible things. I mean, you're pretty nice to me. I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't, we don't know each other. I really don't like you that much. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that's an industry-related thing. You know, the longer you've been in the hot rod industry. I, feel, I was pretty nice, to, like, early on when I first met you. Like, I... I met you at Columbus or uh, SEMA in what, 08, 2008, something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that. And it was just like a normal, friendly encounter, right? I, was, I looked a little more badass back then, though. Yeah, yeah, you, you did. You looked like <laughs> a lot less right. metro. Yeah, you looked like a little Klansman. <laughs> <laughs> <you look> like. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> you looked like a neo Nazi, dude. You're like, no. Tight shirt, Dickies, the fucking uh, Chucks, shaved head. Oh. Sweet. Yeah, I did yeah, have all that. But <laughs> <laughs> wow. But, but yeah, no. You were, yeah. you, maybe you were a little intimidating, but I was nice to like a normal friendly encounter. But as time went on, now it's like, I mean, I enjoy like hurting your feelings. You, know? yeah, you do. <laughs> it makes yeah. me feel good. I think it's probably your, one of your most, <laughs> your most favorite things. Yeah, yeah. Troy has said, be careful, you'll hurt my feeling. Yeah. Right. My wife, my wife used to say uh, uh, with with a good friend of mine that I used to work with, she's like, you got to be nice to him or else you won't have any friends left. I'm like, oh, I just have the one. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it becomes a narrow circle, yeah. you know, for sure. You guys have insanely tough skin to, to fit in and, yeah. and take it on a daily basis. Yeah. That's a good relationship, though. You know, if yeah. you, especially if you and Troy, you guys are working side by side I mean, to be able to bust each other's balls like that. Yeah, but it, here's the weird the thing: is I, I bust his, but he's like annoyingly nice when he talks about me, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, like he okay. he says he says good things about me, and at least in front of other people, and then the rest of the time he just leaves me alone. Which hmm. hey, that seems like the perfect. You want him to dish really. it back a little bit? Well, no. Maybe you're not going okay. hard. No, yeah. I, just, I just want <laughs> just other people to join me. I got in, you. Okay. I got in, you. In, in the, <laughs> in, you want to gang up on a little sure. bit? Yeah, we'll yeah. say though in in the in the friendly banter um, and the hurt feelings and the late night cries, 
the uh the going on vacation you do notice like a little bit of freedom because it's like well, you can do oh, things wear things i would and, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> the doing things and wearing things and, and maybe drinking something yeah. uh like or, i saw a picture of phil on vacation with one of those big sun hats and i <laughs> big know straw. Jay hat. well like, like the straw hat oh right? it's the white guy around water hat Right. Gotta wear that yeah, but paddle you, boarding or you wouldn't shirt. wear that in the presence of me and Josh. I only wear that in Florida. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's yeah. you know, you, but you're there free. Was, it's free. There was the thing the point is, when you threw that hat on, there wasn't a care in the world. There no. wasn't there wasn't who's gonna make fun of this. I mean I have my wife's bought, you know, swim trunks before a, a trip and you get in the hotel and like, Yeah, I, absolutely I'll wear those. It's, who's gonna say anything? <laughs> I wouldn't ever wear them <laughs> around somebody else. I think he goes the other way on the swim shorts and the uh, the shoes that I'm going to buy these to see what kind of reaction I get. Yeah, at least a, that's the take what? we. He's a little bit of an exhibitionist, though. He likes I think to so. have an I mean, accidental. With a, yeah, a six-inch <laughs> inseam, you're bound to have a wardrobe yeah. <laughs> 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 malfunction. What, 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 what are you drinking that they would make fun of? <clears throat> uh, pumpkin spice latte. Okay. It happened once. Yeah. yeah. And they encouraged it, too. It had one time. And I asked them. I was. It was perfect fall day, right? And this is was years and years ago. It's timely because today and they, is, they came back. Yeah, today they, is the they, first day. The fuckers <laughs> set me up. Yeah. They did. He's and out there in his tall boots, his chunky cable knit sweater, yeah. his scarf. You're saying they're like, oh, just, uh, <laughs> I think, oh, you guys want to do pumpkin spice? I mean, pumpkin spice lattes are back. You want to do a couple of just get three of those? I'm like, yeah, fuck, yeah pumpkin spice. I actually like a pumpkin spice. Lattes. Let's go ahead. Yeah, order one up for me. I'll do a grande pumpkin spice latte. Yeah, it makes Famous change, last words. Change mine to black coffee. <laughs> Since then, I've had nothing but black coffee. I've been put like a little bit of lather. I, I want you it. right now. <laughs> hurt your feeling. In front of God and everybody. Yeah. You've never been on vacation, not one time, without anybody to see and, and, and grab a pumpkin spice latte. I swear to God. Really? I swear to God. I, honest, honestly, I, it's not a like a, a thing that I regularly drink. You if you like, once. If you like you the flavor of it better, would you... <laughs> yeah, but I don't. So it's right. yeah. So you got to let that one go. That one's not sticking because it was a one-time fucking deal, right? Yeah. You didn't but, like it. Uh, you just didn't. I, like it's not it. that I didn't <laughs> like. I just yeah, I didn't like the idea. <laughs> okay. yeah, it's like a guilty pleasure, I guess. I think we've we've talked about it before that coffee drinks. Remember, we're off limits. That everybody should be able to drink what they want to. He's setting you up again. Yeah, yeah. Yes, this is what happens. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've got a. Uh, We've got a present. Oh, that looks cool. Is this from Troy? No. Blood Oath. No, it would be Miller 64 if it was from Troy. <laughs> <Is that what laughs> the drinks? only thing he drinks, yeah. <laughs> Talk about making fun of somebody. You're going to have to <laughs> box that. You use that other. No, actually, actually, I told uh, our customer, Matt Jewell, that, uh, that I was going to come on here and asked him to help me out. Uh, believe it or not, the selection in, in Mantino is not that great for uh, really? bourbon. Huh. Yep. Um, Matt's a bourbon drinker. I've I've uh, had a couple drinks with him in the past, and uh, I knew that he he likes some pretty good stuff. And I asked him if he could send something for today, and he said they tried that uh, him and his buddies not too long ago. And well, that's awesome. Thought, yeah, thought this does like look it. good. Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey finishing Calvados casks, ninety eight point six proof. You know, sure. Yeah, we've done a, we've done a couple <clears throat> of blood oaths, but this is. This looks like kind of something special. It does look like something special. We've d we've done a few things for Matt uh, over the years. We we did a little bit of work on uh, a streetcar for him, and then we've we've done a lot of stuff with uh, Bonneville, uh, with the Flathead Roadster of his. He ended up getting a record with. Um, Matt's a great uh, great guy. He's a little bit older than I am, but been real successful with his business. He's he's sort of a quiet guy but he's he's kind of collecting some really nice stuff and having some nice stuff built right now but i think you'll hear his name uh a little more over the years i think he's he's looking to do more stuff in the future well while jeremy's pouring that up before we get into all the of the craziness of stuff that you've been doing um to basically put troy on the map uh what how i want i always you know it sometimes it becomes cliche but we're, we're i'm, I'm we're all super interested in, in hearing the origin story, right? We want to hear. I also want to get get to the to the bottom of Troy's special pipeline to the schools of why he is the only one that can ever get <laughs> fucking anybody good. But uh, let's uh, let's get into it. Where'd you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Topeka, Kansas. Um, and so, in case you're wondering, other famous other famous people from Topeka, Kansas, um, there aren't any. Yeah, 
So, and the torch. Can, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Jeremy Carlson is it somewhere in Kansas? Is it Topeka? Is it uh, Salina, Salina Kansas. So, okay, yeah. Salina. Where was uh, Mitchler from in Kansas? Uh, Kansas City area. Kansas no, City he area. wasn't. He's Topeka. He was there Topeka. Go, Topeka. He was, yep. uh, in I, fact, I always say he's from Nebraska. <laughs> he gets so pissed. Off. <laughs> in fact, uh, Josh and my my wife went to elementary school through high school together, and then uh, college at Washburn University. Really? Yeah. So I, I've Damn. I've known. I met uh, I met Josh at a um, like an awards banquet thing that he had some pho- photography uh, displayed at. Um, he had uh, Edelbrock's car out at the Salt Flats that he took some photos of, and uh, I, cool. I met him there. And, and and it was the only photography I was interested in in the room, so <laughs> I talked to him. Yeah. What <laughs> What year was that? Two thousand two, maybe. Yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, grew up in, in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, I guess my first uh, influence as far as hot rods are concerned, my, my dad and my stepmom would take me to uh, a local car show that was in town in, in Ottawa, Kansas when I was growing up. And it was more of just something to do on the weekend versus... Cruising and, style and thing. Being, yeah, they, they weren't particularly car people. My dad had a couple of interesting things in high school, but but just old cars to him. You know, 55 Chevy and a Malibu and... Uh, he and his brother just sort of shared cars and crashed them and got something else, and that was it. So he had a mild interest in cars, but but didn't really grow up in a car family. And my my stepdad didn't just minor service on his stuff, and, and that was it. So my first real influence, I guess, would be Hot Rod Magazine. So when, when I was younger, our elementary school, just like lots of schools do fundraisers, and one of their fundraisers was selling magazine subscriptions. Well, I was, I was younger, but my older brother sold magazine subscriptions. And then if you sell enough and make enough money for the school, then you get to pick out a magazine subscription. You don't get a kickback or anything. <laughs> yeah, <he's, laughs> you something, right? right? So uh, he, wouldn't, he didn't seem to be too interested in much else of the selection, uh, so he picked Hot Rod Magazine. So that would have been uh, early 90s. Um, and he kind of leafed through them and, and sort of mild interest and then sort of cast them aside. But I probably read every page of 1992, 93, 94 uh, Hot Rod magazine over and over and over again, just yes. infatuated with every it. Every ad, every yep. editor's yep. Uh, forward. And, yeah. yeah. To, to the point of like, yeah, all the ads and stuff, like learning what car parts are from the advertisements but you knew what, you knew what wheels were because if you're reading any automotive like hot rod truck <laughs> thing from back in that day half of it was a billet specialty z yeah it was yeah, like, it come. like six seven pages yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah so um so that was my first my first real introduction to to hot rods besides that that local show that we went to like once a year and going to the cruise night and every once in a while there'd be something in a parking lot and doing that um so as i grew up uh we had a a backdoor neighbor to us that was really big in promoting vocational schools and so he was an advocate for the local vocational schools and and constantly was talking to people about it my my older brother's a couple years older than me and so um when he was in, in high school, our neighbor had talked to him about just checking it out. And so he went over there and he ended up going through a drafting program uh, at our local vocational school his junior and senior year. And then between my seventh and eighth grade year, maybe eighth and ninth, um, I went to the same Votech and went to a summer program where you could um, try several different classes and then see if any one of them had some interest to you. And so um, I took automotive tech, um, collision, and something else. I don't even remember the other. Um, but the auto tech one was interesting to me. And, and again, kind of going back to the high rod magazines. And I don't know if my parents thought it was strange or not that, that I wanted to do that. But at that point, I had a regular subscription to several things, even though I had no car. Right. Um, and so. I, I ended up going to Votech my junior and senior year in high school, which suited me fine because I didn't necessarily want to be at the building, you know, the yeah. high school building anyway. So I know I've heard you guys talk about it on here. Hey, get on that short bus and go to Votech. <laughs> was that the way it was? Was that the feel? Um, it, we didn't we didn't have a short bus, so that was part was of the, you know, part bus. of the advantage. It's yeah, full okay. size bus, right. even though there are only ten of us on there or whatever. But um, sort of. 
Um, I think our high school was big enough. Uh, I mean, my graduating class was 300 and something kids. It was big enough that by the time you were loading on the bus to go to Votech, everybody else was in their first hour and you, they didn't really know. And they didn't miss me. So <laughs> when I showed up in the afternoon, they just assumed I wasn't around. Gotcha. You know, wherever. Right. But so I, I went to... I went to Votech my junior and senior year, um, and the first year I was in school, um, my instructor had mentioned McPherson College, and so um, he just talked a little bit about it in class, and I, I don't remember what the catalyst was for the, the discussion in the first place, um, but he just talked about Jay Leno at the time having some involvement with the school and him being a promoter of it and, and kind of a champion for the program and that sort of thing. Um, but he said it was a, a, an accredited program for automotive restoration. And so at the time, uh, Wyotech was starting to push their ads more and more on Saturday morning and that sort of thing and, and print ads and that. that. Um, but, you know, there, there weren't many recruiters like in our area that, that were, were coming out and really talking to people and that sort of thing at high school or anything like that. Um, so I ended up... Um, I finished Votech in my, my second year, you could do on the job training your second semester, which again, suited me just fine because I could just go to work um, in the morning, go to high school for my US government class and then go back to work in the afternoon. And that was really that's, all that's I did cool. my, yeah, my second semester in high school. And um, I had taken the ACT early enough in high school that whatever the Board of Regents requirements or whatever, um, if you got a high enough score on that, then you, it wasn't a requirement for graduation. So there were probably half a dozen classes I didn't take in high school, and I got a low score on ACT, if that gives you any <laughs> indication of what, <laughs> enough, enough to what pass, the requirements to get, are. Get, yeah, okay. yeah. That's all that matters. Yeah. Well, and so passing is passing. <laughs> right. Is that, like low, is that like low enough where you're a lost cause and they're not going to try to bring you <laughs> right. up? Or? Yeah. All right. That's, this one's done. <laughs> See, I went, <laughs> I went to all those classes, but I still got that low score. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they looked at that like a lost cause. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. Gets, yeah. He's going to vocational yeah, school. Yeah, he's going to vocational school. Yeah, he's, going to vocational yeah, he's good. Right, yeah. Um, Before so, you get to McPherson, I want to sure, ask sure. you, back on, talking about the, the Hot Rod magazines mm -hmm. and you start getting other, other subscriptions, you're still going to those cruise-ins. I'm interested in, you're reading through those magazines, because I remember doing it, right? You're memorizing all the stuff, and you're seeing all this bitching stuff, a lot of West Coast stuff, right? And the highest of the high end. Yep. When you're going to those cruise-ins, is it just cars? You're like, holy shit, this is awesome. Or are you starting already to see levels? Are you starting to see like, well, that's, I mean, that's cool, but it, that's not like, you know, Swiss cheese. Like that, that's not like, I think, you know, I think even in the magazines, it was, it was divided, you know? So when, when you're reading the magazines and you're reading what Boyd's doing, you're not really associating that even with what you're seeing in other magazines. And so when, when I saw that, that was just otherworldly. It was like a manufacturer. Like it wasn't even a, a car to start with, right? right. That's, that's sort of how, how I viewed that. So It's concept car shit. Yeah. And, and, and only certain magazines, um, not, not only, but some magazines really featured a lot of that stuff. And then there were other magazines that were more relatable, I guess. A car craft would be yeah. like what you'd see at the cruise in. Right. Yep. And so Those when I would go to the cruise in, just seeing it in person was something interesting. Yep. So in 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 my mind I don't think I really made the the distinction between the two. Like they're just old cars and I'm still learning things about it and, and that sort of thing. And obviously the more more you read and the more you're exposed to it, the more you learn about it. But there's nobody in my family that was into hot rods. There's nobody yep. even I, that I knew that was into hot rods. The first guy that I that I ever met who who was into that was this guy Brad Lawrence at, at Votech. I mean, it, and his family was into hot rods, and so I went with them to some shows and kind of saw it from from that end of, this is what we do, you know, with the car to get ready, and this is what we do, and you know, whatever. Um, and so he was he was sort of my only friend that was really into into hot rods. Um, I had a couple of friends at high school that were into cars and motorcycles and stuff, but you know, just sort of at a um, you know, introductory level. Um, so just, just backing up just a little bit. Um, when I was going to vocational school, um, when I was in high school, every elective I could take, it was an art class, like ev everything that, that was offered, I would take it if it fit into my schedule. And so I had a pretty good relationship with, um, my art teacher in high school and his son 
owned a German import shop, independent German import shop. So um, when I was doing my on-the-job training, I ended up working for him full-time. Now, I was working for him before that. It just, just so happened that with the opportunity of, to go there instead of school, that's when I started working for him full-time. Um, but it was, it was just him, just Graf and myself that were working at this shop. Um, it was probably, it, it, uh, people ask me, you know, what about having your own shop or you know, whatever? Um, that was probably the first experience that made me think, you know, it, is it worth it? <laughs> is it worth having your own shop? And, and uh, I, th I think part of it is um, he, he was a great mechanic, but like a lot of people in our industry, that doesn't translate to being a good bookkeeper. And so um, that part of it, he just didn't didn't like to do. It was just a big hassle, and it took up so much of his time that it, that it was just frustrating. And then the other side of the job is is doing repair work, which is also frustrating. And so seeing how much effort he put in, uh, and he had a good business, but even a young guy in high school, I was sharing in some of those responsibilities of shop ownership because there were only two of us dealing with it. So dealing with customers and answering phone calls and getting parts and all that stuff. Um, I think from a, a fairly young age, I'm like, there's, there's a lot more to this than just, okay, doing, doing that and getting paid. Get and a crash course on that early on. Huh? That's right, key. Right. And, and I guess in my mind, I was thinking, okay, if it was, if it were cars that were more interesting, is, would that make it better? I mean, the things you don't like are still the things you don't like, re regardless of what kind of car that you're working on. Um, but I will say for, for a first automotive job, it was pretty awesome. He was, he was a great boss. Uh, I learned a lot because the only things I was doing before then were just helping my dad with maintenance stuff on the cars and reading magazines and that sort of thing. Um, so I worked for Graf. He ended up closing his shop um, about a year after I graduated from high school. And with a vocational program, you can transfer your credits to the local university. A lot of schools do that. Uh, reduced tuition rate and all that stuff. So I ended up transferring those credits and getting an associate's degree in Washburn University in Topeka. Uh, worked for Graf for the first six months or so I was in college, and then I ended up getting a job at a uh, Cotman Transmission um, shop. And so I did R&R &R work for a transmission shop for about a year and a half um, before I went to McPherson. And... Um, in that time, I was at Washburn, um, and while I was in high school, I had planned on going to Art Center in Pasadena for transportation design. Um, at one point in my life, I, I did a lot of a lot of artwork, a lot of drawing, graphic design, things like that when I was in high school, and even some things that my mom had lined up for uh, me going to uh, this graphic design studio and, and somebody working with me. Would there. they have rather have you taken that path at that point? They never... Never. Said one way or the other. Yeah. <laughs> Back when you were doing them, you were doing like pretty like general service work, mm -hmm. pulling transmissions and I mean, under the hood of a car, just mechanic work, right? Yeah. Was that something at any point there? Did it click or were you like, holy shit, I think I'm pretty fucking good at this? Or were, were the people around you like, this kid is like really excelling? Well, and, and to be fair, a lot of what I was doing <clears throat> then and, and still do that stuff now is is things that just have to be done. You know, it's, it's a lot of things on that first job or working with Graf and, and obviously over working with him for a couple of years, you, you have more and more responsibility and more in-depth jobs and that sort of thing. But starting out, it was a lot of, you know, a lot of brake work, a lot of servicing, you know, oil changes and things like that. And then you get a little more in-depth to the point where you're doing, you know, cylinder heads and, and stuff like that. But, um, uh, and again, just being a small shop, there's just two of us. So in some cases, he just didn't have a choice. Throw me on that. But to answer your question, um, I th I think the understanding that I had an, an aptitude, a mechanical aptitude, was apparent, and yeah. and he wasn't afraid to have me do do something. Um, and then at uh, the transmission place, it was all about how fast Speed. can you get this thing out and how fast can you put it back together. And you didn't ever open them things up, did you? 
No. Yeah, you just pull Not it. me. <laughs> no. I yeah, threw, you're good. I, I threw it to the grumpy good. guy in the corner, and he did yeah, all that. Yeah. This magic, magic <laughs> shit in there. Yeah, there's so, so many pieces. There's more <laughs> pieces, pieces inside that automatic transmission than the rest of the car combined. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I had a couple of part at, at vocational school, but um, like a Turbo 350. It's got about, uh, you know, a tenth the parts in the first three gears of a modern transmission. But, um, I wouldn't go near one. No, like a trans I, pan gasket, I don't blame you. and that's about it. And a I don't blame stick. Yeah, even <laughs> then, converted. even then, you're screwing up because yeah. yeah. that, thing, that thing's got a shelf life on it after you put that <laughs> yeah. trans pan gasket yeah. on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, Cotman transmission R and R. To this day, I could probably get a, a, a transaxle out of a Ford Taurus or a Chrysler minivan in less than thirty minutes. I mean, it's uh, every day you take one out and put that's one tough in work. every day. Yeah, and we had one builder there. I mean, he. He just worked nonstop. I don't know how he kept up. We had three uh, R and R techs there and one builder, so I don't know. I don't know. He he, he knew what he was doing and poor sawdust in him. Yeah, right and most of it. Yeah, most of it. After we put him back together. <laughs> yeah. First uh, first paying first paying job uh, in the automotive field. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, you've heard this. Story. Uh, uh, Rex's Auto Service downtown Birmingham was a started as just a parts runner, right, and then. Uh, like fixing like stick welding shovels back together for like dust pans and then cleaning hose reels at the end of the week, you know, and doing stuff like that. They were old red rags and thinner, pull the hose hoses out, clean the air hoses. And, stuff. and I remember first, it was probably two weeks in and the first like job was a, a square body S10 blazer and uh, up on the lift already. He's like, pull the transmission out of that. Okay, no problem. Get the transmission pan. I'm a jack over there and get everything, get everything disconnected and get everything loose. And I'm, Pull the transmission out and poof. I never pulled the torque converter bolts. He's like, You didn't pull the torque converter bolts, did you? I was like, No, nah, it doesn't look like I did. Well, you learn now. You'll do it next time. Yeah. Clean all that up. Yeah. 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 That's a, that's a mess. Yeah, that's <laughs> a, like a couple gallons. That's a mess. <laughs> yeah. One, one, one of the things I remember the most about working at that, that transmission shop is there was a slight slope obviously to the drain in the middle of the, the room right with the transmission fluids everywhere it doesn't matter if you spilled it or not it's just, it's just on the floor right and so i was wearing these boots that had like like almost no tread on them and i remember standing underneath the car and looking up and just like sliding towards that drain in the in the middle yeah maybe i ought to clean up a little bit around here but um but i uh that was your first that was your first uh, paying automotive job. Mm -hmm. What was your first job? Uh, Chick fil A. Me too. Really? I knew that about you. But Chick fil A. Chick fil A. That's yep. That's all. Did that's, that's, tweeter by any chance? What's that? No, I didn't work at Tweeter. <laughs> <laughs> we only had Best Buy by us. <laughs> uh, we had a Circuit City for a while. Yeah. 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 Yep. Circuit City was. Hey, you remember? Yep. Uh, I, we've never even talked about this, but do you remember the IPA days with Marco, Marco Yosik? Yeah. We had this. <laughs> You talk about first jobs. I completely forgot about this. Back in high school, there was a Marco Josic was a buddy of mine. And uh, he'd be like rolling into school like a fucking businessman. He was like throwing around money. He was like buying subs for his Beamer and stuff and like spending a lot of money. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, I got the job at the IPA. He had an accident for a Polish kid. I'm like, what the fuck is IPA? It's International Profit Association. Like, that's a fucking international profit or something. Yeah, I'm like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. Like, well, are they hiring? Yeah. So he's yeah. like, let me take you by there. It, the shadiest thing you've ever seen in like an industrial park, and it's, it was cold calling. You know, you're you're, oh, okay. selling, you're, you're setting up appointments <clears throat> for guys, you know, who are going to come in and save your business. You know, got you. And uh, international I'm profit like, association. Yeah, this, sounds yeah. This sounds legit, legit <laughs> right? This is it looks like boi it was like boiler room or something. You know, it looked like <laughs> these guys. Were now, like, now was he making his money off of some sort of commission, or yeah. were these people paying him to go to what go away? It was it yeah. was commission, believe it or not. He came up with all sorts of different names, and he was going by because he didn't want to like you know they're just aliases. Yeah, and I think I worked there for like a couple of days and i'm like this is super low quality not for <laughs> you it's not yeah <laughs> you How, did, you'd have done good there. yeah you would have been yeah. all-star you're you got a good line of shit you know oh good sales, yeah, sales, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Salesman, salesmanship <laughs> how long did you work at chick-fil-a um about a year yeah is that not long, for long a, like a first to... job they take no bullshit at least really? my store did no they train no. like you there is no that's not a first job if you don't give a shit. 
go to work Burger King yeah. or McDonald's. Okay. You better get after it if you're going to Chick Fil A. Yeah, and and I mean they part of it is the product, obviously, but quality they're is super quality super strict about about how things are rotated through the fridges and how they're handled and and all that stuff. So that's good. Anybody's, yeah, if anybody's questioning whether it's a good Chick Fil A or not to eat at, you know, if this, if it's like, Chick Fil A, it's yeah. good learning experience. Everything. Yeah. I mean, the way the yeah. ice cream machines are loaded, uh, the the you have to be there for a while before you can bread the chicken. Yeah. But like uh, when but you go through that double wash and stuff like that, there's a very. But, but what's funny is they made me a shift manager within five months, <laughs> <laughs> and I was 15 when I started. Well, you there, showed. So. I was 15 <laughs> when I started, and it, and it wasn't that I had an aptitude for being a manager yeah. either. It, it was just, because kept there was no up. other choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and well, and I I met my wife there, so the the daytime manager would call, and my wife was technically a team leader. They called them team leaders, and he would. He would call my house, talk to my mom before I came home from school, and say, hey, could you have Adam come in early? He, kn he knows I don't want to come in early, right? Yep. But he, he called early enough. He knew I wasn't going to be there. But he also knew I was dating somebody that, that was also working there. And so he'd say, well, if Adam can't come in, Kristen's got to. And I'm like, oh. Okay. So I'm gonna yeah, so I, later, yeah later, later. right <laughs> yeah so so I come in early because they needed extra help but then the day manager would leave as soon as I got there I'm like we're just switching off here pal I yeah. will say <laughs> at least at least my location in my year year and a half great operation like they it's very strict they want the quality to be what the quality is right these managers have been their team leaders managers have been there for a while when closing time comes adults that that work in fast food that have been there for a while and like what they decide to do with their after hours time after 10 o'clock shutting down that's a that's a, a shady bunch of people like they're <laughs> so like the movie it's, waiting. it's, it's a just bit. it's just like the movie waiting uh -huh. and the trades that were happening with other like fast food or food establishments because you get tired of eating your own food for so long so then it's like at the end of the day it's like trading this much chick-fil-a for a the couple bar, bags of Taco bar Bell bar and a couple <laughs> thing, and it, were you yeah. in the food court or was it standalone? Standalone. Yeah, yeah. Food yeah. Court we were the very, started. very first standalone Chick Fil A mm -hmm. in the country. There's probably some yeah. young aspiring hot rod builders listening. To this, what the fuck is a food court? Yeah, what's a <laughs> food court. <laughs> in a mall. Hey, what, what's the story with? Ch when did we get Chick Fil A out here? Because I don't remember seeing them yeah, until like, like recently. Recent, yeah, you know, maybe like, years. Yeah, we never had them out here. Is it yeah. southern? It, was, well, it started in Georgia. Started in Atlanta. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Only in food courts around us. There's several standalones in Topeka now, but the the one in the food court was the, the only one. And not not the, not to stay on the Chick Fil A thing. But <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's formative good years. Yeah. It is formative Listeners years. And, we, and when into, you're talking about yeah. like like n n the management set, boy, was I terrible. <laughs> <laughs> our, our our local news station would broadcast from the food court. So if that gives you any any uh, time reference to to when this was happening, this would have been <laughs> Ron late, Burgundy, late nineties, yeah. <laughs> early early two thousands, and so they're broadcasting from the food court and the owner of the store would call the store and say why aren't you sampling out front and i'm like what are you talking about we are and he's like no you're not i'm watching the news right now i can see I we can just see ran out we yeah, got a fresh batch right coming there's like a delay this is like a, a 30 second delay we're, yeah we're, we're sampling yeah we'll, the we'll, guy we'll, from orange julius we'll out, is out there that's right yeah, yeah. The, the bourbon S chicken person tomorrow's slinging <laughs> slices out there and, <laughs> and what was funny is yes yeah, tomorrow's right yeah. there um but it, the funny thing was we would be slammed. That's why we. That's why I didn't have anybody out front. And I'm telling you, if you if you're watching the news broadcast, and I would I mentioned this on the phone. I'm like, there's nobody at any other store. They're all at Chick Fil A over already. Quality, quality why? product. Now we're just yeah. handing things out. Yeah. Right? You want to give them their sandwich too? So yeah. you were a good manager. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. You worry about the bottom line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But from from this time to this time, you better be sampling. Yeah. I don't care who's you know how long they got to wait S for the supply food. and demand. If you're handing it out, it can't be that good. You yeah, know, if people are waiting in line for it. It's probably pretty good. Yep. Mall was open till nine o'clock. I was shutting stuff down at seven thirty. The people coming that last hour, we had nothing, nothing to feed them. Like, there's no fries. There's there's no ice cream. There's nothing. There's nothing left. I still remember cleaning that fry, the 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 where you drop the fries, whatever that thing is. That was a, a daily cleanup at the end of the day. Yep, they call it uh, you, skimming, skimming. Yeah. Got to clean the the fryer out at the bottom. But I'll, I can tell you this again from a from a, a first job standpoint. I will 
clean that fryer until it, it looks like a mirror versus dealing with customers. <laughs> <laughs> People are the worst. Man. <laughs> my, my, my now wife, when, when, she, when we were on the shift at the same time, she had superiority. Well, she has superiority, but she, I think she, she still does. does. <laughs> she yeah, does. Exactly, exactly, from, <laughs> for sure. But, um, Good save. But she Good was, save. yeah, she was, she was uh, in charge and locked us up front. Um, so that nobody could come back off of a register when okay. when we decided that that oh, we have enough help up here, um, so we were we were locked up front. Um, but uh, mm. just one one last Chick Fil A thing. My my wife and I started dating when we were both working there, and uh, our first date she was in charge of the store that night. Right, so she was in charge of closing. Um, I got the tickets for the movie before our shift, and so we had a specific time we had to be at uh, at the movie. And so again, I was shutting stuff down early, and boy, did she get in trouble that next day because the store looked terrible. I mean, it's just How many pickles terrible. go on a, chance, on a sandwich? I don't know. Three, <laughs> three. He's the fucking manager. Not yep. two. Yep. Not four. You. you were the three. one. You were the one slapping the pickles three. on. He's running yeah. shit. He's closing <laughs> stores. <laughs> <and, yeah. laughs> All right, enough. So, enough yeah. Mc, yeah, yeah. McPherson, right? You hear yep. about McPherson? You, yep. you you decide you're gonna go. Yep. Yeah, I I went out there. What a little, little what pulled bit, you yep. from Pasadena Art School? Um, I think that the hot rod thing in in general. I mean, um. Uh, we ha- we had somebody from another. Um, it might have been Savannah School of Art and Design that oh, came and, and talked to us um, either at high school or at vocational school. I can't remember which. Um, that program seemed seemed interesting. That was expensive well. schools. Very expensive, and and so was Pasadena. Um, but when when they came and spoke to us, um, they had examples of student work, and just like with any. OE manufacturer, your job is to work on a particular piece for a long time, and you do a hundred concepts for this, and then we're going to narrow it down. And then, then we want you to you know work on these ten or whatever, and these three, and then all right, work on this one. We want all these angles and that sort of thing, and then the end, you know, you have somebody in charge of art and design come in and say, nah, let's let's do something else. And so you spend all this time on it, and and not that there isn't some satisfaction in seeing some of the things that you've designed in the end, um, but it, it seemed like a bit of a grind. And the idea of working on cars, and I did have an aptitude for for doing that, um, and and older cars, it it just it just seemed like something I was more interested in. And at that time, I mean. Um, uh, I'd read a little bit about Foose. I don't know that, that there was too much uh, as far as rides or overhauling. Um, maybe it's just getting started at that point. Um, but the other thing that sort of got me interested in, in going to uh, McPherson was um, Motorcycle Mania. I mean, all, all of us watched it, right? Yeah. And okay. so um, I remember I had a, a neighbor, um, Herman Wyatt, and he, he was the only guy I knew. What person. a name. Yeah. <laughs> Herman Wyatt, yeah. He was... <laughs> He was he was the neighborhood um, single dad that was always out there with his shirt off working on his motorcycle, right? smoking cigarettes, right? Um, but but I'd go over and see what he's working on because he's the only person I knew personally that had a custom motorcycle. So I go over and and see what Herman was working on. And I remember distinctly the day after the first motorcycle mania came out, I came over and just like talked about it nonstop, right? Um, but I toured McPherson, uh, saw that they had. Um, you know, pretty interesting program and, and decided that I wanted to go there. And I, I guess at that point, some of the things with Chip and, and having gone to um, Art Center in Pasadena, um, he was obviously working in the industry and worked for Boyd and then, then for himself and, um, and all that. So there was still an avenue to do that. And I guess I figured I would go to McPherson. It was sort of convenient for me. It's a couple hours from home. Um, and if I determined after that, and at the time, it was just an associate's program, two years, uh, that I wanted to go into the design. I would, I would evaluate it then. Um, in the meantime, I mean, my, my uh, girlfriend and I got engaged um, during that time, uh, just before I went to McPherson. Um, and then she was getting her undergrad degree, and she's, she's a, a year ahead of me um, in school. And so I finished up my associate's degree at McPherson at the same time that she was finishing up up her um, 
undergraduate degree or bachelor's degree. Um, but yeah, I ended up going to McPherson. I worked for a shop in town there, A1 Auto Service, um, just again, doing general automotive stuff and just, just going from the transmission shop into there and just more experience. And again, a lot of service stuff, wheels, tires, brakes, stuff like that. A little bit of di diagnostic stuff. Um, McPherson was a great program. Um, are they doing job placement when you're coming when you're finishing that up? The even now, like the the way that job placement sort of works there, are there there are a lot of shops that have some affiliation with the school, whether it's a employee that went to school there or their shop has been involved with um, the program as far as a, a destination for a trip for students or something like that. Um, so they do have a network, but it, it seems to be heavily placed in the restoration world and not in the hot rod world. Um, I was on their national advisory board as an alumni for eight or nine years after I graduated. Um, a big part of that is just the fact that I was like one of the only students that went to the hot rod industry. Um, and so I had a little bit different perspective than, than a lot of the other people on the advisory board um, and had a little different perspective in, and um, uh, information for students and questions and that sort of thing that were fielded to the, the advisory board. Um, but while I was in school, again, it was, a, it was a two year program when I went there and they've transitioned into a bachelor's program now so they don't have an associate's degree. Um, but I ended up sort of deciding to go there versus the Wyotech route because I felt like it was sort of more encompassing um, in fabrication, machining. The curriculum like that. Yeah. yeah that's um, curious because it, I know Wyotech is like the very standard issue kind yep. of street rod course and you see we fielded tens of thousands of yeah. resumes from it. But I'm yeah. always curious. My first is highbrow. It's like Yale. It's right. Like yeah. Ivy yeah. League. <laughs> you know, for fabricators, it's, it sure. really seems like. Yeah. It. yeah. Um, the curriculum is based on on... I mean, it's an associate's degree, so it's an accredited program. So uh, you have to have a certain amount of classroom time, okay. um, but it's heavily weighted towards um, the shop environment. So most of what you're doing is in the shop. Um, and I guess to answer your question, it's broken down into semesters. And each semester, you can have three or four uh, restoration-based classes and a couple um, just core classes, you know, math, science, whatever. Um, and so, but it, they have fabrication and machining, engine building, drivetrain, um, paint and body, woodworking, upholstery, all that stuff. Okay. Um, so essentially everything start to finish. Fabrication, uh, metal work, TIG, yep. I mean, you're TIG welding, you're learning you're yep. behind metal shaping machines there. Yeah, and, and I guess um, to clarify that a little bit, a lot of it is just like any other program, though. It's fundamentals. I mean, it's it's teaching the the very initial steps. Now, as the the program has developed over the years, they've been very good about adding faculty and adding advanced classes for metal shaping and for engine building and uh, body and paint upholstery. There's advanced classes for all those. So if you're getting your bachelor's degree, you have to take all those as well. And then you have um, like senior senior seminar and you have to do a specific project for that and do a presentation and all those things um, all based in the restoration department when i was there they didn't have the advanced classes and so when you're talking about teaching a group of students there's such a broad spectrum of skill set coming in that you're starting everybody at the same point and so obviously you'll have some students that get to this this point faster get through all your bench projects and then start working on actual cars much sooner. Sure. And then there's other other students that never make it past making a three by three inch box and doing four methods of welding on it. I made so many of those boxes, so many like three by three inch square boxes that filled my locker and I just sold them to other students. <laughs> <laughs> Entrepreneur. That we're, that we're never going to get oh, yeah. past that class otherwise. But um, Yeah, it's funny the things. I went to a technical <clears throat> college, too, very briefly. Yeah. And there's a whole welding program. And you, know, you did all this just like nonsense. You know, you're, you're stick welding and you're you're just filling like a piece of, you know, you, a fillet and you're just filling it yeah. like all day. I'm like, I'm not, I have no interest in building bridges. Yeah. I'm not working for Pipe a welder. snowplow yep. company. Yeah. So why am I doing this? Like, I want to learn TIG welding. There was no TIG welding. Yeah. And then we're gas welding. Yeah. I'm like, this is not the 1950s. You know, we right. were gas welding 
on hoods of cars. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what the fuck? Do you have are to, you... like, cuff your pants and... No, but I'm like, what are you teaching cool? people? Like, it's, where is this skill... education in anything, though. Where is this skill going to be used, you know? Yeah. It was so such a dated curriculum. Yeah. It's it very industrial, you know, direction for that. You could be certified for doing a certain type of welding or, or whatever. And the vocational school I went to, I think that was the other class I took when I went there for the summer classes was welding. And it was the same thing. I mean, you're you're in your box and your arc welding and, just and just, yeah. yeah, and 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 that was it. And the idea is, you go through two years of this and you get a certification and you weld on gas pipe or whatever. Right. There's almost nothing to teach. Like it's like you clamp it on, you just fucking drag it. It just welds. You know, it's, yeah. it's not. I don't like know. A, it's fucking hey, stick welding. I'm not. Yeah, you can I don't do know it, enough about it. You but. can do it in dirt. You can do it in water. You can do it in the wind. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, and so at McPherson, going into that, I don't know that I had a particular uh, direction that I wanted to go. I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't have a particular. You're just consuming. Yeah. You're just consuming. Yeah. I didn't have a particular interest in. Okay, I want to learn more about body and pain. I want to learn more about upholstery. I, I like the idea that. Okay, I have to do all these things, and you know, I'm interested in all these things. Maybe sure. something will jump out to me. Inspired. Yeah. Did you have the interest in all the custom cars and yeah. doing cool stuff versus just stock restoration? Yep. And so, so by the time that I went to school there, um, you know, I'd been reading Hot Rod magazine. I'd gone to different shows and that sort of thing, and just sort of educating myself to whatever extent I could. But, but yeah, I had an interest in hot rods. I. I didn't know anything about restored cars, really. Any cruise night that I went to, it wasn't stock Model A. Or, you know, yeah, yeah it's all custom stuff. So that's what I was. <clears throat> I, so I was interested in what I saw in Hot Rod magazine, and then certainly Boyd was a, a huge influence. I mean, he was making the craziest stuff. I mean, things like Cadzilla and even you know Shazoom and you know, Luma Coupe and stuff like that. I mean, he was just infatuated with that. It was just. Did your mind digest that where you could like understand it? Were you looking at that? Because a lot of people would just look at it and it's like way over their head. Are you looking at that car and you're like, I can actually kind of see how they're building that, or like, yeah. Well, and and obviously when they had some build pictures, that that helps, but no, not really. Yeah, I, I I just knew that it was just different. Cool. Yeah, it was just okay. different than other things that were built. I'm just trying to figure out. I'm, 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 I'm like honing in to see if you're like Rain Man, you know, because no. we all know <laughs> the level of fabrication you do. So I'm just I'm asking these little like pointed yeah. questions. Yeah, here I, didn't, I didn't bankrupt okay. Vegas. No, <laughs> 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 no. No, uh, you, uh, you might be su- <laughs> supremely disappointed in this okay. conversation. <laughs> well, he's up. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I had an interest in hot rods going in there. And so anything that we were doing in class, I was just sort of thinking about it in terms of, okay, how does this apply? How does this apply to hot rod stuff, even though that's not what we were necessarily working there? And McPherson has been a lot more open, I, I would say, over the last 15 years or so about – uh, essentially saying that restoration is their emphasis, it's not their limitation. I mean, those are those are their words. And so if students have an interest in doing hot rod stuff, um, the faculty, at least at this point, is is real open to that. And so if if they they aren't necessarily chopping tops in in school, in the class or whatever, but the skill set still transfers um, and and they really push when you're talking about job placement, they really push internship there. And so the school doesn't take responsibility for that. The students do. And so the students go out and talk to shops and, and try to, to find those opportunities themselves in most cases. There are some scholarship that, that um, an internship is associated with. There's a few scholarships in that program. Um, but for the most part, a lot of the students are going out and, and seeking that out themselves. So as I'm going through the program, um, I'm, I'm kind of uh, focusing more and more on the fabrication into things. Um, I did have uh, an aptitude for doing that. I got through my bench projects pretty quick, the welding and that sort of thing, um, and then went on to working on cars pretty quick um, after that was done. And nothing too too dramatic. No, I mean at the time they weren't they weren't teaching like okay we're gonna build a fender on this buck. Uh, they do that now. Um, but at the time, it was like, you know, we're going to patch the bottom part of this Model A um, cowl and, and sure. you know, fix rust in the, the trunk of this Roadster and, and that sort of thing. Um, but, but again, it was, it was a two-year program. And um, to come back to your question, the machinery that we had is all just basic stuff. 
it, I mean, just hand tools, a lot of cases, English wheel, um, shrinker just stretchers. shrinker stretchers, stuff like that. At the time, there's no power hammer there. Um, there's certainly nothing like a, a neck hold. Um, I don't even think they had a pole max when I was there. Um, and the idea is, you know, if, if you can't understand the fundamentals with this, it's like anything else, it's a sports or anything, right? If you don't yeah. understand the fu fundamentals, you can be naturally gifted at being able to do something. But if you don't understand the, the basic concept of this, you, you're only going to go so far. Or what you're doing, you know, in the end, you're trying to do something more complex than, than you're actually capable of. It's just a mess in the end. Um, and so I, I was doing more and more fabrication stuff, and um, my instructors, I found, were pretty open to the idea of me coming in outside of my regular class time to work on things um, as long as I wasn't coming in and using equipment that other people were using in their class. So I actually got quite a bit more time in um, in the fab shop than a lot of students did because because I would go in during other classes or I would go okay. in while the faculty is in, has office hours or whatever and work on stuff. So I, I guess stop right there. Sure. And for all the fabricators that are listening and all the current and prior Roadster Shop employees, you're telling me that they gave you the opportunity to use the equipment after hours and you went ahead and did it mm -hmm. and you learned? From yeah. It? Yeah. Okay. So that's all I'm gonna say. No, we'll say <laughs> because, I think you said. I think you said. I will, I will there, say. I've got to say. There's been so many people. That's it's the most common thing I've heard in all the years I've been in business. Is sheet metal's glamorous, right? Everybody looks at it and they want to learn it. I want to. I want to do. That. I want to be a sheet metal guy. I want to shape sheet metal. Um, they, they see all the equipment. Would it be cool if I like stayed late and used some of the equipment just to, to yeah. kind of learn? Yeah. And my response is always absolutely take as much sheet metal there's a ton of scrap metal go ahead yeah do you know in 20 years of business like how many people have done it zero None. yeah zero yeah not one but i want to learn not one yeah but nobody like and then there's guys willy there's there have been guys willing to teach but it's that's something that you just need yeah. to practice you just need to pick up yeah. metal and you need to fuck it up yep and and, and to be fair, obviously, this is 20 years ago. Things may, they may have cracked down on that. They may, whatever, right? But, the, but, but they didn't crack down on your drive to do it. No. And, and what I was saying is if, if you're looking at something that, that may be a little different between the way that I approached it and what other students were doing, I asked, you know, they aren't just telling you in class, hey, if you want to come in, you know, work in the shop during this time sure. or come in and interrupt our other class. You inquired. I just, yeah, I just kind of snuck in and said, hey, you know, can I, can I work on this? And during that first year, they had, they had some, some project that they were trying to finish up and do this grill shell for, and they were trading, the school was trading something for another project or whatever. And so they were more than happy to, to let me keep working on that because it benefited the school. Um, and so I worked on that when I was there the first year. Well, so while, while I was at McPherson, um, somebody contacted the shop from California, the shop in Culver City, and said, we're, we're kind of interested in having a couple of students that are interested in fabrication to come help uh, in our shop this summer. Um, typically the shops that, that are you know, hosting interns you know, a lot of them are looking for students that might be interested in coming in after they're they're graduated. Um, some cases they're looking for cheap labor, <laughs> depending on what it is. This was somewhere in between. They weren't looking to hire anybody, but they were kind of behind on this. Uh, they were doing an aluminum bodied Cobra. Um, but what was interesting about that is the guy that owned the shop ended up like like he was real flaky. He ended up like just walking away from the shop like in between the time that he inquired about having two guys come out both i and another guy ended up talking to him lining everything up in between that time and when we were supposed to be there he ended up leaving like just ghosted walked, walked away yeah he had a business partner though who shared space there and and he was an architect by trade but understood the machines and and used the stuff in the shop well we benefited the most from it, both I and this guy Mike, um, because they had they had an Eckhold machine there, they had a Polmax machine there, they had you know really nice equipment, um, 
nice welders and that sort of thing. And it was just the two of us. One other guy that was sort of there part time, kind of a hobbyist fabricator, and this guy Pete that that understood the equipment and and patterning methods. But that was it. We had full you know full access to all the equipment, things that we didn't have at school. And this guy that was sort of a hobbyist um, was in you know deep whatever whatever way that he could consume information up to that point, whether it was on the internet, whether it was things he saw on TV, things he was trying at home, whatever. He was bringing that to the shop, sharing it with us, things that we maybe hadn't heard at school. Um, and so just just the idea of patterning things, um, using the Eckhold to shape things, more English wheel work, uh, welding and metal finishing, just a lot more experience. And it was, it was a really, really good internship, even considering the owner of the shop sure. disappeared <laughs> because the, the way they structured it was so great. They, they paid for our... Uh, apartment, which was on like Second Street in Santa Monica, like literally two blocks north of Venice Beach, uh, boardwalk, and a mile south of the um, Santa Monica Pier. I mean, I could walk to the beach every night, you know, if I wanted to. And we didn't work on the weekends. And I was fortunate enough that Mike was about ten years older than me, the other intern, and he had come back to school to learn automotive restoration. But he had traveled and and you know, was pretty heavy in car culture and that sort of thing. And I don't know where he found the information, but I'm telling you, every every weekend we had multiple shows to go to, free concerts, all this stuff in Southern California and just ate it up. Wow. And That's it awesome. was it was such a a, a great experience. Um, you got me flying high that whole time. I mean, it, kid it from was Kansas awesome. and you're like yeah. this is the shit I've been seeing in the magazines. Yeah. And 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 it's it, it was awesome and, and and I was just so fortunate that I had somebody like that with me as well that, that had enough experience in just navigating. Um, but we were both also a little naive. We, we drove out there in an AMC <laughs> Eagle. That's a, that's a badass with fucking no air, ride there, with no air conditioning. But it had four-wheel drive. But yeah, but I'll, but I'll, I'll tell you this. He, he painted it uh, flat black, and I, uh, I had pinstripe flames on it. So even though, <laughs> even though it was an AMC... Um, yeah, it turned heads, but, uh, that, what a great, uh, a great experience. And, uh, I learned a lot, even, even though, yeah, even though the, the owner disappeared, um, I had experience with, uh, equipment that I hadn't before with different methods that I hadn't before. And so when I went back to school the following year for my sophomore year, I kind of brought that stuff back with me. Um, I worked for the school. Uh, that second year as um, for part-time job instead of working at A1 and basically just worked on projects for the school, things that have been sitting around the shop forever um, because you know, you have a new workforce every semester. And so the new workforce knows nothing. And so you get to this point where they're finally making a little progress on this project sure. and then they leave and the next one comes in. And so you never make any real progress on the cars. And so we, there was just a stack of stuff. They're like, we need to do this and do this and do this. These projects are being held up because of these fabrication things. And those cars, they were actually like customer cars. At the, right? at the time, there were a few customer cars because people would would essentially donate the car for some indefinite amount of time yeah. because they needed a certain thing. The school's done away with that completely because it's just, it's they, too messy. They did that where I was at. and. Man, I feel sorry for those yep. customers. <laughs> yep. For the, the people they would let loose yeah. on those cars. But. Yeah. Well, what is the customer thing? That's like going and getting your hair cut at the at the uh, the institute, like the barber's institute. Oh, it's cheap. These guys are learning how to cut hair. Yeah. And you come out of there bitching because it's not good? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You don't go to the school and be like, I ain't got but this much money. Let's do the best you can and then bitch about it after the fact. Right. You got what you paid yeah. for. Yeah. Probably yeah. a little bit more too. You pull off yeah. that door panel and look at what was but, drawn on the inside <laughs> of the door. Yeah. On the flip side, like when <laughs> when two dudes fell asleep on the lunch break in the driver and passenger seat in an SUV <laughs> and me and one other guy took a shit ton of filler and just packed all the door gaps and jams <laughs> with it. All of them. It, you probably don't necessarily <laughs> want that car. Dude, a door will not open. After that, no. yeah, oh, yeah, you think, shit. yeah, just throw it away with the guys in there. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're, you're a shithead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so at that yeah. point, you got the taste of California. You got the taste of the machines. Now you're coming back. The fire, the the fire is full blown lit. Yeah. Well, at, at least you at least you had some concept of what what was possible with with the skill set that you're developing and 
what equipment is available. And also the idea of, you know, we're seeing a lot of different cars out there in person. We're meeting a lot of different people. And I, I didn't meet anybody, you know, of note right. um, besides, besides Jay Leno at a bookstore, something like that. But we went to a lot of car shows and just see, saw a lot of different things, different level of quality. So seeing, seeing things in person that were exponentially better than what I'd seen before, but not necessarily, you know, Shazoom, right? right? Um, gives you some concept of, okay, like, like the things that I am learning in school are, are really are applicable to do this, levels. this type of type of job. Um, so at that point, you know, the stuff on TV was in full swing. I You're mean, doing this part time for the school. So your wife's got a good job by now, right? Um, she's still in school. Okay. Yeah. And, and she's, she's living in Topeka still. And so she's, she's going to, um, she's working on her bachelor's degree in, um, psychology of all things. Now, what year is this? Cause this is when you're talking um, about TV. I graduated what? high school in 2001. Uh, okay. and so that internship was actually in 2003. Oh, this is height. This yeah, is so you're, height. Of, yeah. You're my age. I graduated yep. high school in yep. 01 yep. too. So, and so, so, um, this is overhauling rides, with Courtney yep. on it. Overhauling's on rides is full swing. Um, American chopper was on, um, you know, in, in the stuff on Saturday morning was sort of second tier at that point, but it's stuff, stuff. Uh, walk, but it's watch. stuff. Yeah. At least it's on there. Yeah. Don't, don't be shit on the power block. Man. Hey, I, I'm, I'm not, that's what I watched all through high school. <laughs> <laughs> Were you watching overhauling for the cars for chip or for Courtney? <sighs> yep. Right. Yeah. 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 All, all of those about. things. Yeah. All of those yeah, things. She is just aged like a fine wine. Hundred <laughs> percent. Uh, she sat here. Oh, but we love her. Yeah. yeah. She's right there. There was. Uh, yeah, that was the time, man. You yeah. that you could not turn on a television show, and then it was bleeding over into into regular mainstream yeah. media too. I mean, you had custom cars and like uh, sitcoms and TV yeah. shows well, and movies and stuff with, like uh, that. It was just what was the Tim Tim Tim, Tool, Tim the Toolman Taylor was. It? Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, was it Home Improvement. Yeah. Home Improvement. Yeah, yeah. you have that. Uh, what was it? Thirty Two Roadster or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and his F one hundred was in there. Body must. There was a Nomad, I think, in there too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All those were uh, Mole and Brizio stuff, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Anyway, of course it's, it would be. It's. Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't think any of it made it quite as cool as you know. You brought up the motorcycle mania. Yeah. I mean that. But that would have been. Well, was I was that, in high school still. Yeah. When that, that was first earlier. That came out. Right. Yeah. But yeah. that was the. That was like. That let lit the fire for most everybody, but that was that was hardcore. That was like, yeah. borderline underground. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, when when you saw it, it was it was like the first time that anybody, like, came into a shop. Like when you when you're talking yeah. about it uh, underground, you know, he's he's making that stuff for years by yeah. that point, and other people were too. Um, they just weren't. But but had a TV nobody, show. yeah, no nobody just, came in and, and saw what was going on and he he gave him access and and obviously he's he's got his personality which is just perfect for it and and so it it took off and yeah i mean there's a whole generation of of people just just like us i I still don't think it it, it, he's gotten the credit no for what he's done for that show yeah i mean can can you think can you think of any other one for for our industry that that probably ignited that as much as that single show. Yeah, because you're not talking about excitement. You're talking about, I know what I'm doing. Right. Whatever it takes, right. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. That's fucking like. It just made it cool. It and made it, it like you know. Other b- before mm-hmm. that, it was like you know you they're just blue collar guys in a mm-hmm. shop. You know, and yeah. nobody there was no excitement. But to see, you know, he's got the image. He's got the personality. He sold the sex. He, like he sold every bit of it. Coolest shit. You put you're, you put Boyd like, next in on the cover, right, of Hot Rod, right. Next to the Boydster, right, and then you put Jesse rolling out, you know, on a rigid, right, with a bandana, yeah, like, and tell me what a tell me what hey, a sixteen year old dude in high school wants to be. From one another, <laughs> yeah. and he's, like, dude, he's like lighting pieces of metal on fire and running them through the. Tell me what yeah. a sixteen year old boy full of testosterone yeah. wants to emulate. Yeah, he's married to a porn star at the yeah. time. Yeah. Like, dude, yeah. this guy driving the big body bands. This guy's like got every it figured out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, Fuck yep. yes, this yep. is that's it. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, he I mean, created the customer base at the same time too, because yeah. all the people that thought that was cool and then wanted to have that stuff built, right. and it made it acceptable. Right. So it it started. 
Yeah, we well, talked about it. It's like a Nobel Peace Prize or something, honestly. I mean, Jesse's a controversial guy. People, you know, they, we talked about it on here, but I still, like we've talked about it before, I just don't, everybody says, oh, yeah, that was the, you know, catalyst. And you talk, I mean, we've got guys in the shop the same exact way. John was the same exact way. Yeah, this was yeah. the catalyst. You all over the country, like, oh, yeah, motorcycle mania. But that don't, it's for some reason, you're right. Like, that's not enough. Like, there needs to be a an award. Like, the, well, I think there's some great, maybe the vanilla grill or something just like that. It happens to <laughs> be like all these guys that are like, all right, I mean, with like me, you, uh, Chad, John, all all these guys that grew up like right in that exact yeah. era yeah. that were just so fucking inspired by it. Yeah. Because you just never knew. I mean, I had no idea what that equipment was or that that was like a viable well, career path, you know? It's great. Like you talk about the progression too, because the magazine, you're consuming that, right? And that's as important as it is, it's it's a static print media. So you're seeing pictures, right? And then you see like the first little bit of TV shows and that at that point, it's power block, right? So you're watching uh, Joe and uh, what's the other guy? You know, and you're yeah. just excited because they're doing a camshaft swap, right? Yeah. So it's it's kind of custom. It's kind of a thing. And then you see maybe like, a... You know, it's tucked in t-shirt and braided belt. And it's yeah, it's... Balance, but it's, but it's like there's a, there was no cool factor there. No, there was no cool, but it was... You didn't... At that point, you weren't thinking that it wasn't cool. It was the coolest thing to you because it was custom cars. The even I, watched, I remember watching Motor Week, right? And they do the driving and test, yeah. you know? And there was some custom stuff. Remember the uh, old GM toy box stuff? And, you know, they do it all. Then you started having Lingenfelter stuff coming in. Yeah. And you'd be like, oh, this is cool. But the progression was... The things were cool, but nobody was cool. And then you had, holy shit, like yeah. fucking webbed damn railing on top, and you've got your damn pull max and like gargant. That was just an absolute uh, uh, sensory overload yeah. in all ways. Yeah, it really was. From the music, from what he was doing, to the thing. Like that's, it's still to this day. Yeah. And when you're when you're talking about the the marketing end of it, I mean, he already had production in place. No, whether it was thought through or not, that exposure just catapulted yeah. it. I mean, and then t-shirt sales too. But I think he did better on the t-shirts well, than the yeah, bikes. But. Yeah. Um, but he had he had his line of fenders and and that stuff already in place when when that show came out. I mean, it just you know. Just yeah, he was known. Sure. I mean, Chopper yeah. World. Yeah, but you know, I wasn't a, I wasn't a Chopper guy before yeah, that I, came out. I had like never heard of like the Chopper thing. Like it went from like, oh, you're a Hell's Angels badass to a rich CEO or yeah. Yeah. Wall yeah. Street guy had to have a yeah. big wheel stretched out yeah. Chopper, and that was now cool and acceptable. And it, it yeah, was just made the, American Iron Horse come around, the big dog story. come around. Because I had no idea who he was. I wasn't honestly into bikes or anything. And you're like, there's a dude named Jesse James. Yeah, like <laughs> right, like Jesse James. <laughs> That's doing this badass shit that's, you know, he's ripping down the fucking highway in what, like, uh, Tijuana, Mexico or something, Kid yeah. Rock, oh, that shooting was, yeah. guns, bending metal. You're like, this is this is my career path. <laughs> Dude, I, I've got it figured that out. That was two or three with Kid Rock. That's that was two, right? Two. Yeah. 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 I was like Billy Lane. Yeah. Yeah, but it was like, yeah, anyway. Was, that's enough yeah, about Jesse yeah, James. Right, yeah. <laughs> Like every, he, everybody knows he's cool. He knows he's cool. He'll tell you how cool he is. <laughs> so, <Yeah. clears throat> you'll have to pick up where the fuck we were. Where were we? Oh, we're at the, I don't the, like, the I tail end of McPherson. Let's get right yeah. into All right. So, you know you're going to go get a job. How, yeah. Where do you go out of McPherson? You graduate yeah. McPherson. What's next? Well, it's McPherson, by the way. McPherson. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. McPherson. They, yeah. they, they get yeah. real, real yeah. angry. It sounds almost, it's, it's, like, it's like Canadian McPherson. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> McPherson. <laughs> um, you zoom in on the face well, when you do that yeah. one. <laughs> Canadian McPherson. <Yeah. laughs> my, my second year there, they the, at, at the time, um, Jay Leno was pretty heavily involved with the school. And so what he did was uh, he wrote a series of articles for uh, Popular Mechanics magazine. And instead of getting paid, he donated that money to the school for a scholarship. So it's a Jay Leno Popular Mechanics scholarship. That's cool. So uh, it went to uh, one student each year, and it was a full scholarship for, for the year. And so I was awarded that for my second year at school. It's a, uh, selected by the faculty of the program. Um, and so as part of that, there's an internship that's associated with that scholarship. So because it's an, a two-year associates program, I actually had that internship after um, I graduated. Okay. Um, but when you're talking about directly after McPherson, uh, m my life was sort of a whirlwind because I got married right afterwards, like within a month of graduating. Um, and then I went to this internship in California and I was there for the summer with my new wife. 
and then we moved to Chicago area after that. And what determined that was my wife had finished her bachelor's program in psychology and she was going to uh, her master's program in Erickson Institute in Chicago. Okay. Um, so she was going to be going to school downtown and she had made that decision her last year of, of school at, at Washburn. So that we, we knew that we were going to be moving to the Chicago area and happenstance, whatever, whatever you want to call it, a guy named Dick Messer came and spoke at McPherson College. And at the time... He was associated with the uh, Peterson Museum. And this, when he came to speak, it was within a couple of months they had just finished filming the first episode of Overhauling at, um, at the Peterson. Um, terrible place to do that. They don't have any tools there. They, yeah. <laughs> they barely have a facility to maintain cars. But they did the Overhauling episode there, and Troy was part of that first team on the first two, first two episodes. Okay. So... Dick Messer was talking to our class and I'm like, oh, well, he, he said that Troy's from Chicago and I don't know that I ever even made the connection of where in the country he was from. I just remember reading a couple of the feature articles of the cars before, um, sort of sort of in passing. I'd heard the name, I heard Rad Rides. Sure, um, kind of like how everybody is today. It's sure, just kind of in right. passing. Oh, it's just a, okay. Yeah, it's yeah, like it's somewhere right. up there. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> this, is a young, this is a young Troy Trepanier at this stage. I mean, he's... Is his 30s, 30s, 40s, his 30s, yeah. 30s, yeah. Um, and so I went up to, uh, again, I just went up to Dick after his presentation, and I said, hey, you got a name that I can <laughs> drop when 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 I call up there? Because my wife and I are, are going to be moving up to that area. She's going to school in Chicago, and I don't know where in Chicago the, his shop is, but I'd like to at least send him a resume and a portfolio and whatever, right? And so he gave me Troy's dad's name, Jack, and, and gave me the phone number, the contact information that he had. And so I called Jack while I was still in school. I wanted to get get a leg up on, okay, I have these things going on, but I want to, hey, give me an address. Can I send this stuff to you? You know, at least make a connection there. And so um, I talked to Jack briefly on the phone, sent a portfolio and a resume to him. He called me at school a couple of weeks after that and said that, um, asked if, if I was graduated already, if I was ready to move, move up there, if I, if we were already in the area, all those things. I said, actually I have two more months of school and then I have an internship for, or I'm getting married, then I have an internship for two months and, and then we'll be moving up there. And he's like, well, I don't know if we'll need somebody six months from now, but I guess you can call when you get up here and we'll see. And, um, <laughs> and that was the last I heard from him <laughs> and, and until after all this other stuff was done. And my wife and I ended up getting an apartment sort of between school and, and where the shop was in hopes that I would end up huh. working there. And so she ended up taking the Metro train from, from uh, south, real far south in Chicago, second to last stop down there up to downtown in, in hopes that I would be Damn. working in, in – uh, Mantino, which and so is you just down fifty seven. How did you show so, up? Yeah, well, so Slept sort of parking lot sort for a of. couple of days. I, I I started calling and talking to Jack, uh, like as we were moving down there, as, as we were moving our stuff uh, to to Mantino. I was I was you know reestablishing that communication and and reminding him of who I was, and he's like, oh okay, I'll, I'll dust off the <laughs> resume if it's not in the trash already, you know? <laughs> and so. Um, it, it was sort of they, they were finishing sick fish at the time so they were they were hustling on that and jack was fielding calls and troy never answered i don't think he's ever answered the phone when i've called him to this day <laughs> troy's not answering the phone so um i was talking to jack and and i think he just got tired of me pestering him and he's like if if you want to stop by someday that's fine just don't bother anybody when you're here they're trying to get this car done and i went down there that afternoon i'm like well hey i'm here i'm, I'm <laughs> coming yeah you should have just floated an email and been like how much yeah. y'all paying yeah how much you pay <laughs> how much you pay and yeah then, yeah and then just left it at that or 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 you can put something online and you get four thousand people to say oh if i only live closer <laughs> yeah right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 there's yeah. only in australia does it can snow there both yeah. denmark <laughs> So um, yeah, I, I showed up. They were they were in the last couple of weeks of finishing that car up, um, trying to get it delivered, and uh, yeah, I, I showed up and and kind of interrupted Troy, and he he tells tells the story of me just oh shit did I <laughs> did I tell him to show up? I don't know. And so I 
I started working the Monday after that car left. Um, and uh, they did a two-week trial period with me, and he ended up hiring me after that. Uh, and the first car, the car I worked on when I was um, doing that trial and the car I worked on for a couple of months uh, was a 57 Nomad that I was putting floors in, something like that. Um, and so that was that was the first thing that I that I did for him when when I worked there, and I worked for him for uh, a little over two years the first time. And uh, the Blowfish was the first thing that I worked on um, from start to finish when I started working for him. So that was the that was the first car, the first project I worked for in my and what do you do professional career? What do you do when you're starting there? Because you're pretty green, right? Mm -hmm coming out of school and you had a little bit of metal shaping experience, a little yeah. bit of welding experience, but yeah, he put you on floors on the nomad. First thing he's like, yeah, cut that out, put that in. Yep. Uh, I finished up a little bit of welding. It had like a, a tube chassis. I don't know whose chassis it was, but I did a little bit of welding on some tube stuff on it and then started making floors. Um, I think I just boxed in the inside of the, the rockers or something during that trial. And, and I, I, I kind of think maybe he was thinking, oh, shit, Got to at least have him finish the floors on this thing so we can get it out of here. Because that's all we were doing on the car. It was for Mark Warwick down in Texas. I actually it was his car. So because that car was here. Yeah. Was it? Yeah, yeah that car oh, was here. That was the one. Get a chassis, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember the car there. We, I mean, we were, we grew up in like the same era. So like, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, this had to be like 2003, <clears throat> 2004, yeah. something year over there. Yeah. I remember going and touring the shop and the Nomad is up on like a chassis table. Yeah. And that was like right about probably the Roger Ritzau's Roadster mm -hmm. time. They, they had just finished that too okay. before before I started there. Yeah, yeah, I can like vividly remember seeing the car. And then it's funny, I've never put the two and two together. That was the same car that sat in our showroom forever. Yeah. The car's still not yeah. done. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> it floors was, it was were that. so fucked you couldn't finish it. Oh, God. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah. I believe it. Fucking yeah. oil can. Yeah. <laughs> Thinks it's all crooked as shit. Yeah. I believe it. Yeah. Hey, what do you expect? <laughs> a 20 year old. <laughs> so you do you do two years at Troy's? <clears throat> yeah. Yep. I, I worked for him for, for two years the, the first time. And I worked on the Blowfish all the way through. Um, stayed, stayed there. Um, all the way through that, I uh, was on first love for probably six or seven months before I left. Um, and then my wife and I ended up moving back to Kansas and we lived in Kansas City. Troy likes to tell people that my wife got homesick, but that's not really the case. I mean, we're, we're, we're young and we, we had our first daughter at that point and we had no family there. So uh, it was it was a decision that we made and it, it was it was tough. I, I had a hard hard time with the decision um but it it sort of came down to to me deciding hey you know we have a young family now Need a support we have staff. no family around here yeah for you're, support you're basically like, you're like somebody's gonna watch this kid and it's not gonna be me yeah <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, believe it or not I, i've never really had that that attitude about it but <laughs> but um oh, yeah, i said it not you no, but, right. hey that's fine <laughs> Um, but yeah, there's something to be said for having grandparents yeah. around and, and, and also that, that relationship there. And so I, I moved to, we moved to Kansas city and I ended up working for a shop in Kansas city that, um, it was sort of split. Uh, one side did, um, sort of, uh, service and maintenance on, um, specialty vehicles, um, a lot of European stuff, older European sports cars and that sort of thing. And the other side was sort of a full restoration business. So uh, a great friend of mine, Dave Henderson, uh, was working there since graduating from school. So he had been there for a couple of years um, working at that shop. And when we moved to Kansas City, he offered me a job to, to work there. And so on the restoration side, um, we were doing everything. And at that shop, um, Dave was significant in bringing up the quality just overall in the restoration side. And I think it was just him and one other guy and, and, and Dave's dad worked there for a little while, part time, um, for a bit. And even when I worked there, um, and I really, really enjoyed working with Dave and I was there for four years. Um, I didn't like much more, um, about, about that job. Um, and the guy that owned the shop um, was very much 
uh, it didn't matter how much the quality increased with the two of us working on it, and it was significant. Um, but not only that, but the car was or the shop was back in the black. I mean, it, they were they were operating in a deficit for years. Yep. Um, I don't think Dave necessarily knew the extent of that stuff um, up front, but got it to the point where the restoration side is is floating essentially everything else going on there the the um, mechanics getting lazier and lazier because they don't have to bring in as much money and um and all the while the owner like just sort of belittling what you're doing all the time like you're not doing that right we should do this we should have you know tiers of quality for what people can afford and and just his overall mindset was not in line with Dave's and certainly not mine and, and coming from rad rides and going there, certainly not you know, a, what I knew the was capable. There's, then there's one level of quality when you're coming from there. Right, right. right. And uh, yeah, yeah, your best, yeah. your best. And, and I, I, can, I can speak about that a little bit later, but um, you know, I, I loved working with Dave. He's, he's one of my, my best friends in the world uh, to this day. Uh, and, and he's like the on, one of the only people from my past I talk to regularly. And um, I, I worked there for about four years, um, about three and a half years into working there. Um, I had an opportunity to go to a shop in New England, um, in Essex, Massachusetts, which isn't too far from Boston. Uh, a friend of mine from McPherson was working there for Paul Russell and Company. And uh, if you're not familiar in the restoration world, they're very top tier. I mean, world renowned restoration Sounds shop. Sounds like sailboat restorations. Yeah. Like, <laughs> of the Paul name. Russell and Company, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, a fun fact Essex, Massachusetts was the largest shipbuilding yes. city on the Eastern Seaboard for a long time. That's up there where those rhubarb parbs. Pies are made too, right? <laughs> I never had any rhubarb. Pie. I hate rhubarb. In fact, yeah. <laughs> uh, I I know what the reference is. <laughs> so um, I, I had an opportunity. Yeah, I had, I had an opportunity to uh, go help them as a subcontractor, and uh, I, I, again, Dave actually convinced our boss to to let me go do this job because of. The significance of the car that they were working on is a Bugatti Atlantic. Uh, yeah. It's one of three in existence, and an uh, interesting car. And they needed they needed some help keeping on track. It's that not one the, the ones that uh, Ralph Lauren's Ralph yeah, Lauren's got Ralph, one. Ralph Lauren has the most complete original Bugatti Atlantic. I, I mean, it's probably ninety nine percent complete. The or original the only differences are because he's a designer it's black on black he painted, it, yeah he repainted yeah. it didn't and, he? It, and it wasn't yeah. right that's what I, that's, it's so, like 57 isn't it um yeah i i think yeah um and it's a uh, yeah supercharged supercharged yeah. um 19 i don't know what years they are they built them 1936 down the middle yep it's one of my yep. favorite yeah, it's like cars. A, a mohawk it looks like yeah. a mohawk on it so anyway um paul russell restore Ralph Lorenz in wow. 1992. And so when this other one was being restored, the owner who was from Europe had Ralph, or had Paul Russell do it. So um, based on the time frame that they were doing this and when they wanted to hit sort of their deadlines along the way, they felt like they were getting further and further behind on the fabrication and the things. So um, why me? I have, honestly I have no idea. Um, I had a friend that was working there at the time, and I was on the advisory board with Paul Russell for a number of years at McPherson College, so I had a connection with them. They knew that I did fabrication work at Rad Rides, and I, I did some in Kansas City, but primarily I was doing bodywork and paint there. <laughs> but uh, So I went there, and I worked uh, for them for about two months um, to, to say that I did something terribly significant on the car would be an overstatement. I, I made like floor pans and, and the, fuel, the fuel tank and the headlight fairings and things like that, things that are significant that eat up so much time, but it's, it's the details. And that's, yeah. that's what I worked on. And uh, their other um, panel beater, uh, Richard, was a legitimate master panel beater from England. Um, and he was working on a lot of the other more complicated things um, at the time. So I worked, I worked on that for a couple of months. 
and um, that was that was probably significant in the sense that I was working on something again that that I really enjoyed the project and I, and I enjoyed the um, the level that it had to be done to. Um, but I just sort of viewed it as this was a great opportunity. It was something that sure. that I had the opportunity to do and. And I took it. I took the opportunity, and uh, great experience. Uh, you know, fun working for Paul and and doing that job. They made me a job offer. You know, after that, and everybody's always looking for help, right? Yep. So <laughs> he made me a job offer, which uh, I I declined and said, you know, not only is our our family here, but that's real far from them as well. And at that point in time. Um, it, it was nice to work on work on something that that really the expectation was up there on what the quality sure. of the work was. Um, somewhere along that time, Troy had come to a show in Kansas City, and he had some time before a flight, and so he and I um, connected and, and hung out for a little bit. And he sort of asked what I what I've been working on, and and um, which I didn't tell him because. He really didn't care. He just hey, like, yeah. doing Bugatti hey, he's just stuff, yeah. Know, he's just, he's just angling to get somebody to come back, <laughs> right? Um, and I, I had told him that I was doing upholstery work in the garage, and um, which I had. And, and from the time that I moved back to Kansas City, I bought a used sewing machine, and uh, I didn't do any of that uh, when I worked for Troy the first time. Um, I bought a used sewing machine, a little air compressor. I worked out of my garage and did did upholstery work word of mouth and um just having somebody that that um could get an upholstery job done <laughs> and for dirt cheap i had plenty of work i'm <clears throat> sure um but talk about a struggle when when you're you're getting up at about five in the morning getting to work working a full day coming home being home for dinner getting kids in bed and then going down to the basement to start the other job at 9 30 10 o'clock at night and work until one in the morning um, that's, doing that's doing awesome. those things, and like I mentioned to you earlier, Jeremy, some of that stuff. I mean, it was not glamorous. It's like pontoon boat seats, and right. and and that just project in particular. Bills. Yeah, that po project in particular. The guy just kept bringing seats. I'm like, how many pontoons? <laughs> how oh, big of a pontoon? Yeah. <laughs> Sixty so foot many, pontoon. Yeah. <laughs> it's just one. It's just one. Yeah. There's just seven hundred <laughs> square feet of material, and I'm gonna have to order some more vinyl for this thing. Um, but I, I I did a number of different things and. Um, uh, one of the mechanics that I worked with in, in Kansas City had a um, uh, Alfa Romeo Spider. Um, it's like a 53, and he wanted the seats redone in it. And I'm like, well, I can, but I don't have all that much experience with building seat foam and, and patterning seats. Like other things I, I did pretty well. And I'd, I'd done a few seats and that sort of thing at that point. And so... <laughs> I ended up reaching out to um, this guy named Joe Poindexter at A1 Auto Trim in uh, Kansas City. And at the time, I think he was in his mid-70s. Um, interesting guy we had had. I had met him because we had a little bit of work done through the shop in Kansas City. And he um, he was an interesting guy. He was real gruff um, and real bitter about the industry that he was working in because he felt like there were so many shops that were just doing subpar work and he was losing so much work to these other shops that were just like throwing stuff together. And I said, you're not hearing anything about a guy in his garage up in North Kansas City. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I told him I had these seats that I wanted to do for this, this guy's car, um, but I didn't have any experience with uh, building seat foam and that sort of thing. And he was gracious enough, like, after talking to him a number of times, I think he felt like, okay, well, he's asking me interesting questions anyway, and it's somebody that actually wants to learn how to do it right and and wants to do this. And so he, he was very gracious. He let me come into his shop at the end of the day. So I left work at 5, went over to his shop. He'd spend about half an hour with me, show me what the next step was, and then just tell me to set the alarm and shut the door when, when I left. And so I'd work for a couple of hours. I'd come back the next week. He'd tell me what the next step is. And so step by step, he showed me how to shape the foam, cut it, pattern, 
sew up the cover, install, all that stuff. And they're very simple seats. They're very, very European style bucket, like a Cobra or something like sure. that. Um, but it was enough information to translate that to other things. So I did a number of other seats in, in, um, my garage. And so when Troy visited and asked me, you know, what I was, what I was doing, um, I said, I was doing some upholstery stuff. I ended up doing some things through the shop as well on customer projects and, and some of that and getting more experience doing it. Um, they had a project at uh, Rad Rides that they had an upholster in house for a brief time, and it was didn't it work. Griffey or what was the guy's name? Uh, Griff Griffin actually Griffin. Griffin actually worked for Troy as a, as a subcontractor okay. um, and came to the shop to work for on the projects there. Um, it wasn't it wasn't him. This was an employee of the shop, um, and he was there for a little while. And uh, Troy asked me if I could come up and and lend a hand on getting this truck done. Um, and so we kind of worked out a, a time when I could go up there and just spend a long weekend to work on, on this truck. And it was a 47 to 51 Chevy. I don't, I don't know what year it was, but, um, by the time I got up there, the, the employee was gone. Um, whether he was fired or they asked him to leave or whatever the scenario was, there just was no employee. There, there was no employee there and nobody <clears throat> to do the upholstery job. And so I went up there, uh, worked on it that weekend, and then came back a couple of weeks later to finish the job. And of course, Troy's working me the whole time about, hey, you know, you're not working on anything interesting <laughs> there. Yeah. And and again, I kind of I kind of just brushed it off. I, like in my mind, I had already determined, hey, you know, my kids are close to their grandparents. You know, we can take them over there on the weekend. They don't miss birthday parties and this and that and and all that stuff. And and honestly, it was uh, it was my wife, Kristen. She she was she was the one that that sort of not necessarily made the decision for us to come back, but she's the one that breached the conversation. After I came back from uh, working on that interior, um, you know, I just went back to work and, and doing what I was doing in the garage and doing what I was doing at work. And, and in all honesty, I, I just wasn't all that pleasant a person at home, whether, whether it's distance or whatever. Yeah. And, and you're working fucking yeah, working 300 hours 18 a hours a day, right? All the time. Yeah, and but you're not you're also not as fulfilled as as you right as you want to be right, and that's that that's a big part of it. So work is is transferring into our personal life and the well being of everybody within our family because of that, and it shouldn't. I sh you know you want to be able to leave it at the door, but. Yep. Things Almost like yeah, a psychology degree or something. You sound like yeah, a bad person. A, I've know, never, right? I've, hey, I've, we've never hey, let hey. that happen in our yeah. lives ever. <laughs> so my wife's the one is, and and I remember the conversation pretty vividly. She said, "So what are we going to do?" And I'm like, "Well, well, about what?" Like uh, that, that was the start of the conversation. She's like, well, "What do you want to? What do you want to do?" I mean, do you want to move back to Illinois? I'm like, I'm, I didn't even really talk to her about these conversations that that Troy had, you know. And, and he didn't out come outright say, hey, you don't need to be around your family. You need to come back here. Um, what, you know, he's just... But he's wanting you to... He, he, he's, yeah. what, was it the Kevin Hart comedy skit recently? Or was it where he's roasting... Uh, God, he's doing that roast where it... It's fuck them kids. Was it, <laughs> oh, on uh, the Tom Brady... Was the Tom yeah, Brady Tom roast? Brady yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you're thinking you're like the family at work. <laughs> I don't really care. I don't care. I don't care about any Let's of those go. things. Yeah. Yeah. I need you. yeah. Um but but my wife my wife is the one that, that brought it up. She she said, Hey, what what are we gonna do? I think you ought to talk to Troy about about That's a good woman. Going back. Lucky yeah. Guy. Uh, well I can I, I won't get into that too deep because I will get emotional about it. But yeah. I think we all can probably agree that and I and I've had young guys ask me about that. And and say, hey, what what do I do? My my girl's not really on board with what I'm doing and the hours and that sort of thing. And I'm like, I, of course I'm not going to tell them, hey, walk away. No, <laughs> but but if you can't figure out the balance, you, you're screwed. It, yeah, because you are. It it, it has 100 percent to do with her and 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 my success, whatever whatever that looks like. It has so much to do with her handling everything else and, well, it's and to have her a, sacrifice it's important to have a good woman somebody yeah. that's strong and that supports you because there's some won't absolutely you know? but absolutely regardless of the work-life balance you're 100 percent right 
a thousand percent right. But it's 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 lazy to say you just need a good woman because it is a the the woman needs to be good. Yeah. But in that being good, she needs to want you to be your best. Right. And that's the difficult part because you can have a good woman, yep. right? That's like, oh hey, you've worked hard. Five o'clock comes around, be home. Yeah. But that that's a good woman is just a is is that's different than someone that's self sacrificing. That I says mean, you need to be your best because when you're your best, we all for everybody. we all will benefit. Right. Right. And, and we know we're gonna sacrifice. Yep. Right. We're gonna see we're not gonna we're gonna not see you sometimes. The kids are gonna not see you. But don't worry, I got this. We'll ne I'll never be able to live with myself. We'll never be able to see the success that we could see if you don't do your best. Yeah. And, That's and fucking just, different. And That's fucking like, different. Just like I said, when when you know my not being fulfilled at work transfers to my home life and and how i'm acting there and that and and my relationships with with both my family and extended family and friends sure. and all those things all those things suffer to some extent because of it um making a choice like that or a suggestion like that is is for the benefit of everybody just like you're saying yeah. so um i came back up for uh another another job to help with something um and that's when i I told Troy, you know, we can we can discuss what it would what it would take for me to come back, and essentially, essentially, what I told him is, you know, we're in a position right now where our grandkids can see their grandparents, and we can see our parents, and and that sort of thing. And so, we sort of just discussed what it what it would look like with me coming back. Uh, gave gave us the opportunity for my wife to stay home with our kids. Um, in that first few years, I mean, she came back without me to, to see family and, and, um, just trips over, over the summer and that sort of thing, um, a lot, um, because we had that opportunity to do that. I didn't have to have a second job in the garage and, Great. and really that, that, that doing the upholstery in the garage one was, I wanted to learn more about it. But, but secondly, I was like, okay, what I'm making at, at work here is not what I was making at Red yeah. Rides. And, and also, is, this is the only way I'm going to have any, like, free money, right? Anything to play with. But inevitably, all that free money gets eaten up by the, you know, car and, and refrigerator yeah. and all this other stuff. It didn't matter. It was like, it was a wash always. I'd, I'd finish a job, I'd get some money, and the next week it's gone. Yeah. I, I wish it was So many people fun. don't understand <laughs> that. Always net zero. Yeah. yeah. Always. Um, so anyway, I... Uh, Certainly, the hardest part of that um, was was moving away from family again. Um, but you take it for granted so much. We weren't so close. We we're still an hour away from all of them in Kansas City, not Topeka. You take it for granted that you're close enough to go see them when you want to. That then you never do. Right. And so we would see them on holidays. We might see them on on birthdays and that sort of thing, and maybe one other time, two other times during the year. Yeah, they're close enough that you they they could be there if you want them to be there, but you you take them for granted how old and, are the kids at this point um we we had carter our second when when we lived there so our our daughter was maybe four and he would have been just just born okay um and so uh certainly the hardest part was moving away from them again um but like i said those first few years we actually we might have seen them more than we did when we were living an hour away right. because we had the opportunity to do that and in reality the finances to be able to do that um and then and not having both of us working full time and me working all hours of the night too um the second hardest part about that was leaving dave there so this is somebody that he and i are doing good work together we're enjoying the time that that, that we're spending together and then now i'm kind of leaving, leaving him. him to go do something because it's more fulfilling sure um and and so you have you have a relationship and a friendship with somebody that that is very fulfilling right yep. but everything else is is rough something's going and, and he understood right but uh, it, it's it's hard for me to put myself in that position because I haven't been on that end of it. Troy was upset when I left the first time. He and I always got along great together. 
Um, so when I left the first time, even after two years, that, that was difficult for him. And then I'm leaving Dave to come back. It's difficult for him. And so you're just a heartbreaker, dude. I, I guess yeah. so. But <laughs> when, when Chad left, how do you feel about it? It was tough. Yeah. Man. I mean, yeah, we were like inseparable. Yeah. You know, it's almost like I spent more time with Chad than I did my wife. Right. I mean, I want to say, I mean, shit, it's probably 15 years, something yeah. like that, every day yeah. for 12 to 14 hours a you day. You guys were probably so rude to each other. It, it, we had a different relationship. It was actually, Oh, you were kind to him. Yeah, it was okay. like a, <laughs> kind of a kind relationship. Yeah. We were you, kind you to like each other. Him. You like Chad's face. Yeah, yeah, I mean, a it was little just better. Different, different personalities. You know, we mm -hmm. we got along in a different kind of way. This yeah. conversation has taken a <laughs> there turn. There was a lot of like. <laughs> it's you know, a turn that I don't like. Admiration for one another. We, <laughs> sure. It was like we always looked at it as like a uh, like a uh, uh, John Lennon and Paul McCartney thing. You know, it right. was like we never really was discussed. John Lennon. We never really discussed who was John. Right, it didn't need to be, but right. it was just right. you know, or Yoko. It was, right. <laughs> it was just a good team. You know, but Chad's fucking awesome you know and i mean we still right. have a great relationship we're great buddies yeah. and, and, and same thing with dave and i i mean you're disappointed with when, when somebody leaves but you also right. have to understand their reasons for doing right. it same thing with troy when i left left the first time yeah um so yeah we moved we moved back um and moved to mantino so i didn't have to commute anymore and that's been a big thing as well um I think I think one of the newer guys lives even closer to the shop than me, just a block or so away. But I'm I'm so close to the shop that even on a deadline, even even pushing 100 plus hours a week, I can still be home to get my youngest in bed and then go back to the shop. Um, I don't miss a single school event. You know, Mantino is a small town, uh, and and Troy's made it very clear to me over, over the years. He's like, that's where you're supposed to be. I mean, this, this car will be here. But the only reason he says that is because he knows I'm going to come in at 2 o'clock in the morning and get it done. Exactly. Right? Um, but it still holds true. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't miss any of the kids' stuff. Anything that they have going on, I, I, can, it's cool. I can be there. Um, the caveat to that is they all want to be born the same week as car events. I know. Why? Yeah. yeah. Bonneville Speed Week, Pomona. Uh, SEMA? Street machine of the year. Come on, kids. I had one. That's... So we just we just celebrate their happy birthdays. It's just easier that way. <laughs> I think it may have had something to do with like <laughs> nine months before that. Yeah, a little bit. I don't another, know. Another car show yeah. that you were gone you for. You so. came back. <laughs> yeah. You also <laughs> SEMA, right? May. Both of ours are. Yeah. yeah. May. But doesn't that? And that was. Uh... I haven't done the backwards math to see what show we came home from. But... Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly SEMA. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Probably, but that was right in the i was underneath the innovator uh thrashing on that to assemble it when i got the call and i'm like are you sure are you see you're positive like did you call your sister you know, she had a couple kids i'm like i don't know anything about having kids it's the first one <laughs> call your sister make sure this is like this well, is the doctor will handle it though right yeah <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. he knows what to do yeah but i you know so you're, you were excited then. Yes. You took what two weeks off? I, mean, I was excited. The first one was very two exciting, weeks but off. at the same time, you're like, "Can it just happen tomorrow?" Like we've got this car's going to the upholstery shop. Yeah, you know, it's major milestone. Yeah, but yeah, yeah it's uh, they they do land at of course inopportune times. Of course, <laughs> and and when you have as many as me, it's inevitable. Yeah, <laughs> there's so many of them. How many have you got? Four. Four. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh my yeah. goodness. Yep. Yep. I, I joke. It's I mean, like getting I electrocuted sure. four times. Yeah, well, like, stop. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> That's what happens. Yeah. Put a fork in the spoon. I'm, the... sure, I'm sure my kids don't like the joke, but I always tell people we'll have as many as we can afford, which is why I'm looking for homes for two of them. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you're, you come back. That's about the time, really, Troy starts becoming a household name. Starts starts blowing up right about the time that you come back in there and start really <laughs> stepping, <laughs> stepping the game up. You, I yeah. mean, if you were to chart it, Bro, yeah, well, yeah absolutely. Chart, you would see the blip, plateau, right? Bop. It's yeah. like, yeah, we're talking like what? What is, what is that? Twenty sixteen fucking uh, stock. Yeah. Charts? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Inst I mean, it's <laughs> yeah, it's boom. easy, to, easy to see, hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Uh, first car that you're working on when you come back? Uh, Torino. Mm. Um, yeah, it's would... Le Levi Green had done almost all of that car. Uh, he, he had done o almost all the fabrication as far as I know. He, w he was working on that when I came back. Um, he had jumped over to another car, and I finished um, doing the hood and roll pan and some bumper stuff and, and things like that, um, and then eventually did the upholstery on that. I take that back, though. Um, 
the 54 Buick with the Mercedes drivetrain was the first car that we were working on. I, I was doing upholstery, that was ambitious. upholstery for that car in my garage in Kansas City. Oh, wow. And then uh, I was doing some harnesses and stuff for a little Falcon for George Poteet there as well. Um, that little green one? Green, like one, green yeah. one? I love that car. Yeah. Um, and so those were the first ones when I came back. And then, then the Torino was sort of the next one that, that we were pushing through fabrication um, when I came back. Yeah. Yeah, it was a hell of a car. Yeah. So, and in that in that progression with Troy, is it's pretty obvious that he's just kind of allowed you to you've you've continued to hone your skills and then just try new things and get better try new things and get better try new things and get i'll better. say i'll say with troy and my skill set he always had exponentially more um trust in my ability to do it than i did At every every well, time when he set the stage yeah when he when he <laughs> handed something to me i I mean, to this day, I, I still get sort of anxiety about different things that I'm doing fabrication upholstery wise and, 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 you know, just how to approach it. Once I get into it, it's not a problem, but, but like the upholstery end of it, it was like, okay, you came back. Now we're doing all of our own upholstery in house, all of it. I'm like, no, wait a second. You, you, you didn't see these jobs I was doing in Kansas City. <laughs> Just I'm, because I'm I can doesn't yeah. mean we should. Yeah. Yeah. Tijuana tuck and roll. Yeah, I mean, he's never. I, I never did a full, a full interior before the uh, that '54 Buick. Uh, like we had several of them, like right in a row. '54 uh, Buick, and I didn't even do the full interior. I did like the seats and that thing. But that doesn't matter to him. Because no. at that point, he knows that he's going to give you the time and the resources to make it happen, and he knows the type of person you are. You're not going to ever do anything unless it's fucking perfect, right? Or well, the, the best you can possibly do. Yeah, and 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 we'll come we'll come back to that since since I mentioned it earlier when we talk about the best that you that you can do. I'm in a unique situation, and, and all of us are in a unique situation there. That from every every level, your very best is expected. And at every level, sometimes more than your best is expected, which is a tough spot to put some people in. But that's incredibly unusual. I've worked at, yep. if I added them up, I've worked at eight or nine different shops. And there's always, there's always something that, that limits that to some extent, um, whether it's time, money, you know, resources, connections, whatever it is, there's something that limits your ability to do your best work. And that's not to say that we just, that we don't care that just because our customers are wealthy, that we, that we just like, just spend as much time as it takes to do anything. We, we literally talk about efficiency every single day. What's, what's the best way to do this? What's the most efficient way to do this? How do we get to the end with, with this, skills that we have here with the equipment that we have here or the resources that we have and the connections that we have we talk about it all the time but the expectation is still the same i'm i i need to do my best work efficiently to get to this point um and like i said sometimes more than your best work is expected and and there have been people that have worked there that that don't they don't rise to the occasion yeah, I, I still, again, I, I believe and understand everything that you're saying. We're first of all, we've said Troy too many times because we did say that the rest of the season we're bleeping it out. So I'll have I was going to gonna ask you early what yeah. what do you what would you like to call him? I mean, I'll call him something else. Well, we call yeah, we call got a lot of other names. little sponsors. We call we call Troy BBT Troy Troy Light. Troy Light. So Troy Light. Okay. I think we start calling him Troy Heavy. He's, he's lost, he's lost, lost a, a lot, though. Lost so you know, I don't know. I just I think we just keep calling him Troy. We just need like some sponsorship. We just need to be, you know, dip it out. Like, yeah. Man, he's what? big he's head like, Troy. Troy's the unofficial sponsor of this podcast. He money gets Fuck, fucking <laughs> Troy. But my point to that was he was he it was it was awesome having him on, and he was extremely humble. And I get what you're saying. Of we're going to do this. We're going to there's there's times though that you guys have to be in there and be like this is really going to fuck with the guys like watch this because I've, we, I remember being there on the good guys road tour in the model a, the Mariani Mariana coop was there being built and it's an all in bare metal. Right. And it, it's getting a, it's, ready. It's a sedan. It, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Sedan. Uh, 
I was going. So it's it's yeah. No, you should, no correct me. I, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have done it. Correct me. So make you a better person. We're it's it's. I'm sure there was getting it ready for the tour, right? And there's stuff. But you're we're coming in there, and I'm looking at the fucking alternator, right? And I'm like, oh, come on, right? And you got you that thing's disassembled. It's you know deburred on the inside. It's polished. It's you know all the bolts are polished. Then you're watching the the AC lines, and they're running through. The, I think the motor mount or shock mount. Yeah. And one of the two. One of the two, <laughs> or both. <laughs> <laughs> and there's it's it's you can't deny the quality. You can't deny the craftsmanship. You can't deny the ingenuity and the design. But there's just there's a little bit, even as humble as Troy is, there's just a little bit of a, like this. There's just, it's a t- smallest middle finger of like, yeah, I did that. Yeah, you see that alternator? Yeah. We didn't have to, yeah. but we did. Well, I'll, I'll pass your regards on to Moose because he deburred the <laughs> alternator. I mean, never mind the body's Moose made from scratch. The, yeah. <laughs> patience of a saint. Yeah, Josh is dwelling yeah. on the alternator. And I'm yeah. looking at like, you made that thing from scratch. It's like, the, yeah. it, well, the, 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 the no, details is just, when you're, especially when you're looking at something in, in yeah. mock-up stage, sure. and you're like, "Oh fuck!" Like, I get that it, that has to be done, but it's usually done at paint, yeah. right? It's well, not done, put back together, and like, oh, that's yeah. fucking awesome. Well, and, awesome. and the reality is, it's just like anything else. I mean, you, you you guys have stuff in your shop, and I'm walking around, and I'm looking at things, and I pick up on things, and I'm like, "Man, you know, they did, they did a really be good job on that." Yeah, yeah. Be <laughs> be yeah. Be I'm making notes. I bet I passed you guys some notes. Or, just send those um, to John. <laughs> no, but but you see things, and you're like, "Oh man, that's that's really nice." And I, I've told Jeremy several times. I mean, I know it's your business, but but like the Legends truck chassis, I just couldn't get over like how completely like detailed it was like every single thing about it was thought out and engineered so well so when i saw it at sema i was was sort of blown away by by that chassis it's just like oh the the only thing missing from this is is the the sheet metal yeah i mean handmade one off body yeah well well, (laughs) i appreciate it we'll keep talking about adam banks we won't talk about troy anymore (laughs) (laughs) um but my point is that when you're when you're working on it you don't necessarily think about that. You're 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 thinking about okay, this this is what I'm working on for this car. What do we need? To, what are we doing on this to make it look like it belongs with this car? And then the result is sometimes something that that's impressive. But even then, you don't think that yourself. Right. Like like it's it's pretty rare, and we're, most people are probably like this. I mean, I'm sure there's some people think they're the greatest, but. Um, but when you when you're working Not in on this it, industry. you don't. Yeah, when, <laughs> when you're working on it, you don't think too much about it. It's it's only when somebody else asks you about it or or comments about it that you that you think that oh well yeah this, this is how we did that is it, is it unusual you know whatever not as unusual but you know what I mean is yeah that that's something that grabbed your attention why why did it grab your attention because if we knew you know everything that was going to do that we just do everything that way right. Yeah. Are you able to accept the praise on that, or do you still look at it and find imperfections and things you could have done better and want to make the next one different? Um, or? I'm generally somebody that kind of pushes off praise just in general. It makes me uneasy. Yeah, <laughs> but um, but you know, over the years, it's easier to just say say thank you <laughs> for for um, somebody appreciating something, but. Um, to answer your questions, yeah, yeah, you you still see the the flaws, and I've heard you guys talk about it before. It's and it's the same way with us. The car has to go away, it has to go away and do whatever it's going to do, and then come back, and then you can appreciate it. Yeah. When when you're there, you you have a when you're uh, in the thick of it. There's no love hate relationship. It's just hate yeah. <laughs> with some yeah. of the cars at the end, um, and and mostly because of the steep uh, sleep deprivation, but. But it is, sometimes it is. It's hard to appreciate it in in the moment, and it has to go away. It has to do what it's going to do, um, good or bad, and then and then you can appreciate it afterwards for for what it is. And I can say some of them are are better than others. There are cars that I feel like after the fact you look at it and you're like, man, why did we? Why did we not just that thing, but why did we go this direction with with that car? Um, because now it's not really y- usable the way that that you want it to be. Even if it's what the customer asked for, mm-hmm. did could we have done a better job in steering them 
towards towards what they ultimately wanted and just didn't know. And I know you guys have talked about that as well. When you're talking about building something to win a specific show yep. versus the what the on. rest of the car's life is going to be, yeah, you know how do how do you balance that stuff out? And and I think what we've tried to do more recently is, you know, putting that function side of things up higher and then okay this this thing has to do this on the car whatever it sure. is suspension drivetrain whatever now how do we make that function cool. that way and make it cool and looking. really really make it fit the yeah. rest of the car but you and don't I think, it's not the opposite it used to be the opposite uh, yeah uh, right that sedan that model a sedan is a great example of that because i look yeah. at it and i'm like i've done a lot of the things that you did on that but wrong mm-hmm. right like i've like cowl steer Oh, geometry wise. Yeah, just like the standard like Schroeder box, boom, pop it through the side of the cowl, yeah. and it bump steers like a motherfucker, yeah. right? But it's the it's the look, it's cool. Well, nobody's ever thought of like, well, you just can't correct it because it's just the way it is, you know. Yeah. And then you look at that crazy linkage setup, yeah. and you know we're a chassis manufacturer, so I completely get what's going on there, and I'm like, that's fucking brilliant, you know. Yeah. And the lateral locator on the front instead of there's nowhere to you can't send a pan hard bar across the front of it. And like, yeah. what are you gonna do, right? You're not gonna just omit it. I mean, most yeah. people would, but there's the show that show car, yeah. Well, there's that crazy, yeah. or maybe that's on the 36 where you've got that both crazy, of them. both of them, yeah, it's the like a pin, pin yeah. and a piece of Delrin or something like that, mm-hmm. or what's I don't know what it's surrounded brass. Yeah. There's a brass piece yeah. in there, and then there's a, a bearing that's I in mean, in the axle. Just that it pivots so on. So cutting edge. I mean, yeah. the, the well, thinking. And what, what's funny? Uh, two quick steering stories. That that thing on the Model A, like I had the cowl done, like. Body's done, chassis done, all that stuff. We and and Lawrence is getting ready to machine like the pieces, and so we have that steering box already poked through the side of the the cowl, yep. and he's looking at different linkages on there, and he's got them all like plotted out and in CAD, and he's like, okay, so if we have this arm this long and this arm this long, right, we're gonna get our our steering radius here, um, and we should experience. Let's just say an uh, inch and a quarter of bump steer on the steering <laughs> <laughs> steering wheel. Yeah, little, that's <laughs> not that bad. Hey, hey, we get it down to an inch. Hey, can we get it, can we get a little bit less? I mean, it, even if we even if it's only yeah, yeah, it's only got a little bit less steering on it. And so um, that that was that was more a matter of uh, Lawrence and Troy and I just looked at it like on the rack. I mean, it was like after the fact, and and we're standing there like, okay, well, what what can we do? Yeah. And Lawrence is essentially like, well. You know, it has to be in line with this radius rod or wishbone or whatever you want to call right. it, right? It has to be in line with this so that as it's going through its motion, it stays in line. Like, it's not pushing the, the steering box around. And so we're like, well, we already put this steering box in there. I mean, it's up above your feet that, you know, right. everything's sorted out there. And so um, just the conversation, I made a sketch while we were talking about putting the idler and the bell crank in there and, and all this stuff. And... Basically, we're kind of looking at the sketch and and just like this thing's gonna look so friggin' weird. <laughs> oh well, it'll work. We got yeah. no room yeah. anywhere else, so um, it, it ended up, up working great. And it it doesn't, you know, no bump steer on that car at all. And then on the thirty six, um, use a, a different style steering box. It's out on the chassis, but essentially you're doing the same thing. It's just that the arms down there sure. next to that radius rod in the first place. So. It's a little easier to get the geometry right. Uh, the other story I was going to tell you about steering is uh, we built a, um, a street roadster for land speed racing for the Mariani brothers a number of years ago and uh, had the car fully built, like, un- like quote unquote, unveiled it to them at the shop uh, before going to Chrysler's wind tunnel with that car. So we took the cover off of it at the shop. It's just the brothers and their dad and, and the things all ready to go and load up in the trailer. And we waited till they got there and all this stuff, right? And so we go to steer it out of the building and the steering's reversed because, <laughs> <laughs> because of the box that we use. And we're like, oh, yeah. oh, you cannot imagine how hard it was oh, I know. to, to yeah. get that car in that building because the, I know. Those, <laughs> where that wind tunnel is, it's like miles of of like hallway yeah. and like all these jogs and it's, stuff. It's and opposite. So, yeah. You're like sitting in the car backwards just to just, you to just like told me the it. opposite. Was that the go-kart it, story? No, we yeah, did it. Well, it was go. the go-kart was one of them. <laughs> the first, go, the first go-kart. Was it steering on the town? Well, it was fun. We, it, he was just over, uh, at, 
my parents house and we were going through my old man's got uh like a whole wood working shop down mm-hmm. there with all his old tools and stuff and we're opening up drawers and there's a it a whole sketch of a go-kart that i designed i drew it all out like all the pieces and built it when i was probably 10 years old or something and it's like everything like a whole schematic and i'm showing him like yeah and he's like this is really cool i'm like yeah but I, the fucking steering i did backwards you know the, the way i did the lever and i hooked yeah. it in because i took some parts off of a mower like a and it steered fucking backwards <laughs> and flip-flopped it and everything but it reminds me the better story is that phil had a bronco early bronco and the steering box took a shit in it and uh had, uh our mechanic here replaced it and i forget what the deal was whether it was like a Maybe it's an F flip the box the well, other way. I mean, the box only mm. bolts one, but maybe it was a f- like the F one hundred and fifty box or the F one hundred box yeah. or something was so was the opposite direction. But the pitman arm went mm-hmm. the other way, right? So we put it on, and he goes to pull it out, and it's fucking backwards. And he's like, "Oh shit, what do you want me to do?" I'm like, "Dude, fucking leave it." I'm like, "Leave it." I'm like, "Leave it on there. <laughs> Just let him fucking drive it." <laughs> so we leave, he gets in it. And it's like fucking boom, yeah. Run into the wall. Close. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they Jeez. parked it right at the back and to back it out of the uh, yeah. Yeah. garage door. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah we, we, had, we, had, we had our customers standing there. Hey, you guys are going to drive this yeah. 250 miles an hour, right? Yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter. You can keep telling Trust yourself, us. but it's, yeah. 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 <laughs> even though it's temporary, you can't you can't get used to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, 36 is absolutely crazy. Uh, when thanks. Troy was telling us about it, I'll be honest, I, like, he's trying to go through it, and I'm like, in my head, this is gonna like, suck. I, yeah. I I trust you because everything you've done, but man, and that does not sound like it's gonna work. Yeah. Uh, but holy How, shit, it just keeps getting fucking, fucking better and better. Man. Oh, Absolutely thank you. beautiful. Appreciate it. How did the body shape come to fruition? Because it almost looks like you didn't really have a buck. Per no. Say. You like? No, I mean, you no kind of just like. You just kind of like whipped up a fucking quarter panel. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. Well, like we he did send a car to us. I mean, we we had we had a thirty six Roadster that he owned for a long time. Okay. And um, but a thirty six Roadster doesn't look like that. So like no, you know, no. So so he sent it Goober to us. Underneath and, it. and just a, yeah, just a <laughs> <laughs> legendary Rob McGaffrey. Rob, yeah. Um, but. In an early conversation with Ross, essentially the only direction he had. I mean, we were talking at lunch at SEMA one day, and he said, you know, I'd really like you guys to work on this 36 if you have the time. If you can fit it into what you're doing, I'd love to have you guys do it. And um, and he said, you know, what what do you – kind of timidly, what do you think about doing it fenderless? And I, I kind of sat up straight at that point. Yeah. I'm like, you know, I'd, I'd love to – you know, I'd love to do that because I know what it would – take to make a 36 look good you with the, I, well, I did, okay i didn't know <laughs> no I was, I was about to say you you've been I having these ideas no 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, i i didn't know exactly what it would take but but i knew it would take a tremendous amount of work to make the proportions you. look right and you like a challenge um, yeah um and the same same thing with that 41 that we did for wes he he came to us with two different projects in mind that that eric black had done drawings for and he said you know this one would be easier and i'm just like i'm you know, it the other one kind of looked like the the Cadillac that Foos had done for him not not too long before that, and I'm like, yeah, this this other car, you know, looks a lot like that one. It'd be it's all right, but this other one is a challenge. It's it's yeah. more interesting. But anyway, the 36. Um, after that first conversation, I just did like a side profile sketch of it and just with notes on it that said, you know, this needs to be moved, this needs to be moved, and I just I just had a side a side profile just a stock 36 um and i just moved things around on photoshop to to where it looked right to me and really i mean proportionally from the side it's obviously more like a 33 or 34 yeah. um gorgeous and, and the then proportions are fucking awesome going back to Pulled going back to your question though it's yeah. um it's like i had the stock back half of the body up on the chassis rack okay. and i was using the quarter panels I, I braced up inside the quarter panel so that there was a structure inside of it that held the stock quarter panels in place okay. and then i started building these right over the top of it down to um like where the reveal is so proportionally it's the same size on the front half of the quarter panel okay. and i just hung it on there but 
you, you can only go so far on that. But I had the bracing in there from the stock car. So once I had the quarter panels and um, like the catwalk or whatever you want to call it behind the cockpit done and a few other things around the back, the shoulder of the quarters going into the trunk. Once I had those things sort of roughed in, I took the original body off of there and hung the panels on top of that uh, framework that was that was already in there. So I essentially used the body, the quarter panels as a buck, but everything else is sort of in free space. And then, then I make um, like contour gauges just out of sheet metal to just shrink do it, it side to just side. Just to mirror it. Yeah. To do it, to do it side for side, and and really the the hardest thing with doing that to to me, I've, obviously the fabrication. There's there's a level of difficulty there, but the biggest thing is trying to forecast you know, what needs to happen twenty steps down the road to make this transition look right. So when I was doing that, I I had built the grill and the quarter panels and the trunk lid and and the back panel behind the trunk and all those things before I ever did the doors and the doors almost the whole body was done before I ever did those. So there's no there's nothing in that place to establish the angle of the cowl. Okay. So so I'm just making like big big gauges and stuff sweeps to to determine what that is so I can build the cowl so that we can build the chassis to build the floor and that sort of thing. And the chassis being built after the body is just a matter of we wanted the body in the shape of that to dictate what the chassis okay. shape needed to be versus the other way around. Because obviously we can't, you know, any chassis we would start with or even trying to make the frame, then it's dictating, okay, what's the curve of the side of the car and, and yeah. all those things. So. Yeah, it's just it. Is, I mean, it's so overwhelming looking at it. Like, where do you start? There's another Gooper yeah. photographer. <laughs> All the paparazzi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you're starting a quarter panel like that, what's like? Walk me through the process. Are you? How are you patterning it? Where are you starting from? What's step one? Um, the as far as patterning that, it's it's a cardboard pattern. Um, just laying over the top of that uh, stock quarter panel. And then I'm trying to think of what order I did it in. I'm pretty sure I did the belt line first. And so all the dies for it were were right off of that original body. So it's all pull max stuff. Yeah. So the pull max dies are, are patterned directly off that original body so that you're not ending up with a belt line that's too shallow or something. It it, it is okay. the same as the thirty six. And that was something I was fairly critical on when I was making the dies and stuff is even the reveal around the wheel and what goes underneath the door, which the 30, the original 36 doesn't have one on the rocker, but that reveal is is patterned directly off of the one on the the um, the original 36 as well. So you're not ending up with these just like little jogs in there just for the sake of having a shape. It's actually the, the original shape because when you're doing something like this, there's so much that's changed I'm trying to retain as much that looks like a 36 as possible so that you still know that it is. Yep. Um, and so, you know, pe people ask sometimes, you know, what piece of equipment do you think you use the most or, or that you couldn't do without, well, for, for this, for sure, the Polmax. I have a box full of, die. I mean, there's probably 30 dies that I made specifically for this. And yep. some of them are just like little transition things to stamp the side of the chassis where it tapers away to, to nothing at the front and just lots of little things for this car and sp specifically thing, but i'll minute. throw them all away after this is done because i'm not doing it again <laughs> <laughs> that thing is just like i mean it's like pornography the, <laughs> the way you finish like it's so i can always tell this stuff will pop up in my feed you know mm -hmm. on instagram and i know immediately that it's something you've done because just the way you how sketchy finish, it is. No, yeah. the way you finish your metal work, it's like it's just so fucking beautiful, man. Yeah. Like you know, there's no trace of a like a eighty grit or a fifty grit like yeah. roll lock. Well, and a lot of mark or anything, it's just fucking flawlessly finished. A lot of people ask about. I mean, it, it's it's for sure the the question that people ask the most often on Instagram is you know what what do you finish the panel with. And I want to just, I need to pin just one of those to the top. I'm like, just go open that one because I've answered the question 300 times. <laughs> but, well, answer it one more time. <laughs> yeah. But um, going deeper on that question, though, people 
people look at the metal finishing on that sort of thing and essentially say, well, you're, you're, you're overworking it. You're, you're going way beyond, you know, what's necessary for the sake of body work. And, you know, in some respects, okay. Um, but the way that, that I've gotten to the point here, it's not like this was the end result through my entire career. It was like, okay, I, I, I need to get this done in this amount of time and going back to your best work. And I'm not expected to do this, his best work or the, the guy next to him. This is your best work and this is the amount of time that, that you can do this in. And so when I first started doing this, let's just say I had you know, six hours to do something and I got it to this point in six hours. You know, somebody needed to help me to get it just a little bit further before body work. That's where it was. And so now that I have the same six hours, 20 years later, the result is here. And so the value for the money, in my opinion, is exponentially more. Yes. You know, because, because now you, you're spending the same amount of time. It's just the end result is better. It's so just more experience. Yeah. Or in some cases earlier on in my career, you know, they may give me a little extra time to do something to get it, to get it nice enough to, to get to the next step. But in all honesty, they probably wouldn't have charged for those. I, I mean, I, uh, to this day, we don't charge for every hour. I 100% <laughs> agree with everything you're saying. I think you're 100 spot on. But I, we have to touch on the fact that there's, there's shops out there listening, mm -hmm. and there's people that do this, and there's fabricators in shops right now yeah. that are that are wanting to emulate this look, right? And they're going to do stuff. There's, there's not a, there's not a. Uh, level of quality like you talked about before you're going to do the quality the best that you possibly can do yeah. but at the same time there is over prepping right yeah. stuff you you and troy y'all shop you have customers that are coming to you for the total experience mm -hmm. right so they're wanting this car to be built into a character which yeah. is what you're doing yeah. right it's the social media following all over the place right it's the prominence of the car that's why you're taking it to the shows in bare metal anyway Right. right, and it's yeah. building all of that stuff up, and there's customers out there for that, yeah. right? But not every customer is that no. way, and you, it's not degrading to your level of fabrication skills if you're listening to this and you're working at a not shop at or something like that. No, to not take it to that level, right? It, like, yeah. you got to understand, yeah. it, and it's not, it's not a, it's not that you're hacking the job. No, and and I'll and I'll clarify a little right? bit. I mean, I'm, it, I'm, I'm not. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I got a good example for that. But yeah, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not backtracking on what I what I'm saying. M my point to to what I was saying before is, the more experience you have, the more efficient you are yes. at it, and you can have a higher quality of work in the same amount of time, regardless of what the the end result is. When you're talking about, does the car need to look like this before before it goes to paint? Absolutely not. And and what you're talking about is is you know the expectation with the shop and our customers expectation again it's <laughs> they're expecting me to do my very best work yep. so that's my very best work still as efficiently as i can yes i'm not i'm not making the door panel and then and and still to go back to okay when i'm dressing the weld the process is the process. Yes. I, I, I suppose that after after I, I weld the, the belt line in the, the top of the door to the bottom door skin that I could just, you know, hammer, weld it and leave it there. But, you know, the process, I, I grind it down and I body file it and then sand it with 80 grit and finish it out. There's a lot of people that even even that's even that's too much. You can grind it and just go to body work, and you, and you know what? Like if, 30, if that's dude, if that's what you're, just I know. Fucking and if that and if that's what your customer's expectation is, if that's what your boss's expectation is, if that's what your expectation is, is we need to get get this to a point where we have the least amount of filler on it and get it to the next step. That's okay. That's not what the expectation is of our customer. Yep. Right. Yeah, you've got to you got to work within the customer's expectations, and we're. We're in a unique spot. I mean, we're not doing things anywhere near to the level of this, but you know, we've got some pretty, you know, pretty elaborate metal work that we've done yeah. on some projects, and we'll take it pretty damn far. But at the same time, like we're doing, like Scott's crew cab right now, 
you know, we got the MIG gun out and we're welding seams, mm -hmm. buzzing it down with 36 grit and just hitting it with a, you know, a scotch bright and knocking it out because he yeah. wants a fucking driver. He wants it done quick. Yeah. It's not, you're not hacking anything. You're just, you know, it's a 76 Chevy truck and he's not, this particular experience isn't <clears throat> for the art form. It's for, right. yeah. cause he wants a cool ass truck yeah. and, and you got to work within those expectations. He could, he's a guy that could like, Swing sure. a car like this, sure. but he does, that's not yeah. what he wants right now. Yeah. But and this it, is it's a, on the fabrication art. side is is the most critical thing that we get. I mean, uh, pe people will say things to me that they will never say to Troy, like like in in saying, "Oh, you just you're just taking advantage of your customer. You're you're spending too much time. You're doing you're not." Da, 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 da. But that's and, the thing I want everybody to understand: you're not taking advantage of them. And the, at the same point, there's the shops and the fabricators don't need to try to strive and emulate something else because every customer is different. Right. It's all about the fucking customer and making them happy. And and there there is a difference between st striving and wanting to emulate something and and knowing what the expectation is as well. You can always you can always strive to get better and 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 ask your customer can can we get this further? But but I will say it it always comes back to efficiency what your customer's expectation is and and i i'm not <laughs> i'm not bagging on anybody that does any less I'm, I'm really not right i i've done far less in in my career plenty of times as far as like how it's finished out and so you know i i don't i don't want people to get the misconception that if you're not doing this then you're not doing quality work no that's not what i'm saying at all i don't think yeah. anybody's thinking that and we've talked about it before is you can say you're doing some pretty pretty intricate metal work for a customer, right? And you're a new shop, and you're wanting to showcase your metal skills, right? And the customer's paying you to do that point. Say you get it to that point, you know, and you've hammered and dialed it, you've you've metal finished it, right? To the point you're, you can stop billing that customer at that point mm. and stay late that night because you're trying to build your business card right. and you're trying to build your Instagram and go ahead and metal finish it out to that point. Mm. And, and invest in yourself and invest in your shop and invest in your craft and not take advantage of the customer right. and go that extra mile. You talked about earlier about the guys, you came into the shop and, and used the equipment, right, on half hours. You've talked about you've made the opportunity. So there's, there's a lot of sides to the coin of, well, my customer won't pay for that. Right. Well, if you're capable of doing it and you want to get the customers that are, do, do it. it. Yeah. Do, yeah. You don't have, I'm not... We've talked about it, the labor that it, that's strictly labor. I know it's it's mm -hmm. talent and skill. Sure. Don't get me wrong, but you did you didn't you don't have to buy billet parts or buy a motor yeah. or buy pieces to get to that level. That's just that's just it's labor. Time, it's labor. It's time and skill. So yeah. if if you can physically do it and you want to showcase and you want to get better, do it. Yeah, we've yeah. all done those things. You said you don't bill for every hour right now. Right. Well, and the other the other misconception a little bit is how how much somebody invests in something like this. If if and and to be fair, I'll, I'll bet it's six figures. <laughs> rich, right, rich fucking saying, assholes. Well, and what's, <laughs> fucking guys. What's crazy is the spectrum. Right, fucking sh fucking trailer queen. <laughs> There's <laughs> ten <laughs> levels in the spectrum. In six figures. Yeah, yeah. The the spectrum of of speculation is is astonishing, honestly. Yeah. And I mean, it, I I, I sort of I, I know. And I, and I sort of joke with people, but but the truth is, I I, I tell people, we, we're the best value you're going to find. We were at $75 an hour forever, yeah. forever. We just bumped up to 85 when we, like, just before that car. Yeah. I mean, and, and so when right, people that, are that speculating, really is. I'm like, is is that number because, because that's what it would cost somewhere else? Is that the number... Right. Because of someone else's shop rate, I don't know. I get. I guess my opinion is, if you think that it costs like this many millions of dollars, then I'm glad you think the work looks like that. <laughs> Maybe you're not saying it's worth that, but I mean that 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 speculation comes up a lot. I can't. Get, I mean, I, I can't give the number. Whatever. I apologize. I just saw I, that. I don't know. I saw Jesse. We were just talking about Jesse earlier, and I saw he commented on this, so I just replied to his comment. I just said, say? "I said motorcycle mania was cool." It's <laughs> <laughs> <That is> awesome. <laughs> there, there it is, right there, live, live on air. He's gonna reply with a 
emoji. <laughs> of course. <Yeah. laughs> but see, that, uh, that picture right there is absolutely fucking That's a good beautiful. one. Yeah. I mean, the, the crisp lines on every... There's nothing's like it's soft. Self-Photoshop. Probably, yeah, I figured. You know, it's probably you know, it's all metal filler, and I'm sure there's all sorts of oh, stuff yeah. in there. It's, it's all painted silver. Yep. No, but I mean, fucking yep. a, dude, that's, and you don't, I mean, none of that was. You didn't foam it. You didn't. You just no, not on, saw it no. in your head. Template some tig, tig one. Yeah, you heard him earlier. The guy was like, "Let's do a 36 roadster." Oh yeah, I know exactly what to yeah, do on no. that. <laughs> I'm a little disappointed. Been dreaming about this for yeah, years. Like, making yeah, making yeah, the yeah. panels one thing. I mean, that's an art in itself. But creating the shape and having the vision for the shape and how all those shapes come together. Yes, yeah, uh, some of the stuff will have crazy. like a wire form. I think I think those I think those splash pans had a wire form to them. When you, when you look at it like that, it looks like some crazy Delahaye or something. That that yeah. wouldn't typically be like what I would do, but with the suspension and everything there, it it looks appropriate for the car. And when you say wire form, you just taking like TIG rod and uh, on on, on those. I think I think it was just like three sixteenths um, steel just rod, and, and I made yeah, I, I kind of tacked it to um, the flange to build the the center portion of it. Okay. I think I posted it somewhere, but it's buried in the pictures and in some post, I'm sure. How much of the stuff did you end up having to either hold off on doing till you get to the next stage, like building the chassis or doing the suspension or there, freehand it, get it partially there, and then go back and make the change? There's a few things. Like, like I said, that's the hardest part in, in trying to put things in place that you know you're going to have to have there later, but then not being able to finish it until you get to that next spot. Um, a lot of it... A lot of it, I try to go as far as I possibly can, and, and it's something that I, I share with with our other fabricators as well. Is I, I I hate like coming back to something later and then remembering how much is left to do on it. So I'll do as much as I possibly can um, with with what's in place. Um, even as far as like even if it's a little more difficult to weld it, like being underneath the car or something. Sure. I don't want to take the body off of the chassis and and Go then realize I ha we have a week of work to do to get both the bottom of the car and the top of the chassis yep. done. Uh, it just throws everything off, particularly when that time comes because you're in the middle of that's, you know, trying to get it finished. Yeah, you're thrashing. Yeah. And yeah. That is something we preach like over and over again. Yeah. If you can finish it right now, finish it yeah. right now. If it means taking the fender off right now, and take the fender off right now. Because what's, yeah, sorry. When you get to the tail end of that project, yeah, it goes from like, Okay, it's going to be a. We're going to blow this apart, and it'll be a week to prep it for the body shop. To oh, we're going to blow this apart, and now it's yeah. like two months. Yeah, you know, this is, this is yeah. an ordeal. Yeah, yeah, it it's, it sucks. And and the worst case, I don't want to finish someone else's work, <laughs> and they don't want to finish mine. <laughs> and 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 that's the fact. And the the picture that's up there now, just boxing in the the rocker, reminded me like. Like I was doing this stuff here, but sort of prepping everything and getting it in place um, for the floor. Yep. Um, but Casey Modder at the shop did all the floors. He's another fabricator. He's been with us for about 10 years. And he did all the floors, firewall, um, all that stuff in, on the car and ended up doing a, uh, quite a bit of stuff on the front suspension, cross members and that sort of thing. Uh, he's been on the car with me for for a while now. He's um, the mustache dude. That's yeah, and I mean he he's been invaluable on that car, but also like that that Muroc that we took to AMBR yep. last year. Uh, <laughs> like I was telling you earlier, Jeremy, um, we all like to think that we're getting we're getting better at planning and, and getting things organized for the end of these builds, and we don't have to thrash. And I, I've heard Tro Troy tell so many people. Uh, can I call him Troy? I don't remember what Josh wanted to call him. Heavy, <laughs> yeah, Troy. <laughs> Troy, heavy. Um, we're in, we're in you know, Troy, Troy tells people, "Oh, we're getting better. We don't thrash like we used to." Well, maybe he doesn't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that that Muroc was was, was tough trash. on me. Like, yeah. like, and Casey Casey saved me. I mean, big time. And he he doesn't do a lot of upholstery work, but it got to the end of that project, and there's stuff in the trunk, and I'm like, Casey, you know, have you? You may not have, you know, sprayed the contact cement and glued the leather on the stuff, but you're doing it tonight because we, we, there's no <laughs> other choice. And I mean, Casey hung in there with me, and uh, I mean, really, really saved me at the end of that Muroc build, that Roadster that we did. Uh, but he's been he's been great on this; has done an excellent job on the floor and firewalls, uh, fuel tank, all that stuff. Um, and he's he's really good as far as working with somebody because he really understands. Um, when he needs to ask a question 
yeah. and and listens to the answer and how it how it works in with what he's doing because um, I've worked with plenty of other people that maybe misinterpret the question or they don't know that they need to ask one and then you get further yeah. along and you got to backtrack and and so then you get to the point where just so that we're trying to stay efficient and we're staying on top of things you you kind of are st- staying on top of them all the time and nobody wants that either yep. um neither, neither one of you but case casey's really good about you know he knows when he needs to ask a question and then otherwise he just works and and gets stuff done and that's been that's been great um i finally got this thing um wrapped up fabrication wise into the body shop and uh so he's been freed up a little bit recently to to go work on some other things while i uh, work on upholstery for for this car in the meantime um but i'm sure he'll help out with some final assembly stuff when we get to that point what's the crew like like what's what's the dynamic how many guys are there what's how many projects are going on um i would say like on the on the service side of things on on like um things that come in that just need need small jobs or service or whatever a lot of times there's somewhere three to five cars up front for that sort of thing um in the back we currently have three full projects going right now uh typically we have um uh colby is a younger guy that we hired last year he's a fabricator um casey and myself full-time we have a young guy nate um that's been helping out and he's kind of bouncing around right now but has a lot of interest in in continuing to do fabrication stuff so hypothetically four fabricators full-time three full builds in there um on on the the full project side um and then troy troy kind of bounces around everywhere i mean he'll do fabrication he'll do mechanical work final assembly um so he's he's sort of all over the place he can still see you all right and all that he's got yeah yeah um <laughs> his forehead gets taller all the time but so does mine so, so does I mean, mine yes. yeah but um but yeah i mean he hates being in the shops i mean in the shop in the office i mean he's in the shop all the time i mean you you and he just brings the paperwork out to the shop because he he doesn't want to be in the office and and um She's gonna have to bring that paperwork out here in a couple of weeks. Bring that fucking contract out. He's got to sign. He's he he's got to pay us so much money. Uh-huh. This whole season's been about fucking Troy. I yeah. called him heavy while you were gone. And Good. on top of it, dude, we're buying we're buying parts too. You know, his columns, <laughs> valve covers, like we got. Yeah, yep. yeah. His son's yeah. doing a good job with that. He is. Yeah. Yeah. He he's yep. on top of that. I'll shit. spend money with yeah. him. Ain't no problem. Yeah, Jack. Yeah. Yeah, Troy. Yeah. Troy's gonna start <laughs> paying us. He's Jack. Yeah, Jack's on it. Yep. Man. He's, yep. Just yeah, but, him but, directly. Yeah. yeah, Colby, Colby, and Nate are the the younger guys, and both of them were were McPherson graduates. Austin um, is a guy that we hired. He's local to us. He grew up down there by, um, uh, not in Mantino, but close down there. And um, he's sort of an all around guy, and he was working in a different industry, but um, very good at just just problem solving and and. Um, as silly as it is talking on the phone and just logistics of getting getting things done but uh electrical stuff he he's he's just a sort of guy that will jump into almost anything and just research it to the end of the earth and and having a guy like that that's willing to you know new systems new products whatever um he's just the the kind of guy to put on it but uh, pretty mechanically inclined, so I think he'll spend most of his time up front and on the mechanical side of things. Um, currently, he's been helping out. Um, Troy bought another uh, heavy, bought another building heavy. in town. Um, and I, think it, I think it just <laughs> it's going to stick. Heavy tea and the boys. <laughs> I like that. Uh, um t-shirt but troy Troy and angie bought another building and we're moving our body shop over there and we got a bunch of storage in the front of that building as well at this point so you know we got um, a mcpherson guy at uh chassis assembly joey four-year four-year guy he grew up around here in the barrington area and graduated from mcpherson and came here about three months ago in chassis assembly good good kid good do you rock and rolling when guys are new guys are coming or guys are playing do do you feel like guys are either like overly intimidated or overly ambitious i i think intimidated because we will get we don't get hardly any resumes yeah i mean even even in the past uh, years ago when we've put stuff online or whatever there be a couple that'll show up 
Um, these guys that have come from McPherson, a lot of that just has to do with my relationship there. I was on their advisory board for a long time. I've made a point of going back. Um, they have a student run car show every year and an open house. I've gone back for a bunch of those. Um, I've taken cars from rad rides back to the school and done presentations with the school and that sort of thing. Um, so just my relationship with the school and they've never funneled anybody to me like mm. like they've never even even though i i know their sheet metal instructor i know their upholstery instructor and that sort of it's thing just they, they might a, just some a few bucks or something yeah right <laughs> well, <laughs> i don't know what it takes but um just being in front of them and taking the cars there and and my my relationship with them those guys were familiar with me and that's a little bit easier to make that connection um, versus and there's a personal connection. Yeah. There. And, and we've in the past, like when in between, like when I was on the advisory board and when I was taking cars there, I mean, we've, we've talked to people there and said, Hey, we'd be interested in having somebody. But again, it kind of comes back to, they have so many relationships within the restoration world and they, they just, I don't think they know as much about the hot rod world. And so funneling kids over there, even when they have an interest, they can say, Oh well, you know these places have contacted us, but then you have this small percentage of students that are interested in the hot rod industry, and then you have half a dozen shops that have called and said we'd be interested. And of those few students, they're like, "Oh, you're in Illinois, nah." Yeah. <laughs> and so that's that's sort of a tough thing for us too. I mean, people are, are geographically it's tough as well. Um, those two guys, both of them are from Texas, so they love the winter. No, not so much. Yeah. It's a big draw. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Think the, like the gun things become a problem. Yeah. You know, people, yeah. people like firearms. Yeah. Illinois yeah. is not like real friendly yeah. with that. Yeah. I, I mean, Illinois, you guys are a little bit further yeah. out there yeah. than we are. I've honestly, I've got no gripe. Chicago is a beautiful city. Mm -hmm. As long as you're in the right places, it's sure. the best city in the fucking country as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But I'd agree with that. Yeah. I would. Winners. They're tough, but you know you yeah, take keeps you inside bad. working. Know, the winters right? aren't that bad. It's just the, it's just the cold part of it. Yeah, right. but I think it, it, there's a certain like there's a the winter. There's a work ethic that comes with it, like you said. You know, it keeps you inside and working. Well, and that's yeah, that that's another thing as well. When you talk about work ethic, I mean, people can point fingers at generational stuff or whatever, but the, the bottom line is, some of us were built to work and some of us aren't. Yeah, you know. In, in my case, I'm built to work. And, and, in, and in my <laughs> older brother's case, he's smart. Yeah. <laughs> you know? He got lucky. Yeah. You gotta he work got hard. lucky. Yeah. You know? I'm, I'm, my older you brother's, got, my yeah. older brother's yeah. brilliant. And, and like I said, he went to drafting in vocational school and ended yeah. up doing that in college. And he's been a draftsman at a, a giant um, power plant company like huh. they design, engineer, and build power plants for almost 20 years now. I mean, he's, Damn. he's, very smart and and I just work. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you got the talent to work. It's <laughs> sure. good. That gets you. That sure. gets you a long ways. Yeah, but and, and and to be to be fair to other people, there's obviously a healthier balance to those things too. Um, I'm fortunate, like we talked about before, to have have uh, a wife that handles a lot of things so that I'm uh, allowed to do the things that I'm good at and and provide and that sort of thing. Um, do you think and, that you can be successful in this industry with that healthier balance that you talked about? That's that's a that's a tough spot because I I tell people that the cars we're building are not getting done in forty hours a week. I'm not, and by saying that, it's it's a little little <laughs> philosophical if you want to say that. Yeah, you're getting work done in 40 hours a week. It's the mentality that you're willing to put the hours past 40 that that create a different result. And so if you have somebody that's willing to put the extra time in, I I sort of get the sense that that they're they're, they're going to be there when they need when it really needs to get done. Um, that's also not to say that there aren't people that have structured their businesses that way and has success Al, uh, um, Alloway he he doesn't do overtime and they've obviously done a great job with it 
Uh, he wants his he wants his guys to to work on his own their own projects and have their lives outside now. of that. Now, well, and that's a good point. Yeah. And and um, he worked I'm his sort of, ass off, right, for and a it, long time. Younger, and that's and that's and that's another thing that I've talked to people about as well. For every everybody that you see is successful, there's a tremendous amount of sacrifice. Sometimes it's not them that made the sacrifice to get there. A yeah. lot of times it is. Um, somebody somebody pays the price you know and and so um like i said i mean he he worked his ass off to get where he is and now his his guys are sort of reaping the benefits because because of um, the reputation and i'll say the same thing for heavy it's <laughs> I love it. I, we have uh, now i feel better i honestly i feel better now <laughs> Could be the best podcast. <laughs> is, is is really the he had that reputation well before I was there. He had that reputation well before virtually anyone was there. Moose has been there a long time. And and just a side note, Moose and Warren have been there so long. They have experienced so much emotional and and verbal abuse over the years they <laughs> they both deserve medals i mean seriously well and they're but, they're at the right age too where it's not a potential hr issue sure <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. old enough where yeah. it's like yeah. try to get away with it yeah, yeah right yeah but but troy troy was developing that that heavy was uh <laughs> that reputation and that customer base and that sort of thing well before a lot of us and we get to come in there stand on his shoulders and that expectation is already there um so i uh, when i talk about you know the expectation from every level being where it's at and, and my best work being expected from every level um it's because he put that work in up front right now you can also attribute the fact of continued success to the sacrifice of the, a lot of people that have worked for him over the years. And there have been plenty of successful people. And again, when, when we're talking about, you know, opportunities and, and how you come up in an industry and the things that you learn, uh, again, I was, I mean, I was blessed with the, the people that were working there when I, when I got there, I came into a shop where Levi was Green was working there, and Andy Leach was working there, and Dan Houlihan and Jared Zimmerman. All those guys went on to have their own shop or success in some other, other facet, and that was the group that was there when I first started working there. So even even somebody that's being green, there's always somebody around that I could ask a question. Yeah, sure. And and I would go up to to Dan. He's got a shop in North Carolina now, but I'd go up to Dan all the time and just just say, "Teach me something." I didn't know what he was working on. But more than likely, it was something I'd never done before, and and just going up and, and asking him, hey, you know what, you know what are, what are you working on? Why why are you doing it that way? And he came from a different background, HVAC, and so that guy could lay out anything. <laughs> I mean, you talk about floor pans or something like that. I mean, it it didn't matter. Now, when it came to like complex shaping, that was that was different. That doesn't necessarily lay out with math. He could can do that. Do it on the he, he was, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but he, but he was he was pretty good at that too. Yeah. Um, but I, I was fortunate with that group of people, and, and um, because the shop was established when I walked in, those projects were there, those customers were there, and and coming back to you know people asking me, you know why don't why don't you have your own shop? I mean even even Poteet would ask me that, like right. why what are you doing? Why why don't you have your own thing? Why don't you? you know, because you wouldn't be building benefits. that thirty six. Like that's it what is that's what I tell people. Shop. That's what I tell people is is. You consider um, sort of a sort of a tangent. I'll, I'll, I'll try not to derail too too far here, but I'm I'm sort of a music nerd as well. I was listening to this podcast called uh, Song Exploder, and um, Quest Love was on there. If you guys know who that is, a drummer. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's for uh, drummer on Fallon show yeah. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Big big so, afro. Yeah. And so um, they're Grammy Award been winning. Yeah. Band. They could play anything yeah. at any point in time. So I, I was listening to an episode of that, and he's talking about uh, Mal Malcolm Gladwell's uh, four or ten thousand hours to um, to be great at something, master, right? yeah, master, master anything, something, yeah. right? And and so that's in his book, The Outliers, right? So he's um, uh, Questlove's talking about that, and he said when they were recording this song for for a soundtrack, he said we we're reaping the benefits of having sixty thousand hours of experience in doing this particular thing 
but all of us having different backgrounds as well. So not only do you have all this time in learning how to do this particular craft, but you all have all of these influences from all these different sources so we can do almost anything with this track that we want to do because of all those things. So when you're talking about a shop where you have all these different backgrounds and you have people that are, that are excellent at all these things or even resources and people that you can reach out to outside of that, whether it's a chassis manufacturer or other um, vendors or whatever, or even people that have worked on a particular type of project. I've been working in this industry for, for 20 years as of May this year, and 16 of those were doing almost primarily fabrication at 65 hours a week. Uh, on average, that entire time, I have like 60,000 hours worth of experience doing fabrication. But it's not just me. It's all those other people that are working there and all those contacts. So when, you, when you're talking about all those things, you have the ability and all this experience to do virtually anything in, in, this, in this industry. And that's a big, I mean, that's a big um, advantage as well. And particularly when you have customers that, that give you the opportunity to do it. Well, I th I'm, it's good that you talked about it because, I mean, there's, I, mean, I don't want to discourage anybody from, from following their dream and stuff, but I think that we see it in this industry and you know exactly what we're talking about on too many times the, the thought um, or the egotistical look or whatever the, the gratification of hanging your own shingle with your name on it mm -hmm. overrules your initial love of why you got into this to build the craziest and the wildest and push. Yeah. So sometimes that push is past it. Sometimes it's the best thing for somebody, but sometimes if, if they were honest with themselves before they made that decision and it's about building the craziest and the wildest and being pushed and being around those guys and being able to experience those experiences that you never thought were possible. Sometimes they're giving up those experiences to kind of start over. Um, and then maybe not achieve that, again because that secret sauce can't yeah. be recreated um right. and and, and i'm, and I'm it, glad you mentioned that because it kind of kind of pulls us back to to the initial thing before i derailed is is i get i got to come in right after graduating from school and i had some experiences before that but the first full project i worked on was was the blowfish it's a record-setting bonneville car and race for 17 years now out there for an extraordinary customer that was the very first thing that i worked on in this industry all the way up to the 36 that i'm working on now and every car in between even when i was working in kansas city and doing body work and stuff like that we were still building cool stuff right for what it was um and doing quality stuff and so i've had the opportunity to to do you know a lot of things having worked for somebody else and and i agree is there's just because just because i didn't have my own shop you know doesn't mean that somebody shouldn't seek that out and just just to jump back one of the first classes that i had when i went to mcpherson college was called restoration seminar and basically it was just talking about networking talking about the restoration hobby and and networking and and that sort of thing what 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 is this all about right sure and the first question that that our instructor asked was how many of you in here have aspirations of having your own shop i might have been the only one that didn't raise my hand because i had already worked at grass and cotman transmission and a1 auto at that yep. point and i'm like damn i'm not so sure and and that's not to say that i'm that i'm lazy but the other thing too and and i mentioned this to people before as well that the person that owns the shop gets a lot of the recognition which people have a problem with um whether it's ego or whatever that person gets the recognition for the shop um that person hypothetically might make more money um they get to have their name there they own the building they own the equipment all these things but when you're talking about sacrifice and that sort of thing, they're in that position because they have to deal with all the stuff that nobody wants to deal with. Exactly. And the person <laughs> generally that's asking, why do they get all the credit? It's because they have to deal with you. It's, it's a different <laughs> level of sacrifice for sure. But yeah. you know, you get the satisfaction. If you're not, if your 
ego doesn't crave being in like the limelight and being the guy, just the guy. Like, I'm sure you get an immense amount of satisfaction out of creating that 36. Like, yeah. when that car went to the body shop and you could stand back, you don't probably need everybody's like praise. I'm assuming you don't sure. need the 65 year old dude in fucking new balances and the spiky hair hat at the good guy <laughs> show to be singing your praise. No, you know but if, at the end of the day, because he's the type of person that he is and Troy's the type of person that he is. And because of how talented he is, everybody fucking knows who he is. And he's on this fucking right. podcast talking about how good he is working for fucking Troy. So there's, there's those yeah. paths too. Well, if it's the, the, like, yeah. it's, and, and 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 let's not let's not pass over the fact that the most most a lot of people know who I am because Troy mentions it. I mean, yeah, I I've I've sacrificed a lot for a business that's not mine, and so that's a big part of it. And and the other thing too is, you know, I don't let him down. Like yeah. it, it, he knows that I'm gonna come through regardless of what it is, and so I get a lot of credit because of those things. And I do go to the shows and and the. The other thing too, and and being able to sit here and, and talk to you guys about this, and even you know Instagram and that sort of thing, I I started doing that because I wanted to keep an eye on what everybody else was posting about our stuff at the shop because you know I'm like, eh, it's, I don't know. Again, it's not my thing. I just want to yeah. know yeah. you know what yeah. we're putting out, right? Right. And and so I'm perfectly content with having people that know what they're looking at and ask intelligent questions. I don't need to have a hundred thousand people that are. Sending sure. me fire emojis on my DM. <laughs> if you want to do that, I'm sorry, hey, I'll, that's stop, I'll stop doing no, that. Hey, Damn it! I'm, hey, I thought somebody, fire was cool. And, 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 I'm more of a thumbs up. Hey, guy. It's hey, usually three a time. And if you if you want to send me that, hey, I love that too. That's fire fine. Away, fire away. But but it the the point is that sharing this stuff is is just part of what I like about it. I like talking about the process. I like talking about the design. I like talking about construction and that sort of thing which is why we've been showing them in bare metal it's not it's not i know people think you just you know it's a middle finger or whatever yeah. it's not it's we want to show what we're capable of doing and because you're proud of all the work that you put into we're it we're proud of it but also to, to be fair other shops are doing it as well and it's stepping not, up what they're doing as well as good <laughs> well <laughs> troy I mean, light though fucking troy light I, exactly troy troy light is, exactly he's <laughs> fucking nipping at your heels yeah. man you see in the next po popular hot else. rodding yeah. magazine he's got the big picture yeah. on the cover we got a little one <laughs> yeah watch out <laughs> i i i want to touch real quick before we get into standard questions because you did talk about it you said troy mentions you because he knows you're not you're not gonna let him down right it we talked about the sacrifice. It doesn't take it doesn't take much, but except labor and sacrifice to go that extra mile on the on the labor of, of metal finishing. If you're trying to build that business card, that's probably been the thing that we've beat into the ground on this podcast over and over and over because it comes back to that one thing. There's going to be sacrifices. I'm not, and I got to I got to retract a little bit what I said that I because I asked you if if you can even be successful in this business without sacrificing, I, and I, that's probably not true. It depends on what your definition or level of success that you want to achieve, yeah. right? Because everybody's everybody's definition of that is different. Um, I think at the end of the day, you get out what you put in. You're getting out all that you're putting in. That's why you're on this podcast. That's why that Troy talks well, about you're you. That's this why out to be like this podcast. Yeah. Is well, no, like, just, like like a big. <laughs> there's like hey, seven or eight people you know that what? aren't going to notice. Uh, it is to me. <laughs> it is to me. So the the. <clears throat> and I and I think that there's so many other fabricators, there's so many other shop builders out there that if you look at it from that standpoint, right, it's are you going to fail because you don't? Probably not. But don't don't bitch and complain about the thing you didn't get when you lay your head down at night knowing that you didn't do that extra, right? You didn't go the extra mile. You don't have to. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I, I think that we come across sometimes as saying that's the only right. way. Right. Yeah. The only way you're going to ever do anything. Right. It's not. You can make a good living. Right. Mm -hmm. You can. You've got to be honest with yourself of what your actual definition of success or the goals. The the one year goal, the two year goal, the five year goal. If it's about winning an award, maybe we should talk about some things. Right. If it's about pleasing that customer, or if it's about 
building, being able to build or hone your craft to a thing that you've never done before or build in a certain way, or just have the customer that's willing to work with you and say, what would you like to build? What's the craziest thing that's got in your mind? Maybe that's your measure of success. Maybe it's just flat out providing for the family where your wife don't have to work anymore and you do the same. Then there's a way to do that. You can do mini tubs and floors and rust restoration, you know, <laughs> and, and get to that point. Yeah. But you got to be honest with yourself and know that you get, you're going to get out what you put in. And that's the same goes for everybody that works for us, everybody that's working for any other shop out there. That's it's you, you talked about it of, I want to learn how to do, you know, I'd love to run how, learn how to run the odor. Yeah. Well, come in and run it. I mean, yeah. Right. Everything I ever learned how to do was not between, it was not during nine to five. It, it was always in excess. You know, it's the only, it's, it's truly the only way. I mean, you, you, we're like beating a dead horse with it, but you know, like, how do you get, I mean, my, my question to you is going to be like for a young guy, what would you tell them to, for a guy to get to your level? Like right, short of like the 60,000 hours of experience, sure. like, yeah. what path do you take to get for a talented young fabricator that's looking at those pictures that you post to be like, that's what I want to fucking do. I, I honestly you know? would say that uh, tr truly, if you, if you have like a mechanical aptitude for things, if you, if, if you understand, you know, mechanically how to do something, you know, some, some people are, are going to be able to, to shape sheet metal and some people are not, you, you have an ability to do that. And then it, it comes to how much experience you have. But the other side of that is how much do you understand the other aspects of the build? And so I would say that, that that's probably something that might set me apart is if you're talking about fabricators, there's absolutely people that are better than me. I mean, you can go online in 30 seconds, you're going to find two things. One, somebody that's that's better at you at something and or porn probably in the same video yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, i was i was i was there and you got to it first <laughs> but uh. but um but the, the 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 fact is that yeah the, there's there's better fabricators out there no doubt panel beaters whatever you want to call them um but what i might have to offer is i worked in all these different shops and was exposed to so many different things, upholstery and bodywork and paint and fabrication. You know, and leather assembly. stack up. You know you're going to have to have right. a wind lace that sort of around here. And all of those things makes you better at the thing that you want to focus on. It doesn't matter which one of those things you want to focus on. If you understand the others, it makes you better at it. And so I would say if somebody wants to get better at it, understand some of those other other aspects sure. of the build, and you'll you'll get there faster. You, you will and honestly asking questions I, I mean there's so much information anymore and honestly you know at least myself if somebody has a fabrication question and they ask me on Instagram I can't think of a time I didn't respond to them mm -hmm. um, and so so asking questions I mean you have to actually do it you have to try but um, you know there's there's so much information anymore and the accessibility of people if you admire what they're doing is a lot easier than it's ever been before. Yep. It um, sure is. But the more you can, more you can be around it, the more you can understand those systems and, and how they interact with one another and make you better at it. You hit, I mean, you hit on something that's gold right there. It's like learning all the fundamentals of car building to make yourself like a car know, builder, a, a weapon, you know, yeah. an absolute like multifaceted car builder. Cause there's to, to your point, there's guys that can shape sheet metal, that'll blow your fucking mind. Mm -hmm. But like, how far is that going to get you to just shape sheet metal? There's Maybe. guys that could build the best headers ever known, but they can't ha hang an AC box. Right. right. But or if you're going to build like, you know, you're going to build that inner fender, you're going to build that fucking wheel, you know, wheel flare and have no knowledge of the workings of that like suspension system and where it's going to go or how it like, what things are going to go around, like what you build. It's, it, it's kind of sort of useless. Yeah. You know I mean? It, yeah. It, I was it's gonna, a skill, but yeah. I was going to touch on something that, that Josh was talking about and um, you talk about uh, a little bit about recognition and, and the sacrifice and um, how some of those things uh, interact with one another when you have, my opinion is, when you have employees that are making that sacrifice for the sake of your business, 
I feel like it's important to let them know that that, that you you recognize it. That you appreciate it. You recognize it. And so when when you have somebody that's like the figurehead of the business, they started the business. They 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 took the chance and they took you know the responsibility for doing that. But then you have other people that are coming up and helping with the the success of that business. It's important to let them let yeah. them know whatever that is, whether that means recognition, whether that means financially, whatever that is, it's important that when you start sharing those responsibilities that nobody likes to do, yep. that you you bring them up with you. You give them that recognition, you give them raise or whatever. And and I, I think that's part of, you know, Troy's recognition of, of what I do for him, but part of why, you know, Maybe he doesn't do it very well in the shop and let people know directly, but he's real quick to give people credit when he's showing somebody a car yeah. and and say who did it and, and you know what what their contribution was to it to make sure that at least the person that he's talking to knows that he didn't do it yeah, himself. Somebody it. somebody's doing this at the shop and they're sure. talented. Yeah. yeah, I had a, I had a couple of questions. Oh, get after it. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to hold you guys up. No, anymore. this is um, what we're here for, man. Sure, sure. Um, you're, you're, you grew up uh, where? Your your dad's a pastor still? Yeah, my dad's a pastor still to this day. Okay. And where do they live? Birmingham. Do you have any oh. family up here? No. No family up here? So it's um, you and Blaze? Yeah, me. My Blaze is my home. son. At home, yeah. Yeah, and my wife. Yep. Yeah, my Where's daughter. Where's your daughter at? In in Alabama, Tuscaloosa. Start, starting her sophomore year. She's starting her junior year. Junior year. Yeah. Okay. Where is she at? You say? Alabama, University of Alabama. I just moved my oldest into college yesterday. Really? Oh, yeah, that sucked. It's. Yeah. Oh. I can't, I wish I could give you <laughs> that's, some. That's frightening. We're the same age, and my son. I feel like they're just growing. His daughter too. I mean, they're, yeah. they're the same age. It's like, yeah, man, where does the time go? Yep. Where's oh, your son going? Shops where it went. Yeah, uh, my daughter. Oh, my sorry. daughter. She's going to Trinity Christian College. Oh. It's in Palos Heights for uh, nursing. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I, I that I was a. She she got her mom's home. intelligence and compassion, so she'll be an excellent nurse. I'm <laughs> glad she didn't take after me. She was working on cars. <laughs> Taking your daughter to college is a. It was, it was a it difficult was tough. one. It was tough. Um, but uh, my my question, I guess, was. How often do you see your family? I mean, we're in sort of a, a similar situation, and in, in, in that, um, we're we're both working for companies that we didn't start, right? Um, in in sort of reaping the benefits of the success of those companies, similar situation, um, family that's not really close. Uh, yeah. How often do you see them? It's more honestly that that's more difficult for my wife. Um, I uh, I was adopted at birth, um, and great parents. My my mom passed during COVID. Um, had got COVID and passed. And uh, when I when I started working pretty much full time at like fifteen sixteen, I did work release through high school and stuff like that. I was pretty much out of the house, mm -hmm. right? So I was I've been gone for a long time. Um, we also moved all over the place. Yeah. So we moved. I've moved. Fort Lauderdale, Dallas, Delaware, Birmingham, Atlanta, back to Birmingham, back to Atlanta. So it was every every two and a half, three years it was starting over, right? Yeah. So I had a lot of I had a lot of resentment, still do, of animo animosity, of like because the church always came first, yeah, always starting over, starting over, starting over. My wife, on the other hand, lived in two places, one city. When we built our first or second house, we were next door to her parents, so. My kids were both kids were born next door to her parents all the way up until we moved. So that was very difficult on her, yep. right? Moving on me, not so much. Um, I mean, we talk probably a couple of times a year. See, see, I see my dad probably once or twice a year. Yep. Um, you know, it's just a different, it's a different dynamic. Yep. Um, but my 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 wife's side, I mean, there she'll probably see, she'll go down there or they'll come up here every two months, yeah. something yeah. it's all the time. But I will say it was a little bit of a difficult situation, but in about three or four months, like for us, she even looked at me, she's like, Oh, we're so much better. Like, cause her, her parents live next door. So yeah. it was, 
at any point in time just in the house of like, oh, hey, what's the grandkids doing? I just put them to sleep. Oh, my God. And now she's kind of like, well, well, wake them up. I'm here. And it was the best thing for us. We didn't, she didn't realize it. We, neither one of us realized it, it was the best thing for us. Cause it was like, Oh, it's just us. Like we, now we, we can just interact. We get right. to know each other. It's not about always the family, which is great. Yeah. It was great to have that support staff. It's great to have all that, but there's something to be said of like, all right, we'll see each other for the holidays and we'll do things and maybe we'll do a trip and we'll do this stuff. But daily life, you get so much closer. Yeah. The whole family does. Well, I guess the sep- second part of that would be e- you're working in sort of a unusual industry. Now, obviously, you were working in this industry before coming to the Roadster shop. Um, but how does the rest of the family view what you do for a living? Do they understand what you're doing? <clears throat> do you understand the level of what you're doing? My dad's side of the family, um, or my side of the family, absolutely not yep. nobody they still to this day don't get it yeah have no idea right is it still so this like shop still doing good You're like still, still, a job and all still got a job and all that stuff on my wife's side like my father-in-law mother-in-law i met my wife at the first shop way back in the day she did the books okay right so and my wife was into cars or girlfriend at that she was when we went met she was coming with her dad to buy wheels and lower the conda and doing all this kind of stuff so she was into it okay so they've known it from the get-go that this is a, yeah. a business yeah. this is a thing yeah. right so he's always been super supportive now there's outside people you meet and it's kind of the we've always talked about it what are you gonna still, get real sure, sure he's still, still uh, fucking around he's yeah, still working working on those old cars yeah yeah 100 percent. absolutely yeah, yeah. That's my new truck I just drove here, and you're thinking, aren't, you're still not working, aren't you? I didn't, yeah, I think the wife's working two jobs. You're broke fucking ass. Uh, that's that kind of shit, okay. you know? Okay. But, I, I was I, I kind of curious about that. I mean, I'm on my end, like, my my dad has you know, sort of an interest in, in cars just in general, um, but and my stepmom, but, um, you know, they, they don't know the size of the industry necessarily. Right. So the, they're always – always interested in what are you working on or you are are you have you had anything in magazines or something online whatever yeah. and so they're always interested in that like <laughs> scrapbooking or what i don't know what they're doing with, yeah. with that but um and so they they attempt to keep up with what they're doing what we're doing and they came to sema once and we snuck them in so they've they've sort of seen it mm-hmm. Um, and sort of this the scope of what we're doing within the industry, but that was and, uh, there too. That was a long time ago that they came, and so they sort of try. The, the rest of my family, for the most part, um, I, I'm pretty sure they just wonder, you know, why are you why are you working there? Why why are you working there and not here when you could be doing the same thing here? You were doing the same just, thing here because it's just doing. working on cars is working on cars, right? Or, right. or you're a mechanic. <laughs> Yeah. They you know, if you're, are you wrenching? Are you, you wrenching? Oh, you're wrenching. wrenching. Like most, most, most of the time, they just ask me how how work's going, and and I I think I th- I think for the most part they believe that that I'm like an indentured servant, like I I have to be there. Like oh, I'm still working a lot. Yeah, I'm working a lot, but that's just that's just what I do. Whether I was working a lot at the shop or working a lot on my yard or whatever. I've yeah. been working a lot anyway. That's not, that doesn't have anything to do with somebody telling me I have to, right? That's my own sickness. <laughs> so yeah, but I, that's I, a, I the, the alternative, but be sitting that's such couch. a societal thing though. It, yeah. Because yeah, but, if, if it's a blue collar job, at least it was, it, it was this way in the South. If it's a blue collar job, if you don't own the thing, that's the blue sure. collar job. Then it's always kind of like, oh, you still, you know, you still doing HVAC, you yeah. know, or you st- yeah. still, you know, still cutting grass, whatever. Well, I've got six trucks, sure. right, and fourteen yeah. people that yeah. were, yeah, we're still right. cutting grass. Right. We're doing really right. fucking we're, good at it. We're cutting a shitload. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it's it's and, and it's, it's, it's that it's, mentality yeah. of like, if it's not doctor lawyer, right, and you don't sure. have you know four hundred grand in debt in college, or whatever, then it's it's a step down. It's the same thing in school. Why trade schools are looked down upon. Yeah. Well, and and I don't. I don't think that my family means anything about saying that. No. It's just, it's it's a difficult thing for people yeah. outside of this industry to grasp just in general. How would anybody yeah. spend this much on a car? How, you know, why would somebody have that kind of car? Why would they come to you to, to, to do that? Why would they have you specifically do that? 
it, it's sort of a, a hard thing for people outside of it to grasp. So they're really coming the from the right place. Yeah. They're coming from the care. They, yeah. You could be working from State Farm as yeah. just one of 6,000, right? And right. could get laid off at any point in time, yeah. but it's comfortable. So, you're, okay, good. You're still working for State Farm. Great. Selling insurance. Great. Hey, you're, I'm sure you're miserable. We're happy look, look yeah. that, <laughs> that you're. <laughs> His khakis are on point. Right. Thing, yeah. I will say though, I don't know if you guys agree, but it seems like it's gotten better. Like years ago, you know, you rewind like ten years. I used to dread the fucking question mm-hmm. of like, what do you do for a living? You know, you'd be out in some group, and it was like, yeah, it was because you. It was always met with that response. Sure. Like, so like, what? What's your? What's your job? Like, what yeah. do you really do? You know, eventually we just, I would just start telling people like metal fabrication, you know, right. metal fabrication. Or you get compared to it's, Richard Rollins. That's always Well, no, that's sure, where yeah. it's, that's where it's progressed to because it's so. You have the, no idea. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so in the limelight in the public's eye now that it's like, it's, I feel like it's more acceptable and it's almost now looked like it's something cool. You know, it, it's it's gotten there. I get your it, point. It, it's changed. I haven't. I still don't tell anybody that you know, strangers that, what I'm into. You're no either. barista or uh, no. brewer yet. I either say I'm in imports, yeah. exports, yeah. or I have a wildly successful podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Or the, like the, it's so the best successful. Thing, <laughs> the best thing to do is just hang out with very few people. Yeah, and then it's, the question never comes up. Yeah. You know? I only hang around people who work on cars. Hey, there you, you know? go. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't know what you fuck you do. Yeah, but you've had to have those happen at my house, the shop, or my church. I don't know. Yeah. about it you haven't you're telling me you haven't had those at the church where the wife's like hey i met someone so you know we're gonna all, all the it's we're gonna have a couple state my you know, wife for, my yeah. wife's saying that yeah no no no, no she, she doesn't she knows me better than oh that. so she's no, not gonna no. try to introduce hey, you to a new couple we should, we should go hang out with them I, her her husband has a car now never gonna happen <laughs> she no. she knows that you're she, not she's able she's to be not taken gonna out. bring it up she'll she'll okay. ask me to go anyway okay but but not because she thinks i'm gonna like it okay no <laughs> She's going to say, hey, we're going. You're we're, probably going to hate it. We're going. I'm like, all right, do they have kids that are similar age to ours? Because right, that, that's nice, actually, because they just go do what they're doing. So you're, you're doing the, <laughs> she said you're doing the pickleball and stuff, huh? Yeah. That's yeah. So that's like cool, kind of like tennis, but smaller. Smaller. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Oh, that's yeah. a, ha- you have pulled a hammy. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's tough. Uh, yeah. Phil, do you do a lot of pickleball? Pickleball? Yeah. No. Yeah. Do you? <laughs> no. I know. <laughs> The pickleball is huge right now. Oh, I know. Yeah. You could put a pickleball court out there where the pool table is. You don't yeah, use we it. We should. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we have to play pickleball. Pickleball. pickleball seems like something you would do. <laughs> oh, get the fuck out of here. Uh, <laughs> he was notorious for racket it's smashes. Scale. Back at the, yeah. Like it's, at the, uh, at scale the gym. Tennis. <laughs> yeah, dude. I used to back in fucking gym. I get fucking booted from gym class. Right? Oh, I, spent gym, I spent gym class in the <laughs> library and then transitioned from the library to the dean's office. Me and my buddy Fenn, we would. You know, you, you, we had tennis, right? So you're doing tennis, and we just crank the balls, and then right immediately after, we would do racket slams. So you'd be like, you know, you'd <laughs> home it was run like a derby high five. first. It was, of course. It, yeah, it was home run derby. You crank it over the fence, and then it's a racket slam, which is basically a tennis racket high five. But if you bring enough force, you just cave the fucking racket in. I mean, just <laughs> taco it. Right? And you were. I was a fucking wild, wild man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How much older... Are you Phil? Uh, two Jeremy? years older. Two years, so you, you're almost the same age as my brother, and I'm, I'm the same age as Jeremy. You, so you went to school um, before Jeremy was working at the Roadster shop. You went to school. Were you going for business and finance? Yeah. So with the the family's body shop um, business, were you planning on going to school? I mean, what what was your goal with going to school for business? Where did you think that you yeah, were going to work the with plan, him? Going to the body shop business. Okay. And- on the, on the finance end of it then? Didn't really have a set plan. We always started at the bottom and throughout college every summer I'd be home and was an estimator and then a production manager then graduated started running a couple of the shops and yeah. just kind of get pushed into all areas of it, yeah. learn it all and have enough background to okay. take over but, some But it was, it, yeah, but. it was always, the idea was always to work with your dad, yeah. work with, with, within the company, yep. but have that education to do that. So then when Jeremy started working for the Roadster shop and that conversation came up, um, how did that, how did that go down? I mean, what did you think about that conversation when the Roadster shop came up for sale? Um, were you like, yeah, let's, let's sell this, yeah. let's sell this business and jump into that. Yeah, it was, it, 
the body shops had gotten too big, I think, to be a family business anymore. Yeah. We had like, my dad had 17 locations at the time. And I think he saw it a lot more than we did that he wanted it to be a family business and he wanted to work with us. And he was grooming us to come up into this thing that was just so massive now that, you know, there was 400 employees yeah. at the time. And, and we were working at three different locations. Yeah. Never saw each other. Yeah. Um, and it was hard to, I don't know, imprint that on us and help us grow. So it was kind of a, we always joke, but it was his retirement and our future starting the roadster shop. Sure. And, um, yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't trade it for anything. I think learn so much more starting the roadster shop at basically the bottom and yeah. growing it from absolutely nothing and fucking a lot of stuff up along the way yeah. and learning as you go. And well, and like, like you guys said, you had sort of a, had to take a step back with an established business when you when you're starting with something like that you you you're you're taking on all of the uh bad stuff <laughs> with with whatever good there yeah. is <laughs> yeah you have an established yeah. business but um you're still starting from the ground established. up <laughs> yeah right <laughs> right yeah well i i'm i'm met neil i think maybe once and i think it was when you had sliced at at sema Okay. Um, I think you guys were setting up over there, and you guys were there with um, Paisan boys, and and um, I think that's when I met them the first time as well, and uh, just talked to your dad briefly, and just just in the interaction with him, he 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 actually reminded me of Troy's dad quite yeah, a bit. Yeah, they were cut from a very similar cloth. Yeah, and and I, I wasn't really part of the conversation, just just the fly on the wall or whatever, but um, I can certainly say as a, a dad and, and whatever successes my kids have, small or big, you know, you just think the world of everything that they're doing. And, um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that he hasn't seen where you guys are now, but what a blessing that he was there at the beginning. And, and oh, yeah. when you guys, you know, started building this thing and was was around long enough to to see some of that success and what you're capable of and and I'm sure he probably understood, you know, how much further it could go. He knew. He knew. Yeah. He knew. And and I mean he he was a successful um, businessman and obviously built that yep. from the ground up and and you know whatever whatever he <laughs> imprinted on you as far as that's concerned. Um, Obviously, it's it's continued on. I mean, you're you're. <laughs> I don't use the word loosely. Building an empire. I mean, you. He'd be really proud. I well, I, I know I he would be. That, yeah. And I, I didn't I didn't I didn't know him and just met him briefly. But just as a father, I know it for sure. Thank you for yeah. that, man. I yeah. really appreciate that. Yeah. The the one other the one other thing I was gonna ask. Um, uh, I got questions for everybody. Uh, Jeremy is uh, you and Chad kind of came up at the um, came up together. I mean, he went to yep. he went to WyoTech and you yep. you took some classes or whatever and and uh, started working with him. But you kind of came up together with uh, learning how to navigate different projects and doing things for the first time together and whatever. Yep. Um, uh, he would be an example. You know, if you were to ask me of of another example of somebody that that is well-rounded and that is a significant part of what he has to offer he, he's an excellent example of yeah. that because he had to do everything yeah, yeah he's about as well-rounded as they yeah. did and and so uh, I, I hope this doesn't come across as like you know why why are you doing this but tr uh heavy tries to um you know be in the shop as, as much as as he can yep. and as the owner of that business he's tried to put things in place to be able to do that um you're coming up with chad do you do you prefer being in the shop working 100 100 percent. yeah all right and Absolutely. so i guess yeah. what 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 would ha what has to be in place for you to be able to do that just walk away <clears throat> not to talk about jesse again but at one uh, point in time he had everything going with west coast choppers and and just moved to another building yeah. so I he mean, wasn't near on it um near anybody <laughs> trying to outfit my garage with some metal shaping tools yeah just work on a personal project yeah. that's what it takes I, i'm not saying, what, be, what, I'm not saying go, what the hell are you doing to be able to go home yeah. and, and do it you know it's funny you, know, you talk yeah. about my dad which you know he's was instrumental in this but you know I, I don't know maybe it was 
15 years ago, you know, I, uh, we were working around the fucking clock. I mean, 80, 100 hour fucking weeks yep. in the shop and trying to, you know, I was working, I actively working on projects and I'm trying to manage guys and we're trying to grow the shop. And, you know, at one point it just gets so fucking stressful because you almost become, I've got a goal. I like to do things like fast and finish them. Right. And you have a goal in mind and you almost become irritated when you've got, I, I had fabricators around me and employees yeah. and guys are asking questions and rightfully so. And it's like, you're getting irritated because I want to finish what I'm doing. Yeah. And it was neglecting the rest of the shop, you know, everything, oh, one person can only do so much. Yeah. So me at my best couldn't do a fraction of what five guys working like pretty consistently could do. And he at one point told me, he's like, you know, this thing's never going to go anywhere if you're going to continue building cars. Like at some point you've got to step away and run the shop. And I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned that because that's, that's another thing that I think it's a pitfall for a lot of shops is you, you do get to the point where at the beginning you were in the shop and you're, you're doing all the work and you're talking to customers and you're doing billing and yeah. all this stuff. And that it, it it's common. Right. I mean, people who start their own thing that they got to do it that way. And then you get to a point where you have some employees and you have more projects and that sort of thing. At some point in time, somebody has to manage it. Yeah. So, and, and there are thresholds. When you get to a certain point, multiple people have to manage oh, yeah. it. And Troy's dad, Jack, was so instrumental uh, from the very beginning. And Jack and, and Troy's mom, Judy, in um, providing that support for the for the business. Yep. Um, now, Angie ended up, you know, taking over the office real early on. Um, but Jack and Judy were, were part of you know, going to the shows and promoting the shop and being there with Troy and, and making those connections and that sort of thing. Um, but when Jack passed away, you know, he was the first line of defense at the shop. I mean, he answered the phone, he talked to the customers, he, you know, yeah. he's making sure, you know, everybody has everything that they need and running errands and all this stuff. And then you have somebody that's so instrumental in that part of the logistics of the shop and they're gone. It gets spread out to other people, but those are other people that already had a full plate. Sure. And so Troy all of a sudden is in a position where he's got to do a lot of these things that he's doesn't particularly like doing yep. on that end of it. And so do some of the rest of us. And um, that make, makes it difficult for everybody because now you're getting interrupted all the time yeah. to, to you facilitate everybody else doing their job. You, so You get to a point where you're not doing anybody any good because right. you're not doing that particular customer any justice because you're getting pulled away and you're not focusing yeah. on it. And you're not doing the shop any good because you're trying to focus on that yeah. and you're neglecting them. And yeah. you're in a tight spot because in this industry and in your, your shop, you have the vision and, and know what needs to happen. Yeah. So passing that to somebody else and trusting that they're going to make the decision that you're going to approve of is hard to put somebody in place to do all these things that you don't, you don't want to do so that you can do the things you want to right. and trust that that's going to get done. Oh yeah. Um, and, and that's, that's a tight spot. I, uh, I do everything I can to, to answer questions during the day. Uh, partially, you know, they may be questions that just, I can answer, but also to relieve Troy of some of the questions. Sure. But there's some days where I'm just like, I'm just, I can, I guess I'll just stop working because <laughs> 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 you're trying, you're trying to get other things done. It's just, just like what you're talking about. And I, and, and I sort of, sort of knew the answer before before asking the question sure. but but just sort of making a point for for anybody listening that um you know trying to put people in place that that you trust to do what they're doing or have employees that you trust to do the job that they're asked to do yep. and like i was talking before just with casey you know he'll ask a question and knows when he needs to ask a question and then he just goes and works and the and the results good there there has to be relatively little interaction sure. and that's a perfect employee you know yep um but yeah tough tough thing to navigate oh, particularly yeah. with the growing business it is and it's funny like when we're you know we're sitting here looking at this beautiful 36 <clears throat> roadster that you've built from scratch and if you rewind way back when you know i never i never had a vision 
a goal or a dream of like building this monster chassis shop or hot sure. shop or I never was like I want to have a hundred employees right. and a hundred thousand <laughs> square feet my goal was literally I wanted to scratch build a car right. from scratch I wanted to you know and I was on the trajectory I was on the path to do that yeah and I you know I could have and I veered off that and today you know uh, you know, I, I might, it sure as fuck wouldn't look like what you're well, doing, but you know, I, I, guess could, that I was, could bend metal, I could shape it. That I was a little my point of you coming up there, with but, Chad because but you, I know, could, you, you I, understand I what his skill that. set is and yeah. he's had the ability to continue to do that. Yeah. And Chad yeah. sacrificed for a while because he was, yeah. you know, at one point taking on a lot of management responsibilities here yeah. and stepped away and, you know, hung the tools up for a bit. But, yeah. you know, he's come full circle and he's been in a few management roles since then, yeah. but, you know, he's come back to he's just building badass stuff you know? if you were scratch building a body what would it look like not fucking good today you know um, <laughs> what would you want it to resemble you know back in the day i mean back when i had the vision of doing that you know it was oh it was it was hot rod stuff you know yeah. it would have been i started doing it i did you know i've got there's actually the you know remnants of it it was probably the last one of the last big projects i worked on and the customer just up and disappeared but you know, uh, 32 Roadster that, you know, I built like the cowl, the firewall, the quarters, the, you know, the door skins, yeah. the whole floor, built the whole chassis, like you know, pretty much damn near scratch. Started yeah. with an existing steel body, but slowly but surely damn near Took scratch. Your panel off. And yeah, yeah, scratch <laughs> built it, but it never, you know, never saw it across the finish line. That was. <clears throat> and if you were building it now, would you, would you do something hot rod based or no? Probably because it's. Yeah. It's more manageable. You know, it'd be difficult to, <laughs> to build like a complete fendered or sure. full bodied car. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think still, like, I will probably still pursue that yeah. like, in my, on my own, like, just as a hobby. Yeah. I, I, I've been asked that a number of times, like, like if you were building a car, what, you know, what would it, what would it look like? Probably one of those shorty 57s. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but a, no but a Chrysler, of course. Yeah. Chrysler shorty. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I would, <laughs> to be honest with you, like, to, 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 pursue, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to pursue the dream, I mean, I'd, I'd do something that's manageable at this yeah. point. You know, I've, I've Michelin's always, dying right I've now. always loved, like, you know, some track T stuff or, like, you know, a, a, you know, some sort of track nose T style yeah. turtle deck roadster, but to, you know, it, it's it would be manageable to tackle yeah. that at this it's stage. Cer it's certainly evolved for me over the years. I mean, obviously, early in your career, you're looking at things that are that are sort of traditional custom stuff, like like oh, okay, if you're going to scratch build a car, Delahaye, you know, yeah, <laughs> Delahaye or something like that, right? Um, and then as time goes on, you know, whether it's your taste or just things you've been exposed to or things that you've had a bad experience with or whatever, it just sort of changes and. I think there's a number of, of shops that are um, exploring sort of stranger things and European things and, and yep. stuff like that. So I think that's coming. I think I think somebody's going to yeah. – somebody will be the first and, and there will be a few following that up. Um, if, you know, if I, if I was doing something and selling a project to somebody, it would probably be like reminiscent of a – uh 330 p4 ferrari or something like that something that's just real swoopy cool. but for the street and then you can yeah. do some crazy transaxle or whatever in it but um but certainly the taste has sort of changed over the years and and you know in a month you'd change your mind yeah <laughs> want, want a different challenge yeah i mean i would love to see you do something like that i mean just knowing your capabilities your metal work those big swoopy shapes. Well, and I think really I think bitching looking. You know, in the hot rod industry, you you can take a different approach to it as well. You're not. You know, I mean, uh, Luke Delay's probably been been the close to closest to. You know, he yeah. built his aluminum roadster, and that's sort of the same sort of thing. It's it's inspired by mid century race car stuff, yep. but it's none of the above. I'd like to do a closed car or, or something like that. Uh, I I give credit to Dan Webb as well, and just just sure. one quick note i i listened to that episode with him and um yeah that golden sub was huge oh, to me you talk God, about something thing. inspirational I, yeah. I saw it at that I same mean, show it, detroit and, your, and i'm like your metal work is very reminiscent of that like the way you finish things and seeing that i mean that was craig naff right that, yeah that did, the did, body. did the body yeah but but i i met 
I met Dan, it was probably the year before that, or maybe two years before that. I met Dan and Ashley when they had uh, her roadster at, um, at uh, Detroit, I think. I think that's where I saw the car and I met them for the first time. I mean, that's been 17 years yeah. ago or 18 years ago, something like that. But You've seen that thing he's working on right now? Yeah. The steering on it? Yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen it progress. I it's crazy. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, he he sent me a couple yeah, pictures of it the other day. I'm like, come Dan's on, Dan's a wild guy, man. <laughs> Your legs go through the wheel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The seat the seat sits huh. right behind it, and your mm -hmm. legs go through. I asked him a few questions about it the other day, and I just I'm like, okay, I, I'll just have to see it. <laughs> it's a it was a, a like recreation of a French race yeah. car, wasn't it? Yep, yep. But they they made all that stuff, made the ring gear and the He's steering box and all that nuts. stuff. Nuts. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But that, that car was a big inspiration for me as well. I mean, I talked about Boyd and some of his stuff and Jesse and his bikes and and that car when I saw the chassis and then the finished car, um, both at, at Detroit. I mean, that's that was huge. I mean, again, another thing, you know, you see a drawing or something and see it come to life. And, it, I mean, it's as, as close as you could get to the drawing. It was just such it a was, it's huge. Piece. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Dan's. Dan's a rock star. Yep. All right. We got a few more standard questions for you. Okay. You We've any, never you, been interviewed before. Yeah, you got any other bangers? That's all you got? <laughs> oh, I probably, I, I got dozens of them, but we'll be here all night. <laughs> this is weird. Weirds me out being on the other side of it. Yeah. I was, I was like, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't waste any words. No, you got another one? <laughs> yeah. All right, go ahead. Well, you, you've had a thousand jobs, right? And you've, have. you've moved all over the place. How did you end up getting... How, how did you end up transitioning into the hot rod industry in particular? Like, like you were working on import stuff yeah. or you had imports and working at different shops and audio things and that sort of thing. I'm, I'm sure it was some sort of a progression, but how did you get into the hot rod end of it? Well, I'd always like liked I was more, not even hot rods. I was more like big car guy. Like, yeah. so I was like rod and custom. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, custom cruiser magazine, like, so big cars. But anyway, import, shop, uh, rims, tires, audio, like accessories. Um, we didn't do any installation uh, there. We just sold the parts. I had just moved to Birmingham probably about six months prior. Started working at this place. Um, met uh, Jonathan Goolsby. Mm -hmm. He was painting stuff at a dealer and became friends. We started a deal where I would sell parts and the people were like, well, I don't have any place to install them. Like call this number. Mm -hmm. We would do the paint and install on the uh, side and that just kept progressing. Right. He was a painter at the dealer. I was selling parts, kept building up, building up, building up. What, and then what it was were you doing before that were you uh, doing property stuff or what property was development it? or no, that it was, was, it was, two, that was after that five at County, right? No, no, <laughs> no. So I, I was, I, Chick-fil-A. This is going to be a long story. Oh, no, yeah. I'm going to hop. I know yeah. I'm hopping. I'm, I'm going fast. Okay. okay. Chick, Chick-fil-A. Boy meets a girl. <laughs> Chick-fil-A, hang drywall, go to a year of Bible college, get kicked out, move to Birmingham, straight to work at Rex's Auto Service, pull the transmission out, work there for three months, found an import shop, started working there, worked there for three years, then moved straight into the new rim shop that built, gets built downtown. The guy comes in, he's poaching everybody from around town that's in the scene, right? Who's the guys? So me, Brian Cargill, another guy, go to run this shop. He's like, you guys know the stuff. I've got the money. Tell me what to buy. So we go to SEMA. We're buying container loads of wheels. Mm -hmm. We're doing, This is the, the big, this is when Nopi's ha happening. So it blows up, right? We got Super Street Magazine coming in and doing road tours, all that. So we're selling all this stuff. We still don't do any installs. We do wheels, tires lowering and all that we don't do paint and body installs i should mm -hmm. clarify that so meet jonathan he's building stuff we're building his own stuff it kind of progresses we're building trucks i'm doing all like the graphics and stuff for him and we become really good friends uh i go to work at the audio place this is when i leave uh next level and i go to work selling uh stereo still doing stuff on the side um uh I get a job. I throughout all this, I started a landscape company when me and my wife got married, right? Okay. So I was always just yeah. I always wanted to have another another little basket for, of eggs, right? So 
all the way doing this Saturday and Sunday to cut grass. It was just a thing. So that started growing and getting bigger, but it was always just a side mm -hmm. thing. Went to work for a landscape. I mean, for a land development company as a project manager, right? I said, enough of these cars. Cars are fucking stupid. It's always a problem. It's always no something, money. right? Yeah. So it's never changed. <laughs> go to go to work for a land, land development company. I've also got my landscape company, right? Go to work for a land development company. I'm project manager. We start developing all this stuff. This is 2006. Blowing up, right? We had 12 or 13 projects. We go to like 40 something projects, right? Pre real estate. Boom. With all that, they're like, we got to have somebody to manage all these subdivisions and cut all the grass. Well, I've got a landscape company, yeah. so I do that. So things are rolling great. I'm still friends with Jonathan, still working stuff. We're starting, like, the shop, right? So I work there as I'm doing all this stuff. But I, I'm making money, so I don't have to draw a paycheck from Jonathan's. So Collision Center is what it starts out. We're building hot rods on the side. Mm. And then the rest is kind of history. But 2008 happens. Real estate crisis happened. We go from a shit ton of jobs to zero jobs. Yeah. So keep the real, keep the landscape company, keep it running. I told Jonathan's like, hey, like, if we're gonna do this, like, it's time to like yeah. do it. And that's where it came yeah. from. I think I, I might be mistaken, but I think the first time that I met you was when with you the had blue truck, the blue truck. That's, at, for, that's uh, the first time I remember. Roadster, Roadster, uh, Roadster show. Uh, time was merchant. The, merchant. Yeah. It was my pick. That was my pick. I appreciate I, I, it. The, the winter was all right. The winter was bigger and harder. It was. It was. But that that style of truck and the execution that that was my pick that year. So that that made it. I really liked me. that. Yeah. Who beat you out that year? Uh, Troy Lad. Oh, uh, with the Packard. And that that, that yeah. reminded me of something. A Troy Medium. Think. Yeah. Troy Fancy. Okay. The, thank you. <laughs> Troy yeah, I was, Fancy. I was thinking Troy about Fancy. this. How many Troys have been on here? Three, right? How many? Yeah. How many yeah. Adams have been on here? This is it. One. Dude. One I Adam. Mean, one you only. called the Ed, first. You called yeah. Ed Adam on uh, from Z Rods, but I did. We yeah. <laughs> <laughs> changed his name to Adam. He looked like an Adam. He looked like an Adam. Yeah. Yeah. So many Troys and just one Adam. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you. Yeah, that's the first time I remember meeting you. Yeah. And. uh yeah, you you and Troy came up and were super complimentary. That was a that was a whirlwind of emotions and time and stuff like yeah. that. And uh, yeah, I, I I really liked the truck, whether yeah. it won or not. Yep. Matt was super happy with the truck. Yeah. It was just a fun. Yeah. It's one of those ones where you're kind of like you don't really care. You yeah. just like you the customers all in too. Yeah. You're like, oh, I, let's I just, let's recreate this little yeah. '50s fucking like, show car thing. I like the cycle fenders on it. I, I love the color on it. it. Just the proportions were great. It, I I just love the truck. Yeah, that could yeah. be one of the most fun driving and riding fucking hot rods ever. It was a fun little truck. Yeah, we had yeah. built a '32 fucking Roadster pickup. Those they're, they're fun little trucks. To yeah, drive. it's like go kart. Yeah, yeah. It's just they like ride good and like feel fast because there's nothing there and yeah oh yeah. uh, oh that's a fucking story it yep. was i think like you left out the dog grooming job uh <laughs> piano repair he said man. he's no, jumping worked, around uh, cowboy dog, i dog worked grooming. on worked on the on oil the, rigs you probably worked on an oil no, rig at yeah. some point. couple of years at a cattle ranch <laughs> cattle ranch yeah that was that was waltz hanging <laughs> drywall yeah yeah, There's more just There's, he's gonna drop an oil rig <laughs> no. at some point. Never was it, I never worked in Texas. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there, you worked for Napa? Oh yeah, in we Georgia. Left that off. Yeah, I worked for Napa. Um, delivering yeah. auto parts. Yeah. Fuck, I feel like there's like at least seven to ten more. Yeah, that are either completely made up or no, you, like, you got you guys worked at two places. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of these times where I had multiple jobs at one time. Yeah. When I started I realizing it at, at like fifteen and sixteen. What was there was no limit to like how much you could work and you could get two jobs oh, and yeah. get in double dip and get paid. You got I would grew up poor. What was with it? What nothing. Was it? I see some of these being like a punch in <laughs> and then <laughs> what were the, what yeah, was I think they were slow your like three of them at a time. What was the weirdest job? Uh you were working teach, <laughs> teach, no. Like uh, real weird. Fud, oh, fud records. Was, yeah. <laughs> there was that one you told me that guy used to pay you for you to show you his belly. That was under the bridge. Yeah, show was, your belly button. It's good money. I think you just wanted to see my belly button. How much? <laughs> How much did he have to pay? Fud, fud records was the weirdest one. 
Fud Ruckers was night well, shift. Well, you didn't have to do much because Fud Ruckers, you basically, you prepared you your own. counter. Right? You uh, yeah, yeah. And then they went and prepared it, wasn't it? Yeah, but yeah, I, I, I bust, like, oh. tables and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. I was young. I mean, I wasn't, no, I wasn't in, the, in the kitchen. You want to talk about another? That's why I talked about, like, the shadiness of people that work at <laughs> restaurants that are open late. Because yeah. that place closed down at, like, midnight. For, my goodness. And I was, like, 16. Are there yeah, any delinquents anymore? I think they closed. No, I think they're all gone. gone. Like, we, I liked fun yeah. We yeah. had one not far from here. Fuck, the jalapeno cheese. The cheese. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, that, that was, was something else. I had, I had three jobs this summer. I was 16. I worked at Chick-fil-A in the evening. I, I delivered phone books <laughs> from all things. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that job exists, do you think? No, no, not yeah, phone books. Not anymore. And, and the weirdest one, I, I worked, a, uh, we had uh, a neighbor that, um, I don't know how he got involved with this, but my brother and I were hired for his company. We were sanding, we were sanding parts for die-cast model cars, and of all cars, is a Saturn like a Saturn, <laughs> like the Saturn worst die cast car. It was like, the it real was like car a, is not even yeah, metal. I know, I know. And that I remember it's thinking that I'm metal like, version of a plastic like, car. Yeah, why, why are these doors metal on this thing? Yeah, some dealer promotion the thing. Off. Obviously, didn't save them. Yeah. <laughs> Fun fact: In case you're in, Bud Ruckers was the very first place that I ever dipped Red Man. Chew, oh, really? chew, yeah. One of the guys there is like, "Oh, you want some red? Oh, hundred. Yeah, I do that yeah, all the time. Just, oh, yeah. <laughs> Big old, I was fucking done. So, oh yeah, threw up. Yeah, you get, sick. Like, high and dizzy. And yeah, all that. fucking yeah, wrecked me. Do you ever work in a movie theater? No, I can picture you working selling no. tickets. Nah, not in a movie Leon theater. Josh. No, I never. Yeah, it was just car parts and restaurant stuff. I did work. <laughs> yeah, there's other places too. <laughs> <laughs> what, what body part did you have to show there? <laughs> Gentlemen, put your hands together yeah. for. <laughs> there was a, there was a stage. there was a restaurant that you talk about clocking in when I was yeah. in college, which was a complete disaster. Uh, there's a little uh, like country meet and three uh, restaurant. It was like 30 minutes away from the college, but that they hired all the college students. I still, I wouldn't, had you not explained that, I would not know what a meet and three is. But I, I really Everybody listening that. knows what a meet and three is. So, uh, but you would, you ever, they would hire everybody from the college, right? And you had to wear uh, like this, you know, khakis and a white shirt. And we would all like carpool up there, like six or seven That's of us together. the first time I saw you. So <laughs> okay. I worked, I worked Different like khakis. one, I worked like one or two shifts. And then I was like, this is stupid. And it was all about the tips because you didn't really make much, right? And I was like, this is dumb. I'm not doing this shit anymore. So I just never go back. But I kept getting the, like, paycheck of, like, a, a small amount of hours, like whatever the minimum was, yeah. even though I wasn't clocking in. It was, it was like, so you, three bucks an hour. You called HR and you're like, there's been a misunderstanding. Yeah, 100% instantly. Yeah. I was like, yeah. you've, you've <laughs> overpaid me. You overpaid me $86 <laughs> as a college student. I don't need this $86. It's yours. <laughs> Yeah, just like that. Uh, best piece of advice you've ever received? Um, I feel like he yeah. prepared. I think he came prepared. He has questions I'm for actually, us. He prepares. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, a, a, you know, I, I, I probably go back to just my mom saying, saying, you know, golden rule stuff. I mean, just just treating people good. But I'm gonna I'm gonna throw another one out there, um, just because of. Uh, it's great advice and uh, his passing recently, George Poteet. <laughs> Knew that, yep. And so um, uh, I, I sent a message to Jeremy not too long ago and um, just brief, but um, George was significant in my career for sure. Um, not that not that we were close friends or, or that sort of thing, but um, he's bought me dozens of meals and I've hung out with him a lot at shows and at dinner and, and obviously Troy and him were very close. Um, so I got to, um, be around George at all, at all, excuse me, a lot, um, and see how generous a person was not only just, just, um, in the opportunities that it gave people, but just in conversation, uh, with servers at, at restaurants and, and talking to people at shows and that sort of thing, just generous with, with time money, um, whatever. Right. Um, 
so we were at Bonneville a number of years ago, and again, great opportunity. Went there with them many times, um, and this wasn't that long ago. It's probably six six years ago, seven years ago, maybe. And um, we're kind of done racing for the day, so we're kind of sitting in the pit, and I'm I'm sitting in a chair over by uh, our race trailer. And George, a lot of times, would come over to our pit just to get away from the hustle of um, Speed Demon stuff. So he was over there sitting, and he came over and sat next to me. And across from our pit, there were a couple of jokers over there just talking about nothing. And one of them's talking about, um, you know, wanting to get this toter home and da, 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 with, you know, really no business to to have something like that and, and all this stuff. And, and George kind of, we weren't even talking at the time. He kind of said, Adam, you know, don't ever, don't ever judge, uh, like your worth based on, you know, what somebody else has. It's a matter of, of, uh, appreciating the things that you have. But, um, and I, I wish I could remember, you know, quote exactly what he said because he had a way of saying things. Um, and essentially I, I, you know, we talked for a few minutes and I just said, you sort of preaching to the choir there. Um, I'm not really concerned and I never say anything like, like this guy's saying over here. I just, just whatever. Um, and we just talked a little bit about, about, uh, contentment and it's something that sort of stuck with me. Obviously George was very successful in the things that he did, but he also was an extraordinarily generous person. Yeah. On top of that, with his success, he used it in a way that benefited other people. Um, and when he says something like that, you know it's coming from a place that he had nothing at one point in his life. Uh, when he and his sister were growing up, they had nothing. Yep. <clears throat> and um, you know, the idea of contentment, particularly in in sort of our society, means that you are lazy or you're, you're not striving for something more, but that's, that's not really what, what that should mean to people. It, it should mean if you never have anything more than you have right now, you should be appreciative of what you have. Um, you shouldn't worry about what, what this guy has over here or, or, you know, whatever. Um, and that's, that's a difficult thing because as driven people and, and people who want to be successful in the things that we're doing, um, I find a separation there. You're, you're driven because that's how you are. You, you want to be better you, at, at lots of, lots of things. Yep. And, and in my case, you know, spending the time that I do, you know, building cars, you know, I'm proud of what we do there, but it's not the most significant thing to me. The mi- most significant thing to me is being a good husband and a good father and a good friend and brother and son. And I fail at those things all the time. Um, but, I'm content in, in the things that, that I have while still having a drive to, to do things well. And, um, so I, I think you can have success and move towards success while still being content. Yeah. And, yep. and that's sort of, uh, sort of the impression that I got from, from George at that time. And again, I wish I could quote him exactly, but I'm not going to try to yeah. impersonate him like <laughs> <And> Troy would. <laughs> George was just full of me and Phil were just talking yeah. about one today that uh, I think the, the greatest one that he said is that I don't care much about winning, but I hate fucking losing. Yeah. There was that, yeah. and then the other one was, Josh, <laughs> fuck, fuck a coyote. <laughs> was the other one. <laughs> yeah, he told him, Hutch. <laughs> fuck a coyote, yeah. He kept, Hutch want, kept wanting to put a coyote in something we was building, and he finally, Jeez. George had had enough, and he said, <laughs> fuck a coyote. <laughs> he said, take that word out of your mouth. Forget how to say that word. Uh, Don't say funny. it again. Three uh, fingers came out. Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, man. Yeah. Favorite car movie. Uh, it's probably the same as everyone's chitty chitty bang bang. Mm, it was Herbie. Good. That was a yeah. good one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> chitty chitty bang bang is not that was a, that's a that. weird <laughs> movie. That's a weird movie. Uh-oh. Um All I, right, you heard it here. Yeah. <laughs> chitty chitty bang bang. Appreciate it. Yeah. I love it. It's going yeah. so good. <laughs> that was a uh, what's the guy's name? This the big movie star from back then. Tom Selleck. No, Dick Jerry Lee Lewis. Dick Van Dyke. Yeah. 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 
Uh, he he couldn't even carry that one. That's yeah, a, that movie's a mess. All those um, Disney movies of that era. Uh, honestly, yeah. honestly, I'd probably say Back to the Future. Not not because of you know I was too interested in DeLorean or anything, but just a, a movie in general and in my age and that sort of thing. I watched it so many yeah. times, and I just I just liked it as a movie. As I got a little bit older, um, you know, I just being into hot rods. I obviously liked uh, American Graffiti, and um, then. <laughs> Um, probably in high school, maybe it's a little before that, uh, dazed and confused. I like the cars in there and, um, and some, some other things like something a little obscure is, um, in time. Have you seen that? No. Um, I think, uh, Olivia Wilde and Justin Timberlake are in that. And it's it's good enough you forget it's Justin Timberlake. Dude, I'm surprised you didn't know. You're, I mean, Josh yeah, a, is a huge, huge fan. Timberlake uh, yeah. fan. Yeah, oh yeah, sure JT. That? Everybody, sure. yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Um, but what's what's sort of interesting <laughs> Never been and is <laughs> trying to start new things this season. <laughs> yeah, I get that. That's not going to stick. Uh, no, we didn't you think Florida Georgia Line would either. <laughs> yeah. But that um, that movie's got some sort of strange as a futuristic movie, but the cars are sort of uh, like big Lincolns and and things like that in it. But but with sort of a futuristic twist, and and it really has nothing to do with the plot line of the movie. It's just part it's part of being the future. It's kind of kind of an interesting thing. It's, yeah. It sounds familiar. We're talking about that, but I keep thinking yeah. of the Great Gatsby. That's one. probably ten, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Ten or twelve years old. Yeah. That's a good one. Uh, oh, I'd say yeah, Back to the Future. Back to the Future. It's familiar. Is one the best one? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Mm. Well, you like three, don't you? I do like three. Three's yeah. one with that's the one with Biff. The, yeah. Like, it's it, it a big tower. Yeah, that's when the that's when the he goes over the water and the uh, hoverboard. Three's. Okay, so that's the one with the Toyota pickup. No, two, one's the one's Toyota. Two is is in the future, with the hoverboard. Three Two is, is a wild west. Oh, yeah. I was thinking that was four. Oh, no, no I already, can't stand you already, three. <laughs> you already gave your vote. No, then I'll get, you get chitty, chitty, bang, bang. Then. <laughs> That's fine. I'll own it. Uh, Two. Two is the one I, I was thinking, yeah. <laughs> Two's better than one. Okay. I'll have to go back and watch the first one. It's been a while for me. Yeah. <laughs> the one's cool. I mean, the, one's, the one is cool because of Toyota, and then uh, I love them. Now, They're, technically, uh, the Toyota's in all three. Yes, yeah. but... The, the scene is the, is the yeah. one. Oh, yeah. You're my, 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 I, I've seen it what's so many the times, ethnicity, but my son loves it, too. What's the ethnicity that they're chasing in the parking lot of the terrorists? Libyans. Libyans. <laughs> he made him a, a It was perfect for that time. bomb out of shoddy pinball machine parts. Yeah. <laughs> well, he does know it. <laughs> oh, I know it. <laughs> uh, first car. You know, you know we like to guess. Sure. Mm. Kansas, Kansas, and you graduated high age. school. And what'd you oh, say? Oh one, oh one, For, forty-one years old. Um, Oof. well, <coughs> Kansas. I'm not real familiar with the the landscape out it's, there. It's it looks like there's just like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's about like no, as far as you know what people were driving, you know things like that. Was it was was it a hand me down? Did you save up for it? Did you work? Or was it like in in the family for a long time? Um, I drove a couple of vehicles before this, but the first thing that I drove regularly was was my mom's. It was my mom's car. Foreigner American, Americans. Oh damn it! Ninety five Chevy Corsica. Uh, that's right. that's a, as he said American. He Chevy said, oh, Corsica. Corsica. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, Sounds fancy, but it's still <laughs> Chevy. What color was it? Uh, that's probably the teal blue. Dude, I'm, uh, it's, maybe front it's wall, insulting. Maybe front it's, wall drive maybe it's Regal. Not. I'm going with something that was uh, it, maroon. It, it was a struggle. It was a little bit of a struggle for you to drive, but it was transportation. <laughs> it's Dodge Caravan, navy blue Dodge Caravan. <laughs> and I could take the transmission out in 30 Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> navy blue Dodge Caravan. I'm going with maroon. Yeah. That'd be like uh, a 92, 92-ish. I think it was the Regal. The four-door front-wheel drive Buick. Uh, wasn't that the Regal? With like the hard yeah, C-pillar? Yeah. No, no. no. The more swoopy one. Like the... Oh, okay. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? That was like a one-year-old yeah. car. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah, it was like a pill shape. Yes, exactly. That's what I'm that's going That's an with. oddball. I know. Yeah, that's yeah. A, if, it, if his grandparents handed it down, I could see that's yeah. a grandparent's car. It's a mom's car, too. What is it? 
<laughs> it's, it's late. I mean, we might be. 83. 83 uh, oh. Mustang convertible. Yeah. Who, nobody could guess that. Nobody's going to guess that. fucking psychic could have no. guessed that one. So, <laughs> no. Eight, eight, 86 Mustang. <laughs> Convertible. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Elio makes that look good. Right. Yeah. It's, dark, it's dark blue. White top. The color. Girl's car. 83. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a four eye. Yep. But is that six banger or a V8? Six. I've never seen so many uh, vacuum lines in my life. Oh. I'd, uh, I'd, it got to the point where I was doing so much work on I was doing like head gaskets and rebuilding the head carburetor gasket. and all this stuff. Head <laughs> <laughs> it's a, there's two on it. It's a V6. Yeah. Oh, right. um, but uh, with the, I did not wreck it. Um, well, sort of. <laughs> well, if it, a convertible I, I 83 out. Mustang. If you wrecked it, you probably wouldn't be here yeah. today. Yeah, I, I, I spun out on the highway on uh, some ice and ended up in the median and just packed the, the tires full of snow and it just shook all over the place until I got <laughs> home and I walked inside and th this was after like six months of working on the thing, just nonstop, just trying to keep it going back and forth to school and i walked in the house i'm like i'm done <laughs> <laughs> i'd rather walk <laughs> I'll, wa I'll walk the two hours to school yeah. never again yeah <laughs> uh what's left law enforcement i don't think he's a guy that no. messes with law enforcement no you'd no, be disappointed yeah i don't think he's ever had a run in it was probably like a roll to stop sign it was a warning roll, yeah. <laughs> yeah roll to stop sign got a warning yeah, yeah. that's all we got man Dude, I this got, has been a bang. Yo, you got one? I got, no, dunk? I got some stuff. I got some stuff here. Cool. First. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah we should top that. <laughs> All right. Up. First, first. Uh, I don't general. I don't generally apologize for for pranks, but I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna give this back to you. <laughs> oh shit! Look at that! There, look at all those bugs on there. Man. I know, right? I got the rad rides one sitting on my desk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you need to autograph it before you leave. So, yeah. yeah, no. So, uh, no nothing. Yeah, they, of course they 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 stop at the the shop and uh, the Autotopia LA um, Midwest Road Tour, right? And so yeah. They they come in and yeah. and they're driving Jeremy's truck and they're wearing Ring Brothers shirts and talking about how great you know the. Um, going down to Troy Light's shop it was <laughs> I'm like well what the hell guys here we'll, we'll just uh, we'll switch this um, license I left out. it but, on there but, for a while well yeah. little did I know it's gonna be in every shot of the square body for the next three <laughs> yeah. episodes I'm like yeah, well marketing hey, you <laughs> yeah. know it's all yeah. a good yeah. fun right? yeah. for someone yeah. we just appreciate you didn't put the shitty Ring Brothers stickers on that, yeah oh, just and you put you put nice fasteners off. you know you had the I know right? yeah. Yeah. And everything. Yeah. Yeah. they machined the fasteners yeah. they right. plated them then they put them on yep. dished them yeah, yeah. Troy Light he fucking was slapping he's got some low quality stickers that he Does slapped he? Yeah, and like the AC box and stuff nice. under the dash I still haven't really investigated it's just it's transportation it's like I <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's, I the there's there. something yeah. hidden in yeah. there. That fucking Ring Brothers, though, that, that that truck that's sitting out there, Yeah, it's, it's a 2011. They slapped some stickers on it, like, maybe a year after we got it. The fucking stickers are still on it. <laughs> no, like, no, the paper through, of the sticker. Well, yeah, the perimeter of it yeah. that's burned through. It's the like, worst. The, it's down to bare metal. It's the worst it. quality <laughs> sticker. <laughs> They're literally tamper-proof stickers. All right, the next thing I have, yo, uh, talk about not... I want to knock Troy off of his pedestal because I, I don't feel like he deserves it, but I don't mind nudging it a little bit. Right? So, <laughs> Give it a little so shake. I got, I got an ad here, an old ad. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, oh that's so fucking Troy great, loves that dude. sound, he says right at the top there. <laughs> but but what I'm thinking here is... Look, you know, look at that guy. <laughs> so... Damn. So Flowmaster was never. bought out, right? Yeah. Yep. Holly bought Flowmaster. Think it, look, when you're talking about people's natural gifts and their talent, look how good he can hold a muffler. Think about <laughs> yeah. all the things Holly could have him hold. Just reboot this whole thing. He could, yeah. he could hold just, gauges and suspension components. Or things just, we could have him yeah, hold. Just think if about we, what he's going to be holding when we yeah. Photoshop yeah. that yeah. muffler out of there. No kidding. I'm going to tell you what, with that jawline and that smile, he's got himself like a little Tom Brady, like a little older Tom yeah. Brady look to him. Yeah. yeah. A little oh. short bus, Tom Brady, maybe. <laughs> those, those are all of his <laughs> I, iconic cars before. Imagine. Uh, before he had help. Uh, the uh, 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 the, the Quadraduce, did you see it? Just sold on Bring a Trailer. Oh, did it? No, it, I didn't, I didn't see, it. see what it went for, yeah. but it was uh, 
it, it was going reasonably. Yeah. At the tail, that car's bounced around a lot. Well, that's, it's that's cool. I that's always another, like that. That's another car, like when it was on the cover uh, for Summit, a hot rod. Yeah, yeah with, with Summit. Um, uh, that was another one that I, I was just infatuated with yeah. for whatever reason, you know, when I had the scallops yep. on it. Um, uh, he didn't sign it heavy, how but old? I got a nice, uh, nice. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you've got to be kidding me. Keep, yes. keep it classy, oil and whiskey. It says Hart Troy. Oh, that's going on the wall for sure. Yes. This that, is that a com- is, completely. That's a prize possession. That's getting mounted with one of those little, the little lights. What do they call those? Little, yeah, the little uh, art light, art this lamps. Is, this uh, uh, <laughs> a completely unauthorized piece of memorabilia. That's uh, my handwriting. <laughs> and, and funny story, my 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 daughter did show choir um, all through high school, and we were at one of her events. And at the high school, he, he graduated from the same high school as she did. And they have these placards on there where you can go through all the graduating classes. And and I took that picture <laughs> off of the 1987 graduating <laughs> class placard in there. <laughs> and and. Uh, yeah, oh, made a dude. made a glossy headshot for you. That, oh, that, that is awesome. going to be a prominent feature. Oh, of it's this. the it's the prize yeah. possession of this entire studio. Yeah. We're literally wiring in one of those yes. little lights. Oh, yeah, that's going right there with a art lamp over it. <laughs> I'll let you guys all all open these at the same time, Rumble. and then I'll a little explanation. Man, this we got all kinds of gifts. Dang. Oh, shit! Dude, so the sweet. they're uh, man, you know, pewter pewter flasks, uh, six ounce pewter flasks. Um, that is I, awesome. I wrap those uh, RS logo on the front, um, but the leathers are are all not maybe significant cars to you, but from Rad Rides cars. So, Phil, um, I've heard other episodes where you like blue versus OD green, yep. right? <laughs> Um, and that was out of the Belvedere that we built. So being a race car driver yourself, yep. you guys work, worked for the same customer. Um, so did yours with the blue there. Um, that's a Model A, Jeremy. Oh. Same leather as the Model A. Awesome. You're a, a Model A guy. And um, that's Torino. 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 thought it was a train. Man. Yeah. Yep. Dude. Dude, that's, that's uh, awesome. Just, Thank you so just much. Just again, the uh, relationship with George. I know you, you all had, um, you know, some some times on the road with him and, and good customer, you guys, and, and thought that'd be significant. Yeah. I, I dug and dug and dug for uh, chicane leather. <laughs> uh, not a scrap left. <laughs> oh, man. Dude, I really appreciate that. Yep. Dude, that's, absolutely. That means that the, abs- a, yep. the wor- absolute world. That is yep. amazing. Seriously. That's a, absolute, that's a prized possession now, man. Thank well, you I didn't have a fancier box for it, but oh, dude, that works. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Man. If Troy Heavy don't stick, right? I think that we just go with that hot rod shop in Mantino that Adam works at. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little long, but we'll yeah. just yeah, moving forward, moving uh, forward. Get behind that, the hot rod shop that Adam works at. Yeah. I'm liking heavy tea in the boys. <laughs> I like that tea. I like that too. I can see the shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Adam, absolutely yeah. amazing. Um, I know Troy's gotten his due. You get you are absolutely amazing, but hats off to Troy as well because out of respect to him, before we invited you on, we asked him if it was going to be okay. Yep. The first thing out of his mouth, he's like, absolutely, you should do it 100%. There is nothing that you can ask him that I'm going to be afraid of, have him, and he couldn't have been more complimentary about it. And so hats off to him again. He, he also obviously – wasn't thinking about his 1987. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> now he's gonna regret it. Now, uh, uh, look at that suit. Look how look how uh, sharp he is. Man. He looks, so, looks sharp. Looks like he might have been in show choir. <laughs> yeah, we've uh, we've talked we've talked at a few shows. Um, never got to hang out, and I really feel like we got to know you a lot better. And dude, yeah. couldn't cannot speak any highly more highly of you. I appreciate yeah, it. Dude, it's an absolute pleasure, man. You inspire. The entire shop, you inspire me. I love following everything you do. I appreciate You're it. Just incredible work. Yep. Keep kicking ass, man. We feel like such worse people after yeah. this, oh, too. Oh, sure, sure, <laughs> sure. I'm going to tell one one quick story, uh, wrapping it up. Uh, a few years ago, uh, our good customer, Wes Rydell, was a guest of honor at uh, a party that was thrown by a longtime friend and business partner of his. 
Um, the party was called 60 Years of Speed and Style, and it was uh, honoring Wes and, and his involvement in racing and, and hot rod stuff. Um, so Troy received an invitation to that at the shop, which I thought was pretty cool, and it's kind of a private event. Um, and then I ended up receiving one at home, which I was surprised at. And then a little bit closer to the party, we received a uh, travel uh, itinerary, and um, they had sent a plane to pick us up. And Spirit, so Spirit Airlines? Yeah. yeah. Just just like that. <laughs> but, yeah, right? So uh, shock number two there. Uh, so my wife and I and Troy and his mom, Judy, uh, flew up to Wisconsin where we picked up Mike and Jim and um, Peg Nancy and then flew up to the party from there. Uh, so crazy because I don't do any – thing like that right <laughs> so we get to the party and they have uh like a, a schedule of events for the evening with photos of the guest speakers on there and my pictures on that itinerary so surprise yeah. number three you're a speaker and, yeah were you prepared <laughs> no <laughs> but you try to I'm put not, your name in the hat I, no i i i don't know i didn't ask him about it but i'm not particularly afraid of public speaking so i didn't have a problem doing that and uh, John Drummond was the MC for the night who used to work for uh, mm -hmm. Good Guys. Does. And so um, on stage, they had uh, Eric Pratt from Pinkies, um, Mike and Jim, uh, Chip Foos, Troy, and myself. And I've never felt more out of place in my <laughs> entire life. <laughs> but I put this on the same level. Um, I, I Like I said, I kind of... Uh, shove off uh compliments um they make me a little uneasy but uh the fact that uh you had me on the show i really appreciate it um and uh you know it's very rare that uh, somebody that works for somebody else gets that type of recognition um it it happens very seldom so i appreciate the opportunity to Absolutely. come on here and and talk and and i'll be a, a bullseye if people want to cut cut us down for wasting people's <laughs> money or whatever but so send uh, those fire emojis his way send, 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 those. send those fire emojis it's, so it's an absolute privilege, i do appreciate man. it guys. i mean you're yeah you're probably one of if not the best to do it so keep keep doing your yeah. thing i think i don't think trying you, to make me uneasy i don't yeah. think you realize how many people yeah look up to you and are inspired by the work that you do oh, so appreciate it doesn't matter if uh you know you're the, if, if it's your name on the door, if it's Troy's name on the door, you got it. There. There's got to. Yep. I hate it though. There's got to be some type of skeletons in that closet. You can't be this good of a guy, <laughs> this fun, this <laughs> nice, and that him. talented. We'll work them down. We'll get there yeah. eventually. Yeah. Gotta be, Another bottle. <laughs> gotta be, yeah, right. Gotta be webbed feet or something. <laughs> <laughs> I can swim so fast. <laughs> Appreciate Thanks, it, Adam. Yep. See Absolutely. you again next week.